A very good morning and welcome to this Softroot Technical Day for 2020. Uh, on, brought to you this morning by an AHDB webinar. My name's Scott Raffle. I work for the AHDB and many of you will know me already from previous years. And as you know, in previous years, the Softroot Technical Day has been held at the Event Centre at East Malling in Kent. Uh, and obviously for um, the pandemic reasons this year, we've had a very different year and we had to find a new way of presenting the information to you today. So we've gone with a webinar. We hope you enjoy the format. We hope you get a lot out of it. Um, my contact details, which you may need at some point, are scott.raffle at ahdb.org.uk. Um, first of all, I should say we're really, really pleased that we've got so many people today. We've got over 200 people have uh, registered for this event, and we hope those of you who have joined it will find it useful, and we hope you get plenty out of it. Um, we've got a, a lot to get through today, but I'm going to start off by just going through some housekeeping rules to explain how it all works. Now, you are all muted, so those of you who are uh, attending and the audience are muted. Uh, only those of us who are presenting will be heard during this uh, event. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, and I'll explain that shortly. Um, the event is timed, so we are um, aiming to finish this morning's session around about 12.25. Um, there will be around about an hour for lunch, uh, and we'll start again at 1.30, running through to close at 3.50 p.m. this afternoon. The event today is recorded. Again, I shall say a bit more about that uh, shortly. And uh, we have uh, applied and secured points from Basis and Neuroso for those of you who are interested in that. So, um, as I say, you are all muted. Now, that's great news uh, because it means that uh, we can't hear any, any extraneous noise within this event. Um, it does mean that, of course, unlike a normal event, you won't be able to ask questions in the normal way. But don't worry, there is an opportunity for you to type in questions. Uh, and if you have a look at the right hand of the screen there, there's a little mock-up of uh, the control panel for GoToWebinars. And down at the bottom, and if you can see my mouse hovering there, there is a question se section. So during each of the presentations you will listen to this morning, you will be able to uh, submit a question. Um, I, I won't be reading out the names of anybody that's submitting the questions, so they will be anonymous. Um, but you can pose your question, and at the end of each presentation, um, I will uh, pose those questions to the speaker. As I mentioned, basis and Neuroso points ha have been secured. Um, as usual, we never get as many as we would like. We have secured four basis points and four Neuroso points for this morning uh, and this afternoon. So a total of four for the whole day for each. How do you submit your basis and Neuroso forms? Well, you can send those to me at scott.raffle at ahdb.org.uk. You can send your, con your details of your name and all your uh, basis um, registration number. Um, or you can send it to my colleague Amna Yousaf um, and she, her contact details were circulated to you before this event uh, when you, when you registered. The event is being recorded live and so that's good news because for those of you that uh, can't watch all of it today or want to watch bits back later on, you can do so. It also means that other people who haven't been able to join us today can watch uh, the talks at a later date. They will all be posted up uh, on our archive page uh, on that web link that you can see at the bottom. There will be uh, an opportunity to um, fill out a survey at the end of today's event to give us your views on how well it went. Uh, I should also just remind you that if you are using a laptop computer, do make sure it's plugged into mains or you might get disconnected if your battery runs out. So a little bit more about today. What are we here for? Why are we doing this? Um, as in previous years, we've got a lot of research results that we have secured and, and delivered from levy payers uh, money. Uh, we funded a large, large number of particular crop protection projects, but others as well. And we want to uh, disseminate the results of that information to you. And I'm very pleased that we've got lots and lots of speakers for you today to do so. Um, in addition to disseminating that information, I'm also pleased to say that um, we have a number of posters. Now, those of you who normally attend this event will know that at the back of the uh, conference hall, we often have student posters um, telling you all about the work that they're doing in their PhD studies. And we have a system called the CTP Studentship Scheme, which is currently running, where there are a number of PhD students that are funded by the CTP scheme. 
and those students would like to tell us all about the work they're doing and we're very pleased that a good number of them have submitted posters today. Um, those posters will also be made available and put up on our web page uh, after the event, but they will also be sent to each and every one of you that registered for today's event so that you can uh, have a closer look. The posters are, are, are being done on PowerPoint presentations. There's a lot of small detail there, so we thought it better rather than presenting them on the screen to you today. You can have a look at those in your own time, but they are being judged and we will be announcing the winning posters for you at the beginning of the afternoon session. So looking at the programme for this morning, um, we've got a lot to get through. We're starting now uh, with Adam Whitehouse. Um, the bulk of today, I should say, deals with crop protection, which is what growers continue to tell us they want their money, levy money to be spent on. But uh, we are kicking off with a few alternative uh, talks. And, and this morning we will be starting with Adam Whitehouse, as I said earlier, running through to Beth and Shaw will be our final speaker who will take us through to lunch at round about 12.25. So I'm going to introduce Adam Whitehouse. Adam is known to many of you as the head breeder of the East Malling Strawberry Breeding Club at East Malling in Kent. Uh, good morning to you, Adam. Adam is going to talk about the latest selections uh, that we can look forward to seeing uh, in the commercial world from the East Malling Strawberry Breeding Club. Adam. Thank you, Scott. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen now. Yep. Yeah. Yep. OK, that's good. Thanks, Scott. Well, thanks for the invite again, and I'm uh, really pleased to be kicking off this first webinar. It's unfortunate the circumstances that we can't all meet together, but uh, it doesn't stop us from sharing the knowledge and what's been happening. So I just want to give you a quick view of what's been going on with the East Morning Strawberry Breeding Club um, over this season. We've continued despite the issues that we've had, and we've actually had a very successful season. So I just want to give you an update on some of the cultivars that we've released, what's come through, and also just some of the selections that are looking very interesting. So for those of you who, who aren't aware, the, the main purpose of, of the programme is to uh, basically increase yield and fruit size strawberries for the UK, fruit quality, extend seasonal production, and increasingly looking at resistance to fungal diseases. And we're looking at both June bearers and ever bearers in the programme. And there's a, uh, a sort of 33 to sort of uh, Oh, sorry, probably about third ever bearers, two thirds June bearers. Um, we're made up of a, a, a number of members that actually fund the programme, and the HDB has been a constant um, throughout. Um, they've managed to keep the programme a public programme, so all of our varieties are available for all growers, and that's important, in, uh, especially in the, the market where there are lots of proprietary varieties. So the HDB keeps this relevant to all growers. So those are the current, current funders of the programme. So although our um, breeding objectives and, and the bias on our programme hasn't changed, there has been quite a lot of changes since I last spoke to you, I think probably two years ago now. When, we've now got a fantastic uh, trial site at East Malling. Um, it's based on the wet centre, which many of you will have seen. So it's fully automated. Uh, irrigations are uh, on, uh, on sensors, automatic venting. And this is the first year that we've um, been grown fully in substrate for both our June bearers and ever bearers. So we're, we're more relevant than ever to the, um, uh, to the industry. I've talked often about how we implement some of the science that we do into the programme. And what we are doing at the moment uh, routinely now is genotyping all of our selections uh, using uh, a SNP chip. And we're using that predominantly at the moment to give predictive scores for crown rot, Phytophthora captorum. It has been an issue with some of the varieties from the programme in the, in, the, in the past. And so we're really pushing quite hard to make sure that what we bring through from the programme at the earliest um, opportunity, we, we are able to see whether it's got resistance or not. So we're able to screen at a very early stage by genotyping to see whether we have or can predict uh, resistance to Phytophthora. And this will be extended to a number of other traits as the programme develops. We're also um, starting to do a lot more um, blueprint work. So traditionally we would breed a variety and then we would just let uh, growers grow it uh, and learn that way. Uh, what we instigated in 2019 was a number of um, agronomic and blueprint trials for our varieties. Um, some of these have been done in-house. We've also got HDB involvement now with, with some of these trials going forward. Um, and we've also subcontracted some of these trials to um, agronomy groups on the continent, so independent groups, just to 
see what's the best way to grow our varieties, what's the best way to propagate them, um, and looking at a whole range of uh, uh, considerations that are relevant to a commercial grower. And the other big change is now that we um, are doing all of our commercialization and marketing in-house. So we um, have in the past historically used meiosis. We still have um, a very close relationship with meiosis. They're still a member of the club and we're still working with them. But going forward, all our licensing is coming through our commercial arm called East Morning Services Limited. So that's been another sort of big change in the program since I last gave an update. So moving on, uh, getting onto some of the uh, sort of nitty gritty of the selections and what's coming through. Uh, this is what we've got in our June bearer pipeline at the moment. So this is all material that's either at grower trials or going out to grower trials. On the left, you've got the uh, year that it will be in grower trials. And at the top, you've got the season along with the standards that we're um, either competing with or trying to slot into. So you can see we've got about 14 new um, uh, selections that are coming through. And in fact, some of these have been commercialized already. You can see there mid-season, we've got a new variety called Morning Vitality, which I'll talk about briefly in a second. What's um, really uh, sort of pertinent to what I've just mentioned about SNP chip and using the um, sort of genotyping and the genetics that go on at East Morning is that of all of the new selections that are going forward into the pipeline, a good proportion now of them have predicted crown rot resistance based on genotyping. Um, so we really are making a step change in that area. Okay, if I can move on just to some of the cultivars, what we're commercialising. Um, some of you will already be aware of Morning Allure. It was uh, actually released officially last year. It's a late season June bearer, uh, probably about 10 to 12 days later than Centenary. Um, so for those of you who can remember, probably similar to Florence season. Uh, the big difference is uh, it's got uh, probably less vigour than um, a lot of the late varieties. It's a lot uh, need to plant, uh, more moderate vigour, extremely good fruit display, and, and to all intents and purposes is a late morning centenary. It's actually got centenaries as a parent, so it's got some of the positive characteristics that we get through from centenary. It does still have some susceptibility to crown rot, but um, not as susceptible as um, morning centenary. So it's quite a neat um, June bearer to fit in between centenary and some early ever bearers. And that's now widely available from a number of propagators. Um, morning Vitality is a new selection that we're just uh, commercializing this year. It's um, actually quite a similar season to centenary. Um, we find and uh, glasshouse production actually comes in a little bit earlier and can be um, uh, probably about four days earlier, so sort of nearer to sort of clary season. Uh, but generally, uh, on tabletops under plastic, it's uh, quite close to centenary, maybe a day earlier or a day later. Very high percentage class one with good fruit size. Um, and you, as you can see from the picture, it's a lovely glossy berry with good shelf life. Um, but it's a real standout feature has, it's got excellent resistance to crown rot. And we are doing a number of trials at the moment uh, to try and understand the best way to grow this variety. So we're working on propagation, looking at different production systems and different tipping dates. So we'll start to get some of that information feeding through and hopefully I'll be able to report back to you next year on some of the outcomes of that. Uh, just to give you um, an indication of, of how it sits against centenary, uh, you can see it's certainly comparable in terms of yield to centenary. These are trade plants on a couple of sites, trial sites this year, uh, but the potential is actually a lot higher. Um, fantastic class one, so again, similar to centenary, and if anything, slight, slightly larger berry size, but obviously with that uh, resistance to crown rot as well. So that's just covered off a, a couple of the sort of very near market or commercialized June bearers now. I'd like to move on to the ever bearers. Um, this is the pipeline for the Everbearers, again, the same setup. This is what we've um, got going into trial at the moment. It's a lot smaller number, and that's kind of reflected by the bias that we have in the program. We look at a lot less Everbearers overall. Um, but actually, these are all fantastic selections. We've selected quite hard on these. Now, you'll see that we've got Morning Champion. I'll give a quick overview on that that was officially released last year. We've got another variety called Morning Supreme, which is um, a mid-season Everbearer, a high quality, which we're pushing forward uh, in 2021. And then uh, the other uh, selection I'll point out is EMR 796, which is just there 
back in trial for 2021, which has caused quite a lot of excitement in the industry this year. So if I can quickly go over Champion, for those who, who haven't tried it, haven't seen it, uh, it's a really attractive um, berry, really firm, excellent shelf life, and extremely productive early in the season. It's a true early uh, ever bearer, very generative. Uh, it's been on some commercial trials for about three years now, and it's certainly got some very high yield potential. Um, if you look at the graph at the bottom, this is just all data actually from PCH uh, in Holland who do independent trials. And you can see Morning Champion there compared to some of its uh, contemporaries from other programs, selections and varieties. Um, so we've grown this in the wet centre for, for I think two years now, Mark else will probably give an update as, as part of his talk later today. Um, but it certainly um, seems to have had a very good year this year. It suffered a little bit with fruit size in the last two years due to some of the heat, uh, but it does have a real sort of generative um, quality. And just to demonstrate that, this is some data from Dalphy looking at three different plant types. That's light mini tray, heavy mini tray, and overwintered mini tray, or heated uh, misted tip, as it's called sometimes. And you, you can see in terms of uh, uh, kilograms per linear metre, uh, you know, it's uh, between eight to nine, depending uh, on the plant type. So um, where it's been seen growing this year, it's certainly been very productive. Morning Supreme is one that we were going to release um, probably about a year ago. We didn't want to um, compete directly with Champion, but it's this has really stood out because it's got fantastic fruit quality. Slow, slightly lower yield potential, um, but a very sweet and juicy flavour. Um, the fruit is more sort of globose in shape, so not like the normal sort of conic shape that you get from East Morning. It tends to go a bit more sort of Sonata or Santa shaped. But the other interesting trait about this variety is it's multiple disease resistance. So it's got very strong resistance both to crayon rot, mildew and wilt. And this has gone ahead for commercialization now. Uh, it's in propagation with one propagator in the UK. And again, this is just some data just to demonstrate that it's a more mid-season type ever bearer. It does have an initial peak, but then it's fairly sort of steady over the main cropping period. Um, the production is slightly lighter than we saw with Champion, um, but not significantly so. It's um, a good um, commercial yield. But this is the interesting trait about Supreme, is that sort of consistency of um, quality in terms of bricks and flavour across the season. So this was from this year, a very hot year again. This was from Delphi, so they quite continental climate. But you can see that it had a fairly, compared to a lot of varieties, fairly sort of steady bricks level right across the season. I'm going to move on to the final um, selection. This is another Everbearer. Uh, and we looked, we actually looked at this in our trial two years ago. This is the first year it's been on commercial trials, but we're sufficiently excited about this uh, variety that we are uh, going to push ahead for commercialization. Uh, it's been on about uh, 20, 22 trial sites this year. And it's shown very good uh, yield potential, extremely good class one, uh, usually over 95%. But what does stand out about it is it, it effectively looks like morning centenary and tastes like morning centenary. It's a morning centenary type ever bearer. Um, it has, or we believe it has good resistance to crown rot based on our preliminary uh, trials. We have, we are aware that it does have some issues with mildew and we have seen some susceptibility on some sites this year, probably about 20% of the sites had mildew to a varying degree. Uh, we're investigating that. We think that there may be, uh, it, it looks likely it can be able to be managed effectively. In fact, uh, at East Morning, we've never seen mildew on it. And there are um, some sites that have very um, strong mildew management programs. And again, they've been mildew free. But we are gonna look at it in agronomic trials, look at mildew, we're going to look at plant types, we're going to look at plant density in 2021. And um, as I say, we're going to push forward to commercialise on this variety. Now, this is just some data um, from a couple of trial sites, looking at some different plant types and different densities. And you can see across the board that the um, total yield, this is just to the end of September, has been uh, extremely good for an Everbearer. Um, if you look at the class one, you know, some sites get 98% class one, and this it's quite a challenging year with some of the heat that we got in August. 
and um, then if we look at fruit size as well that's another strong attribute of this um, variety. When I talk about production, uh, this was 796 in Delphi trials on the continent, again continental climate. Now, if you look at the column on the left hand side, that's what we call a light mini tray. So it's actually just a uh, sort of reduced or, or uh, sort of near standard uh, nitrogen in the propagation field. Um, but for the first time ever with Delphi, they, they got over 10 kilos per linear meter, class one. That's not total yield, that's class one from an ever bearer. So it's really sort of peaked uh, interest in this variety. The, the potential is fantastic. Uh, this is the sort of cropping profile. It's more of a mid-season variety again, and it doesn't drop dramatically between the first peak and the second peak, so it can be quite steady. And we've seen some evidence as well with different um, plant types uh, that they can actually complement uh, each other quite well throughout the season. So having two plant types can actually sort of cover any dips in production, and that will be part of the work that we'll be doing in 2021-22, looking at different plant types and seeing what the best um, uh, sort of production system is going forward with different, different plant types, different systems. Uh, just to emphasise, it's some data from PCH, which is Selection 2796. In terms of fruit quality against Murano, it's, it stood out. And again, it's uh, one of the, certainly one of the highest yielding um, uh, selections that they've trialled at PCH. And shelf life, uh, it stood out in every respect. It was it was better than uh, Murano in this trial and uh, better than the average trial means uh, on every aspect of shelf life. And just to emphasise what it looks like, uh, when I talk about it being like centenary in terms of appearance, you can see quite clearly there that's photos from a number of trial sites from this year, just to emphasise how good it looks. So to conclude, uh, we've um, gone ahead and commercialised a whole raft of new um, varieties. We're kind of sort of, as we're moving forward from centenary now. So we have Allure and Vitality, which are two uh, interesting June bearers. Champion and Supreme both be available commercially next year as ever bearers. And EMR 796 is certainly the one to watch um, as, as a new ever bearer. Um, we're bulking up large numbers for next year for commercial trials. And there may be uh, options for it to be available commercially from 2022, certainly by 2023. And behind all of that, we've still got a hell of a lot of good stuff still coming through from June bearers and ever bearers that are following on behind it. So we're incorporating all of the allied research projects that we're doing, the science projects that we're doing at East Morning. You can see that they're having an effect in terms of the outputs that we're getting from the programme. We're expanding our agronomic work and trials to make it uh, a smoother transition from breeding to, to growers. We've got these enhanced trial facilities that make us more relevant to the industry. And as I've just emphasised, we've got a whole pipeline of high quality material to, to follow on. So certainly watch this space and, uh, and see where we are next year. I will just say that if anyone is interested in uh, any of the varieties, um, we're just setting up a website at, at the moment uh, for EMS, for morning varieties. But at the moment, we have a, uh, an email address there, licensing at niab.com. If you um, jot that down or contact them, they'll be able to give you more information about the varieties and who's propagating them and when they'll be available. So thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Adam, thank you so much indeed. And thanks for sticking to time. Um, just uh, a couple of questions we've got here. Um, first of all, was the EMR 796 uh, at four, five, six or seven plants per linear metre in the trials? Six, uh, six plants per linear metre in, um, in the Delphi trials. So where we saw over uh, 10 kilos per linear metre, that was just at six plants per, um, per linear metre. OK, thank you. Um, question about Mulling Supreme. Um, you talked about crown rock mildew and verticillium wilt. Uh, how, how confident can we be about that at this stage? Um, you know, we've had false dawns in the past with lots of varieties that we've used as an industry. How confident are we of, or are you about that resistance? Well, um, 639 has sort of been kicking around in sort of our trials for a number of years now. So we, we carry out 
a whole raft of preliminary trials, and in fact, it's been on, it has been on growth sites as well. Um, and all of our preliminary trials, in conjunction with the genotyping, are indicating there aren't any issues with those three diseases. And also uh, within the trial sites uh, and within propagation, we've certainly not been made aware of seeing any issues with those problems. So we're uh, reasonably confident that that's pr pretty uh, sort of true to, to what we're saying there with 639. I think with, when we've got a selection that's uh, probably uh, less near market, so with 796, where we've only seen in growth trials once and we've only got a small amount of preliminary trials, we have to be a bit more cautious. But I think uh, with a variety or a selection like uh, Supreme, which was EMR 639, uh, from what we've seen, uh, it, it doesn't seem to present any issues. Of course, there can always be different races out there that um, can challenge things and you know, it, uh, things evolve. <laughs> so uh, at the moment, that seems to be very true at the moment. Thank you. It's Thank you. Very comprehensive answer. Uh, final question uh, I think we've got time for. Who, who should uh, growers or, or, or organisations, marketing groups contact if they want to access or have access to any trial plants, any quantity of trial plants of any of these newer selections that are coming through? So uh, contact the uh, NIAB at licensing, uh, sorry, li licensing at NIAB.com uh, email address. Um, we we um, have a number of people that are not only working on licensing but technical now. So we have, new, have a new varieties development officer as well. So they will be able to um, sort of coordinate uh, material, availability of material and, and give more information. So just uh, use that um, uh, email address that was on my uh, penultimate slide, which I think it's going to be shared with everyone, Scott. So it will be shared with everyone. So everybody will have access to this. So you can see the slides again. So, yeah, Adam, if, thank if, you. Sorry, okay, go on. So I was going to say, if, there's, if, there's, if there are any problems uh, you can't get through, then, then by all means, contact me and I'll forward it. But please, if you could try and use that uh, licensing email, that would uh, be the best route to go. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. It's been a difficult year because normally we would have had the opportunity to catch up with Adam uh, when we have our East Malling Strawberry Breeding Club walk and we were able to taste these varieties and selections. But sadly, we haven't been able to do that this year. We do hope that we'll be seeing more of you next year with any luck, Adam. So but thank you very much. for. Thank you so much for your time this morning and presentation. Um, one other thing, somebody has asked the question, uh, they're struggling to see some of the finer detail of the slides that we've got here. Um, uh, my technical colleagues suggest that uh, if you maximize the go-to webinar window, that should expand the PowerPoint slide view. Um, but certainly, if you're still struggling to see the finer detail, as I said earlier, you will be able to look at these slides uh, fully um, after the event. So, Adam, thanks so much for your time. And we will move on to the uh, next speaker. Um, well, uh, Glasshouse soft fruit uh, is something that didn't used to be a common sight in the UK. It's a very common sight in today's world. And we are very conscious at AHDB that there is an increasing uh, area of, of, of production of soft fruit under glass. Um, AHDB and the HDC before it for many years has been funding a system called GrowSave. And GrowSave is run by NFU Energy, who are based at uh, Stoneleigh in Warwickshire. And they've been doing an amazing job for us for many years for protected crop growers of, of cup flowers, pot plants, uh, and uh, protected edibles like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. Um, but more recently, we've expanded the GrowSave uh, contract to uh, include soft fruit. And some of you may have attended one or two dedicated events uh, for soft fruit growers. Um, I'm glad to say the first time he's ever been on the platform, we have John Swain uh, from NFU Energy. He's the technical director at NFU Energy. And John is going to talk through us this morning some of the issues uh, which will be of interest to Glasshouse growers on energy insights in understanding the new normal. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Scott, uh, and hello, everybody. Yes, it's been a, a slightly strange year, as uh, as Adam said before, and as Scott, as Scott, Scott said in his introduction. Um, and uh, hopefully, I'm going to take you through some of the strange things that have happened this year in the world of energy as well, um, that have come out, some out of COVID and some not out of COVID. Um, we are in a state of change, and hopefully, um, that will come across as we go through. Uh, so yes, I'm John Swain. I'm Tech Director of NFU Energy. We've been running this Grow Save program for uh, all many years now. Um, just a point of note: the Grow Save information used to be available at growsave.co.uk. It's now available via the AHDB website, 
um, and you navigate to the Grow Safe pages um, either by the search icon or by following the various uh, links at the top. Um, there will be uh, an increasing amount of material on there. We are in the process of transferring over quite a lot of the material that we had under the old website, including most importantly, the technical updates. The technical updates really are the, uh, the, the written form of quite a lot of the information that we present over the years, either in person or at training courses, or even some of the outcomes of research and development reports. Um, and they present it in a concise way for growers to take and pick up and to, to use. And so, yes, uh, the technical updates are in the process of being written in a web friendly format. Uh, and we're also um, just developing a training platform to provide some of this online content for training, um, most importantly now than ever, because we can't go out and do training courses in the very traditional way that we did them in the past. So do keep an eye on that Grow Safe website. There's, a, there's some information on there already. Uh, and as we go through the next three, four, five months, it will start to be populated with ever more of the technical updates and the information that, uh, that we produce. So headlines. Uh, yes, energy has not been out of the headlines this year. Um, barely a day goes by without energy being in the headlines for one reason or another. Um, and some of that has been due to um, some weird and wonderful things that have happened because of reductions in demand. But more importantly, I think the net zero agenda has caused people to think about where our energy comes from, what the future is for energy and what we need to be doing about carbon emissions. Um, and therefore, energy is, uh, is important to a lot of people and a lot of headlines, a lot of uh, press is written about it. And here are just a few really that just emphasize what's really important to, to people. And you can see it, it hits those themes, what happens with demand, what's happening in the world of renewables, what about battery storage, what about energy storage, uh, and what about carbon? So those are the things that we're going to, to run through. I would say that uh, quite a lot of this stuff, stuff started before lockdown, um, and we'll start with the budget news. And this is when, uh, to sort of set the theme for the year, what are we going to do about our energy supply? We're going to disincentivize our fossil fuel use. Um, we've been disincentivizing it in a in a, a lot of ways, but not maybe quite so intensively as uh, as people would like. Um, and we can see that increasing taxes and charges and um, the very real likelihood of there being a carbon price applied to fossil fuels and the use of these um, over the next five to ten years. Alongside that, there are some positive drivers. So uh, all good schemes have a carrot and stick approach. Um, and uh, we, we come out of the world quite a lot of incentives, you know, renewable heat incentive, renewable certification certification uh, that pays for electricity, feed-in tariffs that pays for electricity. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we come out of the back of some of those incentive schemes over the last couple of years and we'll come out the back of the RHI towards the uh, latter end of March next year and the year after. But there are still some positive drivers out there and the Green Gas Support Scheme is looking to um, enable more biomethane into the gas grid, into the gas network to decarbonise that in much the same way as renewable electricity has decarbonised the electricity network. However, what I would say is that although the, the trajectory is here for both positive and negative um, ways of forcing people to use renewable energy or create renewable energy, the disincentives seem to be starting to outweigh the positives. Um, and therefore, I can see that as a theme for the future. It's avoiding costs um, by doing the green thing as opposed to benefiting from the green agenda as a theme for the future. So how did COVID affect what um, uh, happened in the energy marketplace this year? Well, yes, it is true to say that um, a reduction in demand on the network, especially the electricity network, um, happened as, uh, as lockdown happened. However, um, that started to go back up relatively quickly. And as we saw into the summer, sort of June, July, August time, um, energy consumption was back to, to pre-COVID. Uh, levels or start to get back up to pre-COVID levels. The change really was more about the pattern of use and um, sort of uh, maybe a, a two hour shift in pattern of consumption rather than necessarily a reduction in demand that, that continued throughout uh, you know, spring and summer. Really what has more of an effect is the weather um, and actually as we gain ever more renewables 
weather becomes ever more dominant in, uh, in energy supply. So we're used to weather having an effect on prices. If it's cold, then prices go up. Um, if we predicted a cold snap, a cold winter or a mild winter, then yeah, prices reflect that. However, what we're now seeing is we're seeing supply um, making prices change because of an oversupply or because of an undersupply through wind or through uh, uh, solar generation. And wind is by far the dominant. So, so coupled with reduction in demand, we saw quite heavy wind periods um, uh, sort of throughout the early spring and uh, into the late summer. And the consequence of that is we had some really long cold free runs. That's a measure of how green we are um, to a certain extent. And we've had some really low carbon intensities as well. Um, 46 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour is really quite remarkable um, as an instantaneous carbon intensity of the electricity grid. Uh, so weather, I would say, has more of an impact on uh, how we get our energy, how we create our energy and how we use it than necessarily uh, COVID did in the last 12 months. One of the reactions to that weather, um, and yeah, slightly coupled with reduction in demand, is this uh, hastily constructed scheme by the national grid to try and balance uh, the, the oversupply or the undersupply at any point in time. So they created a scheme with very short notice around the bank holiday weekend in May, optional downward flexibility management, which was about turning generators off um, when there was too much wind, too much uh, energy kicking around in the system, and turning load on. Um, and that's when sort of the normal grid flexibility was not enough. So we have grid flexibility. Quite a lot of our grid flexibility is um, tuned towards increasing uh, generation on the basis that we might end up with too short a, or not enough electricity. Um, this was in a response to having too much. Uh, and quite a lot of greenhouse uh, growers could benefit from this. And some of our greenhouse sites did benefit from this by able to turn their lights on uh, and being paid to do so or being able to turn their generators off and being paid to do that as well. Um, and so, yes, of that 100 megawatts of load, um, yeah, we had uh, something like 30 megawatts of, uh, of, of turn up involved in that. So, yeah, we were quite dominant as a horticultural industry in providing some of that uh, grid flexibility for those short term um, uh, periods. So yeah, can we benefit? As I said, so horticultural sites did. Um, anyone with combined heat and power um, has the potential of benefiting from that. Anyone with lights has the potential to benefit from that sort of a system. And crucially, I think for the soft root industry, people with heat pumps, and we've seen quite an uptake in heat pumps on the heating side of the uh, of the industry in uh, in soft fruit, um, both under glass and in tunnels. And there could be an additional um, capability of that to help balance the grid. Uh, where we have a heat pump, well, then we have the potential to store energy in thermal stores. We have the potential to be able to turn off and use our thermal stores. And therefore, we have a, a, a akin to an electrical battery um, that maybe allows us to benefit more from the heat pump that we have, um, rather than just its energy supply and its, in, and its incentive through the RHI. And coincidentally, the, the requirement for that is likely to be in those spring summer times when maybe heat isn't quite so important to us and therefore we can offer that flexibility to the grid. As with all things, more worthwhile for larger systems, megawatts of load is what the network is looking for um, to, uh, to, to help it out, not hundreds of kilowatts, but megawatts of load. Uh, moving on to uh, what they call green recovery, quite a lot of talk about the green recovery and packages of funding announced for that. Um, and this sort of continues the trajectory started in, in the pre uh, lockdown in the March budget, um, but outlines where we're going to put money as a as the country into helping move from fossil fuel based economies to, to renewable economies. And so, yeah, transitioning from gas to hydrogen in the heating system network. Um, and looking up scaling up carbon capture and storage, uh, including interestingly direct air capture. And you know, this isn't pie in the sky. You know, this is uh, carbon in the sky. Oh, there I shouldn't say that, should I? Uh, but this is pulling air through big fans, putting it through a chemical reaction, re releasing and removing the CO2 for either uh, storage underground in sequestration type measures or use elsewhere as a, a as a useful product. Um, and these are here and now, and there are companies doing these, and there are companies doing these on horticultural sites in the continent, so it's, uh, it's not very far away. 
we can't talk about energy without talking about renewable heat incentive. Um, we are in last chance saloon, last gasp of the renewable heat incentive. There is still an opportunity to get a tariff guarantee uh, application into the system before March 21. And if you install before March 22, then you'll still be able to avail yourself of the renewable heat incentive. Quite a lot of extensions and um, changes to that scheme over the last 12 months to make sure that uh, projects that were in development weren't too affected by uh, by lockdown and the inability to get things installed. And so, yeah, a lot of short term extensions and uh, grace period provided in that. But it will come to an end for general populace in March 21, and it will come to an end for tariff guarantees in March 22 for new applicants. And of course, then your tariffs will continue um, until your tariff end date of um, at, the, at the latest March 2041. There are going to be some follow on schemes. These are considerably less attractive. Uh, the clean heat grant basically as growers is hardly worth thinking about other than maybe heating your commercial offices somewhere else. Um, limited as it is to less than 45 kilowatts and a small four to five thousand pound grant um, for heat pumps and biomass boilers. And make no mistake, the government really want to incentivize small scale heat pumps here. They really don't want to be incentivizing biomass boilers. And as I said before, the green gas support scheme that will be paid for by increasing levies on gas uh, consumption, um, that's looking at AD plant producing biomethane for injection into the grid, which will continue very similarly to renewable heat incentive, but only for biomethane. So large scale biomass, large scale heat pumps beyond March 21 and March 22 will not be being incentivized in, in the way that we've seen over the last 10 years. Sticking with the theme of decarbonising heat, um, this is the key aim by government at the moment. We've decarbonised electricity quite well. You can see that in the carbon numbers that I'll show in a minute. Um, but we've really not um, got to grips with decarbonising the heat sector in the, in, in the same way. Um, and whilst we can put biomethane into the grid, while we can put hydrogen into the grid, we're still talking about combustion. Um, and that really isn't what the government wants. Um, they're much more um, keen to uh, incentivize heat pumps and sort of turn heat into elect or sorry turn electricity into heat and electrify the heat network rather than use um, heating fuels and of course that will be a problem in the rural economy uh, if the network's not available and that's going to struggle to to uh, to get the heat requirement that you need um, so how we manipulate that over the coming years to make sure that we can still benefit from um, fuel-based systems is going to be really key. Are heat pumps the future? Government certainly thinks so, quite a lot in the industry thinks so in terms of what's gone in at the moment. The numbers bear out the, 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 the principle, you know, um, if you put in uh, a kilowatt hour of heat from a gas network, then that's going to elicit somewhere around about 238 to 240 grams of CO2 depending on your boiler efficiency. You deliver a kilowatt hour of heat, not necessarily at the same temperature, I admit, but a kilowatt hour of heat by a heat pump. And because the grid electricity emissions are so low, then that's going to be near 70 grams per C, uh, of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So really big savings to be had in, uh, in carbon in terms of going to a heat pump rather than to, to heating fuels. Uh, and yeah, they're not just um, air or ground uh, loops, you know, ground water. Um, they can be looking for other alternative sources of heat to be boosted um, to certain temperatures. So uh, you can't fail to have read in the press about these very large greenhouses going over in the east of England um, using uh, waste um, heat from the sewage treatment works. Um, and those are the sorts of thinking laterally that uh, the government is encouraging us to, to, uh, to do. What about the CO2? Of course, if you want CO2 and you're not going to be burning gas, then you'll need to get your CO2 from somewhere um, and importing pure. And then suddenly some of these carbon capture and storage um, techniques, which might not have seemed quite so relevant, um, start to become really important to us as, uh, in the horticultural industry as a way of supplementing the CO2 that we need. Uh, so just moving into renewable electricity, uh, one of the things that uh, National Grid, Grid publish is their future energy scenarios. How do they see the grid being made up um, over the next 50 years or 30 years in this case? Um, it's 
yeah, they see the transition that renewables become so heavily dominant um, and gas becomes considerably less dominant as a generation capability. And set against the aims that we continually hear about offshore wind and uh, renewable PV, uh, sorry, solar PV, in terms of renewable electricity generation, they don't seem unrealistic. Um, and we're very much moving towards a renewable electricity dominated landscape. And of course, uh, launched today, the 10 point plan, um, grandiose title. I, having read this, I think there's probably four to eight points that are worth, uh, worth something and then a couple to make it up to 10 that are just really ideas. But yes, you can see it very clearly in here, 40 gigawatts of offshore wind. We want to every home to be supplied by renewable offshore wind electricity generators. Um, that's a grandiose aspiration. But uh, where there is a will, there will be a way of increasing what we have currently. Uh, five gigawatts of hydrogen, that's quite a lot, um, bearing in mind how little there is in the scheme. A whole town supplied by hydrogen, industrial processes being um, uh, using hydrogen as a combustion fuel. That is quite a grand aspiration to hit by 2030 in, in 10 years' time, with all the safety concerns and the issues there is around that. Uh, I suppose more disappointingly, nuclear. Um, positively electric vehicles, and said that they're going to provide additional load onto the grid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, interesting things to read there. Um, as we read that, we digest the plans. Then, no doubt, we will be publicising some uh, horticulturally specific uh, opinions around that ten-point plan that was launched today. Uh, so, what does it all mean? Yes, um, our virtuous virtuous circle. We need to be reducing our consumption to protect ourselves from these things um, and make the impact of installing renewable systems to uh, supply our energy uh, less capital intensive, using renewable energy where we can and reusing our resources as much as we possibly can to uh, further reduce our consumption and our impact. Um, and so uh, we certainly need to be thinking about that in all the business decisions that we take around energy consumption as it stands at the moment. Um, so, Energy carbon continued to move up the agenda. Renewable electricity soon dominate. Greenhouse heating moving towards heat pumps and new sources of CO2. I hope those messages are, are come through in, in, in what I've said. And I would love this to happen. Energy efficiency be of renewed importance. I think um, the problem with incentive schemes that incentivize the production of energy is that energy efficiency becomes less important. And of course, um, as an energy efficiency engineer, um, I really do want to see energy efficiency coming back as a very high up the agenda in terms of reducing our consumption and demand. Uh, just a couple of slides, possibly for your perusal later, but uh, gas prices uh, we've seen you know, re reduce over the last 12 months and they're starting to creep back up again. And funnily enough, electricity prices follow that as well um, because we're still fairly dominant in terms of gas pro producing our electricity. Uh, of course, the disparity between electricity price uh, and the cost it, it, it is from gas to make it um, is made up of all these non-commodity costs there. So still avoiding the use of electricity um, is better than uh, as much as you can. Uh, and that's it from me. Um, and I'll open up to questions. John, thank you very much indeed for that comprehensive summary. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time. We're just running slightly late. Um, but one question that has come in, who actually launched the 10 point plan? Who was that launched by? I believe it was Alex Sharma. Um, but uh, yes, it's it, launched by government, I suppose, is the, is the, is the true answer to that. Um, and it's been talked about over the last week um, uh, being launched by Boris himself, but I think it was Alex Sharma that was on uh, on breakfast television this morning talking about. Uh, okay, uh, and, and connected to that question, I suppose I, I, I was listening to today's program on Radio Four this morning. They were talking about um, in government increasing the amount of nuclear power. Um, what yes. impact would that have on the industry? Do you think in future? Yes, uh, and, and in reality, it, we need some form of uh, large scale inertia to, to balance some of these unpredictable uh, generation um, systems. So you know, when the wind doesn't blow, when the sun isn't shining, um, we need some of that thermal inertia. And I, I think the view is that nuclear will provide some of that. We did see um, the requirement for Sidewell uh, nuclear power station to turn down this summer because of the oversupply of, uh, of wind power. 
So it, it has to be flexible. And I think if you see in some of the plans, they're talking about small scale reactors. Well, small scale reactors are still a really large, large reactor. Um, so in honesty, um, they're really long term as well. Um, building, you know, look at Hinkley Point, it's still not built. Okay, great. We must leave it there. Um, John, thank you so much. I, I just no finally, just to say about the Grow Save uh, scheme, um, or representing Soft Fruit on John's committee uh, are Richard Harden of Berry Gardens and Sandy Booth of New Forest Fruits. Um, they do sit in and, and, and join John's committee to ensure that all the work that we do and under as part of Grow Save and John with his colleagues it is relevant to soft fruit. So if anybody wants to raise any issues, please do either do it through me or go to Richard or Sandy and they can feed your comments through to John and his colleagues and hopefully that will be of benefit. Um, I also often get asked the question, who, who, who can give me one-to-one -one information on this? Again, John is John and his colleagues, I think, are available to do that if you have any specific questions for your own business. Absolutely. John, thank you for your time this morning. Really yeah, appreciate you. your help. Okay, so let's move on. Um, our third speaker is Mark Els, uh, plant physiologist at NIA BMR, who again is known to most of you. Mark runs the wet centre at NIA BMR, but not, Mark is not actually here this morning to talk about specifically the wet centre, but he is going to be talking to us uh, about um, the soft fruit industry and building resilience to water related risks. Mark, it's all yours. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, I hope you can see my screen and, and, and hear me. Um, please let me know if there are any, any difficulties. So, so yes, this is just an opportunity to talk for a few moments about some, some non-AHDB funded research, but of course it's very, you know, very relevant to the efforts towards improving um, uh, productivity, resource use efficiency, and also improving resilience. And so the work I'll talk about today is a case study that is focused on the UK soft fruit sector but it's really part of a larger a larger project project that was led by uh, colleagues at Cranfield University so Professor Tim Hess and Professor Jerry Knox uh, and it's part of the global food security program funded by uh, the BBSRC so I'll just give you a little overview of the aims of the wider project and then we'll focus in on the on the UK soft fruit sector so, so the idea really is to understand how the how the UK's fresh fruit and vegetable system uh, how how is it exposed to water related risks and and how can we uh, make sure that we can continue to to supply the quality and quantity of food um, at the same time knowing that the sort of valuable resources are becoming ever more limiting and so so there are various research questions that, that sort of provide the framework um, for for this project. And so, so, for example, the second one, what does a water resilient fresh fruit and vegetable system look like? And are there any tensions between trying to improve water use efficiency and also trying to increase resilience? And so these are some of the wider questions that, that the team have been addressing over the last sort of three and a half years. And you'll see there the, uh, the partners um, on the bottom there. So uh, as I mentioned, this was a project led by Cranfield, but also involving uh, partners in the UK and of course overseas as well. So um, we've heard about energy and, and uh, the importance of CO2 and, and heat and warmth. And so, of course, plants also need fertilizer and water. And you can see there the top, top bullet point that suggests that, that one, one trillion cubic meters of water are taken globally from lakes and rivers and groundwater in order to, to, um, you know, to support the production of fresh fruit and vegetables. And, and that's 30% of the total volume required for all of our food production. So, of course, a, a, an absolutely essential resource that, that we know can be in limited supply. Um, obviously, there's a trend towards increasing uh, consumption of fresh fruit and vegetables and also uh, plant-based diets. And so, of course, this means ever more reliance on irrigation to improve the productivity and the quality and reliability of, of this uh, fresh fruit and vegetables. And of course, we have the backdrop of climate variability and this increase in demand uh, for these limited water supplies from environmental, domestic and industrial uh, needs, as well as the horticulture needs. And so you can see there's some of the some of the risks that are associated with with uh, you know, the um, um, water availability and, and how they will may impact on on businesses over the next sort of uh, five to ten years. 
so I think this is just a nice a nice um, snapshot of where the UK sources its fresh fruit and vegetable from. So this is taken from a, a paper by Tim Hess and, and Chloe Sutcliffe um, at Cranfield. And you'll see there, not surprisingly, perhaps that 43% of, of fresh fruit and vegetable is actually sourced within the UK. And then there you can see lots of other countries contribute to that, Spain, the Netherlands, Costa Rica, and so on and so forth. And you'll see there that top sort of um, top right hand so left hand quarter of that pie chart there's an awful lot of, of countries who contribute to our fresh fruit and vegetable and so you'll perhaps notice that the percentages in the table don't quite add up to 100 but that's the reason why there are other contributions from other countries and of course if we just look at the two headlines at the bottom there from the guardian you know there's there's increasing concern about us importing uh, water from those from those countries and and the impact of uh, of uh, sourcing food for the UK uh, consumers on the water availability and water status of some of these production areas and so um, so that's obviously a big concern from an overseas point of view and you can see here two photographs from from the UK and so the photograph on the left is is a, a reservoir up in the northwest in the, the very dry summer of 2018. Um, so obviously issues there, um, and you know a very familiar picture to probably most of you is the is the reservoir at Beale Water in in February in 2012, um, and of course 2012 was a very very wet year, but but preceding uh, that there was 18 months of drought, and that was the state of the Beale Water reservoir in Kent uh, after that 18 month period of of drought. So water availability. Uh, for, for all of the users is going to become uh, an increasing challenge and so how you know how can we respond to that and this is just to highlight um, the fact that obviously now because of uh, increasing demand for water for irrigation with an ever expanding horticultural industry um, there's an increasing need to to secure supplies of fresh water for irrigation and of course it's not just water availability water quality is a key is issue as well and so, so quality of the water use for irrigation, but also the impact of intensive horticulture on on groundwater status as well. So, so a lot, um, a lot of challenges that, of course, need to be addressed and overcome if we're to continue to supply UK grown soft fruit, for example, of high quality uh, and, and consistency. And so, there is this this water scarcity footprint of the UK. Uh, Fresh fruit and vegetable supply is is increasing, and it's it's likely to continue to increase over the coming years. And so, so how do we start to address some of these challenges? Uh, you must see there that it's not just just climate resilience. There's also um, food security issues, healthy eating, lowered emissions, and of course the availability of skilled labour as well. So, lots of challenges that we uh, need to address, uh, and, and specifically for the soft fruit industry, because obviously you'll see those, those photographs there, and that represents the, the shift over recent years from soil systems into substrate systems. And of course, an obvious comment to make is that all soft fruit production now uh, is is grown under under polytunnels, under covers, and so there's no or very little rain fed production now it's all absolutely reliant on irrigation for the quality and um and um our productivity demanded by the retailers and the consumers so so at the very outset given that there's an absolute demand uh, for irrigation in the soft root industry uh, we might expect that industry then to be perhaps more susceptible to some of the other sectors where there's still rain fed horticulture and so, so that was really what we set out to understand is, is how, what, what measures are growers putting in place now to try to overcome and, and sort of mitigate against these risks that are only really set to intensify over, over the coming years. So, so we talk about um, a resilience is a term that's used by many people. And I think it's, it's fair to say that it probably means different things to different people. And so you'll see there the bullet point um, that, that they, they're the responses from the 28 growers that we interviewed as part of this project. So you see there are a range of different answers around what, what resilience meant to those individual growers and their, and their soft, root, um, soft root businesses. So actually resilience helps us to bounce back. And so, so after a stress or a shock, uh, then um, 
resilience might mean that we can survive that that stress or shock, or, albeit productivity is at a lower level. It, it might mean that productivity can recover to pre-stress levels if, if we have resilient systems in place. And it might even mean that, that following a shock or stress, uh, we can put systems in place to help, help uh, increase productivity and reliability and consistency even more. And so, so there are three different ways to understand uh, what we mean by, by the term resilience. But essentially, it's, it's how we bounce back after a shock. And as I've said there, that, that may be at different levels. So how can we measure resilience? So I've, I've talked about this then. It's the ability to absorb shock, shocks and adapt and have a flexible system in order that we might pursue an alternative platform. And, and sort of the, a recent paper uh, that Chloe's written at Cranfield then really talks about these three factors of, of, um, of resilience. So redundancy, autonomy to organize and diversity. And, and these really determine how flexible the production systems can be and, and how they are, uh, how they can uh, adapt to shocks and stresses. And so these are the sort of the three, uh, the three um, areas that we set out to ask growers uh, how they were dealing with these sorts of issues at the moment. So we interviewed, my team interviewed 28 soft root growers. Um, you'll see there the map in the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, nice spread of, of, of coverage of growers, so not, not Kent-centric, but, but over, obviously in Kent in the southeast, in the east, in the West Midlands. And, and I'm thankful to say we obviously managed to talk to several growers in Scotland as well. And so um, we structured a questionnaire that, that had over 80 questions. And then these interviews were conducted by members of my team, visiting the growers, sitting down for a couple of hours and going through, uh, through these questions. And, and the sort of questionnaire was really divided into, into five parts. And you can see there the, um, the different phases of the questionnaire that, that we were asking the growers for. So I'll just, uh, we've collated those answers. Obviously the responses are all anonymized. And so we've collated those answers to really understand from those different businesses in those different areas of the UK, how they are beginning to adapt and respond to, to water related shocks. And I think the very first thing to say is that the, 2000, the summer of 2018 is, it is probably a bit, of a bit of a watershed moment for the soft roots industry. So, so, and I say that because we conducted a similar questionnaire in 2015, and again in the, in sort of March, April, May of 2019. And of course, there were very different responses from from in some cases the same growers. And of course, the only difference is is this very hot, dry summer we had in the in the middle of 2018. And certainly, you can see there uh, that's a graph of the rainfall in that year at the wet centre. And you can see there, mostly throughout June and July, 56 days without rainfall. And so, so the, that was a significant stress, a significant shock for a soft root system that, that relies on water availability to produce the yields and the quality that are needed. And of course, growers reported a reduction in yield due to the higher temperatures and the lack of available water. And as you might expect, of course, several other challenges associated with uh, pestilence and leaf pressures. Growers in Scotland, of course, were less affected by, by this sort of shock because the temperatures were cooler during the cropping season. But in, the, in England, for example, two growers responded that they, they ran out of water and they had to tank water along the roads to different produ production sites of the farm. And of course, there's a significant cost associated with moving that water from site to site in order to try to, uh, you know, try to protect the yield and the quality of the berries. And so in some cases there wasn't enough water and, and so growers had to prioritize high value crops uh, um, ahead of others. And there were some emergency applications for looking to install new reservoirs in order to try to improve local water security. I've just got a, mess, a, a quick question saying, was that 56 days um, um, without rain, uh, rain? That was in Kent at the wet center. And so obviously we'll have data for the rest of the UK as well, but that's, that's the, that was a situation at the wet centre. So normally and over those two months, we would expect 88 millimetres of rainfall, according to the long term average. In those two months last year, we got a, got a total of 1.7 millimetres. So, so a very, very dry season, uh, certainly in the wet centre, but, but uh, in other parts of the UK as well. 
And so, so we were just keen to understand then, uh, given these obvious challenges and of course abstraction license reform and the increase in regulation around um, water quality, how growers were responding to these challenges. And of course, some you know some uh, very progressive growers were, while the uh, um, license uh, license volumes were being uh, uh, calculated, some growers did you know did admit to applying more water than perhaps they necessarily needed to in order to make sure that their revised allocations were sufficient for their crops. Other growers who had planned to expand production areas brought you know brought those plans forward two or three years to make sure that the extra water that that was needed to support that production was then included in the revised um, allocated volumes. So what we have seen is this very uh, significant increase in interest in rainwater harvesting compared to the last time we, we spoke to the growers. And um, you know we know from work at the wet centre that, that it can be a very, very uh, good way to increase your local water security. So, so when we interview growers um, last year, 29% of growers were already using rainwater harvesting to to supplement their irrigation water, and a further 29% were considering installing those systems in the near future. And when certainly the work at the wet centre and in other 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 situations as well, when rainwater harvesting can is coupled with precision irrigation, so we're very carefully matching demand with supply. Rainwater harvesting could deliver self-sufficiency in terms of water in most years in in many of the uh, locations within the UK and. Um, as a separate project to be done to understand how uh, how we can provide growers with the relevant information to help make those those decisions. Of course, there are challenges as well, and um, the challenge is storage of the harvest of rainwater, and so that probably requires new reservoir builds for a small scale production area like the wet centre. We can use storage tanks, but obviously, for many hectares of crop, that that does require uh, uh, existing capacity or new reservoirs. Um, what we did often see is that there was lots of redundancy in some parts of the system and very little redundancy in others and of course a, a key area for any soft reproduction is the pump and the rig uh, you know dosing system and the rig and and often there was little redundancy built into those systems and and so there are there are ways of increasing you know redundancy in in a soft reproduction system and that might involve you know having two smaller pumps rather than than one larger pump for example um, and perhaps again, looking at perhaps installing two two smaller rigs rather than one larger rig. And so there are uh, there are ways to improve the sort of the, um, the redundancy of those systems. And to, just to comment at the end there, so over half the growers were already using all of their license volumes to produce their fruit, and over two thirds of the growers felt that their license volumes then wouldn't be uh, appropriate or sufficient, should I say, to to match their plans for fruit production over the over the coming years. So, so another uh, component of, of, of redundancy is diversity, and you'll see there the figure shows shows different uh, growers sourcing different uh, uh, sourcing water from different locations. Um, interestingly, five growers still relied on mains water, and, and you know whether that's uh, going to be appropriate or or even possible in the future is 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 up for debate. Um, importantly, all the growers were using more than one irrigation scheduling tool to try to best match crop demand uh, for water with supply. And I think what a lot of the growers are doing then is to is to test different systems to find out which one uh, is is most uh, you know most suitable for their own particular growing areas. And there's a lot more interest in using sensing technologies, automation, and and um, um, decision support systems because the Growing a soft root has become increasingly complex now, and, and you know there's a way, there's a recognition that the the industry can't now simply rely on intuition and experience. There has to be this this automation and this this um, this increasing reliance on technology, which which could itself prove to be a challenge. And perhaps I mentioned that just at the end of the presentation. So some growers see investing in these decision support systems as helping to mitigate against um, skilled labour shortages in the future. And as I've mentioned there, not only uh, are different growers using different scheduling tools, you know, many growers are trying trialing different production systems in order to try to optimise productivity whilst uh, optimising resource use efficiency as well. So, so lots of innovations are uh, being being tested in the soft root sector. And so again, this this uh, this uh, final component of resilience is this ability to uh, 
to um, reorganize. So, so how can growers reorganize in, in what essentially is a very sort of um, rigid funnel covered production system? And again, this, this, it really came across in the interviews that, that 2018 was a watershed moment for many growers and, and you know, whether growers were uh, impacted uh, you know, uh, marginally or significantly, I think that particular event did cause a lot of growers to begin to reevaluate re how, how resilient they would be to, to similar future shops. And so a lot of renewed interest then and investment in building new reservoirs, I've mentioned rainwater harvesting, sinking new boreholes, improving the scheduling technologies and the ability to match demand with supply, and again, building redundancy into the into the precision dosing systems as well. Um, and, and there's a lot of um, a move more then towards closed loop automated systems rather than perhaps in the past with you know where growers have used systems to to monitor in form. Uh, there's a lot more interest now in, in having these closed loop automated systems that, that can irrigate on demand. So um, I think this is the final slide. So just really how to how to uh, implement all that on a on a commercial side. Um, there's a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of interest in sinking new boreholes and uh, water storage capacity, rainwater harvesting systems, and and this point really about using sensor technologies and automation. That there's a lot of interest in that now, and as I say, many growers are using different systems that are available um, on a commercial basis for them to evaluate which one would best suit their suit their needs and there seemed to be this sort of acceptance then that that there was uh, you know that an increased reliance on technology was was unavoidable it, it, it was an inevitable part of the of this sort of expanding soft fruit um, soft fruit business but equally that then training and high quality support is is also needed to help to overcome any challenges and any issues and I think the growers felt that 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 rather than well as well as investing in new reservoirs of course that's a very expensive uh, very expensive uh, thing to do um, a lot of quick wins could be made by improving the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of their irrigation scheduling systems and i put the sort of the last uh, quotation at the bottom there in italics because there was a definitely from from the uh, participants of the project there was this view that those growers who were prepared to invest in technologies would increase the resilience to their challenge uh, increase their um, resilience to, to to future changes and challenges and shocks and that was a view uh, sort of uh, put forward by by many of the growers that that were interviewed so um that's just an over quick overview of what we uh, what we were doing as part of that that project so um, as, as part of this project another case study was the uh, the field veg and uh, sector in the in the east of England and so as part of this project then we want to be able to compare case studies and compare industries really and see how the different in industries are are um, responding to these water related risks and, and, and how how in their different ways they're building um, building resilience into their production systems so I'd just like to thank my uh, my colleagues uh, uh, for help with this project of course the team at Cranfield for um, for leading the project and most importantly, uh, the growers that, that we uh, interviewed for this, this particular project. We're always very grateful for your input and your support. And so if there are any questions, Scott, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Uh, uh, is, is, will there be a formal report from this piece of work that growers or industry members can see? Yes, there will. There'll be a, a number formal report uh, but also there'll be case studies and fact sheets and, and, and those sorts of outputs so so once they're uh, prepared we'll distribute them um, as you know in the normal ways okay so this is the start of more information dissemination on this this project that's that's useful just um, I'm conscious of time but one comment that has come in is uh, somebody saying that um, we shouldn't let agriculture take the rap um, for water shortage one of the reasons for water shortages in the southeast of England is the abject failure of water companies to build new surface storage reservoirs over the last 30 years despite increasing populations uh, I think we probably all agree with that comment wouldn't we I think we would yes that, that yes yeah yeah okay um one final thing to say before mark departs um 
Mark hasn't talked specifically about the wet center today and he usually does, um, but we, we have actually set up an alternative webinar dedicated to the wet center, which will take place between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock on the morning of the 15th of December. So uh, AHDB will be circulating invitations uh, to come and join that. Um, Mark will be on hand that day to give us the full details and results of the wet center re work and demonstrations that have been ongoing in 2020. So that's why we didn't ask Mark specifically to talk about that today. But Mark, for, for now, thank you so much indeed for your time. So um, that concludes the first three presentations. Uh, which are non-crop protection related uh, in this morning's uh, proceedings. We now move to crop protection, which takes up the lion's share of the rest of the day. Um, and the first of these presentations is dealing with powdery mildew uh, at on, on a commercial nursery. Now, um, what I need to do is give you a little bit of background behind, behind this before Robert Irving takes us through what we've done this year. Um, for the last five years, AHDB has funded project SF157. That was a uh, project to look at uh, novel and integrated pest management and disease control, um, looking specifically at diseases in strawberries. And one of those diseases was powdery mildew. Angela Berry at NIAB EMR um, led that work and took us through five years where we found out an awful lot. Uh, as part of that, we identified that by using uh, the risk model that was developed by NIAB EMR and is, is commercially available now to growers through companies such as Agritech uh, and uh, is also being trialled and, and demonstrated at the wet centre. Um, by using the powdery mildew prediction model, growers could, uh, could help growers to decide on the need to apply fungicides, commercially available fungicides. And Angela has uh, demonstrated, and she's talked at previous events like this in the past, that we can significantly reduce the number of fungicides applied in a commercial situation by using the risk model. So where there is no risk at all, there is no need to apply a fungicide. Uh, where, is there, where there is a low risk, we can rely on uh, biofungicides such as Sonata, which is produced by Bayer, or AQ10, which is sold by Fargo. So we can rely on those when there's a reduced risk, and then we have to rely on, on the conventional fungicides when there is a mid moderate to higher risk. So that's what we've learned in the past, and we felt we'd like to test that uh, for the benefit of the industry on a commercial farm. And we very kindly um, received uh, an offer from Jazz Singh at Vicarage Nurseries near Evesham uh, in the West Midlands, who said he would be willing to have a go at this. And um, we've employed, HDB has employed Robert Irving of ADAS, uh, who is the agronomist at that business, and also Angela Berry uh, in her retirement to help out to actually make this happen and demonstrate the difference between uh, a mildew managed tunnel versus a non-mildew managed uh, crop. So um, I invite Robert Irving from ADAS to explain more and tell us what they found on that commercial nursery this year. Uh, Robert. All right, thanks Scott. Uh, morning everybody. Um, right, so here we go. Does that look okay? That's perfect Robert, fire right, away. Uh, right, well Scott pretty much gave the outline here. We've got um, the, the folks, yeah, sorry about it. Right, there's three of us involved. Angela, now Angela has retired from East Morning, but um, so we should call her formerly of East Morning. But we're continuing her work as Scott has described, as myself and Jazz, who's managing the farm at Vicarage Nurseries. Scott, uh, Scott has described, um, we're just continuing work done at the experimental level at East Morning. <clears throat> now, in 2008, um, that was a very small trial at East Morning. Uh, they used very clean plants right from the start, no mildew on them from the propagator. That's a great help. They were checked twice a week for mildew, an absolute trace of mildew. And they had excellent spray coverage with the knapsack sprayer. And for some of that season, um, it's actually quite hot and that stopped mildew in its tracks. So this is why we wanted to push it out onto a large scale with nothing too fancy going on to see if the idea still worked. Now, Angela wanted to use a predictive model um, for this rather than just looking at the crop each week. Uh, twice a week really and making your mind up. 
and she chose to use the BBC weekly weather forecast. Now, the reason for that is that uh, to use a very precise um, sensor on the farm with a forecast associated with it, which, which can be done, it's just one sampling point in that farm. The BBC weather forecast would have the potential advantage of just being a broad brush. This is what you're likely to get for the week. Um, and that might be more apt, never mind being more freely available to growers. It also might be a, a, a very useful average statement as to what risk to expect for your farm in that week. So that guided us as to what to do next per week. Also, um, here's your model on what triggers mildew. And Angela looked at the weather forecast every week and referred to these data points really to gauge whether we had a, a low, moderate, or high risk for the next seven days. I just pause on that, so that's quite key information. Later on in this presentation, we're using this traffic light color system just to reflect as to how we went through the season. Here's the site. Vicarage Nurseries near Evesham. Um, it's an absolutely conventional site. Um, here's the trial tunnel. Actually, it's the second one in from the edge here, not where the red arrow is. There's a little reservoir there, which I quite liked because that's when you're near water, that could encourage mildew a bit. And then here's the conventional trial area alongside. So we had one trial tunnel there, treated all the same under guidance of Angela. And then we had the conventional no biopesticides in this program at all. Oops. And um, oh dear. That's, excuse me a minute. I just jumped. Biopesticides down here with conventional when it's needed, and then totally conventional fungicides along here. Right to use Murano and the peat based bags. There were no great health issues in that crop other than watching mildew. Don't go straight to the results, really. <clears throat> We're going to detail how we achieve those results a bit later. The conventional crop really didn't have any mildew problems on it. Um, and we were spraying that once a week. And then a few times when it looked a bit more dangerous, we made it two sprays a week. In total, we used 26 sprays on that conventional crop starting 25th of April, finishing 60th October. And in those sprays, only one was a biopesticide, serenade, there were five bicarbs, and the rest were 20 conventional fungicides. Now, Angela has actually done a very detailed report, 30 pages on this. Um, it's close to finish. So we'll have all the spray details and the weather details in that report for you to look at. Um, and we expect that to be done by the end of this yeah, certainly this winter. But the spray costs were nearly £3,000 a hectare for that large block. And we picked 836 grams per plant. That's as much detail as I'm going to go into on the conventional crop because really that was just our standard in the background. And we wanted to compare how well we could manage against that. Now, the trial crop starts off very well. Uh, we had guidelines from Angela that we must start spraying when we see the first whiff of sporulating mildew. Uh, we'll see later how that played out. We used just 17 sprays for the season, eight for biopesticides, four were bicarb, and five were conventional fungicides. And that worked out at about £1,400 a hectare. So there's about six, £600 difference per hectare spray cost there. And near enough the same yield of berries. So that looks rather encouraging, but it was a nail biter in my books. Here's Angela breaking down the forecast. In, and it's also worth saying we've got a, an email from Angela every Monday. She looked at the forecast, assessed, took about an hour each week to look at the weather data on the BBC forecast and then arrive at a, basically a judgment as to whether it's a low, moderate or high risk. Sometimes she would actually go halfway between each, hence the range of colors there. Angela's very rarely on the site, so it's completely remote 
judgment from Angela as to what how we should behave. And the aim was to maximise use of Sonata AQ10 in this trial tunnel. Right, here's the overview of the year. Um, don't look the, the greater details in the in the written report. But it was planted at the end of March and we went all the way through to October and the well, middle of October. And here's the length of spray program duration of it for the trial area. And this is what we did on the conventional crop. We started earlier, week beginning this April the 20th. Now that's quite critical that we started spraying the conventional crop earlier, much earlier than we started on June 8th, the trial crop. And in hindsight, we'd be a bit wiser. The season, we're going to break it down into five key parts because it's just too much to fit onto one screen. The pre mildew planted in March 30th, and we got through with a low risk of mildew all the way up to June the 1st. Now, here's my notes as we went through. I was looking at this crop once a fortnight, and um, April the 13th, no mildew, but when it comes to the 27th of April, begin to see this kind of leaf effect here. A little bit of curling. Now, to me, that's alarm bells, but the guidance manager was only start spraying when we see hyphae. So there was no fluffy stuff being seen, no hyphae. I'd normally, I'd normally prefer to spray on April the 27th, but we were pushing our luck. Uh, otherwise, we might as well just not have the trial at all. On June the 8th, we saw a little bit of mildew appearing, and this is this is exactly what we saw, just two specks, just like that in the trial tunnel. Now, the decision then was to spray with a, a, a conventional fungicide and to clean up the crop and then go for biologicals thereafter. We use cysteine because that's what we're using next door in the major block, just for convenience. And we followed that with bicarb and then straight into Sonata and AQ10. These are week beginning dates, by the way, but not the actual spray date. So we were beginning to pick up trouble on June the 8th. When we got into July, certainly on July the 6th, we're definitely seeing mildew appearing in the trial tunnel, on the flower stands, around the pips, and quite easily on the leaves. And to me, that was quite a scary moment. We've been using bicarb up that that point. Then this was a time we did agree before we started the trial that if we were going to lose the plot on this trial, we were not going to lose the crop. So we would revert to conventional uh, fungicides just to get us out of a pickle. So we used for the next two weeks, July the 13th, July the 20th, two sprays a week, one being bicarb, the other cysteine, the following week bicarb, and then the next one, talius. And in both cases, we split the dose and went both ways, opposite directions to get better coverage of the crop. We just had to get the mildew under control. However, crop notes, July the 20th, almost no spore relation, no much cutting. Well, you can never uncurl a leaf anyhow. The mildew appeared to be contained well, although there was a bit of mildew around the pips and the lowest berries, could have been where the spray was missing. This was now assisted, Berto. Uh, we were spraying at a thousand litres a hectare every time. Active mildew part three, when we're getting into the third, it's always a low level of sporulation on every plant. The lower sprayers may have missed a spray, had a bit of spray. It was getting a lot better. Lunar sensation goes on third. And by the 17th of August, no mildew, it is stopped. And we were in winning territory then. And then late August onwards, on goes a charm. But thereafter, for the rest of the season, we've got AQ10 and Sonata. Good level of mildew on the berries. It was all plain sailing after that. Now, uh, I should say that the Sonata was applied at the level of 10 litres a hectare. We didn't put a wetter with it. And the AQ10 went on at 70 grams a hectare. And there's no wetter with that. 
Um, Angela would have liked us to have a wetter with that, but we were following um, the label advice just to keep it simple. So there are comments would be, um, the military control would probably have been better if we'd started earlier, not waiting for that spoil relation to start. Um, if we'd done, say, a couple of, it's all supposition, but I feel if we started earlier, as you would have done with the conventional crop, we'd have had a better outcome without all this uh, kerfuffle that we had to go through. The prediction model of BBC actually worked quite well and gave a, a level of confidence that, in fact, you really weren't at risk um, until um, it said so. And uh, I was panicking all through April, May, thinking we must get spraying, must get spraying. And actually, that, that model did forecast this is when it's going to happen. And it, that is when it happened. We did see strong relation at that point. So I think that, that BBC model is actually quite useful. Um, and we did use a lower pesticide input in the trial, and it was nerve wracking, but actually we got pretty much the same yield. So that, that was quite, quite uh, reassuring. I finished now. Any questions? I must say thanks to Bayer, the Sonata, Hargrove for the AQ10, and Vicarage for hosting the trial. Very much appreciated people doing that. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Robert. I, I would second that. Um, Jazz Singh uh, was extremely helpful and cooperative throughout, uh, and uh, we're very grateful to Jazz. Jazz, we did ask Jazz if he could join us today. Unfortunately, he had another meeting to go to, so wasn't able to come. Um, I think the first question I would put to well, firstly, Robert, thank you so much for putting that across so uh, concisely and so beautifully. I, I, it's a very difficult topic to present, and uh, you've done it very, very, very well and done it justice. Um, I, I suppose the first question would be, um, having experienced this, I think that's some excellent results. I think you've, you've shown that there is a saving to be made, both in terms of numbers of product applications and the, the cost. Um, next year, let's look ahead to next season. Um, what have you learned from this and, and what will Jazz, perhaps the question we should be putting to Jazz, what will Jazz be doing next year in, in, in light of these results for powdery mildew control on an ever better strawberry? I asked him that yesterday and he didn't quite answer it. Um, I think we've we've gained uh, an appreciation of what Sonata and AQ10 can, can do. Um, we were encouraged not to spray earlier um, to follow Angela's guidelines. And Angela would say now that they're spraying a bit earlier, a week or two earlier than waiting for the high feet to appear would have been a good move. Um, we just had to wait until the high feet appeared. Uh, that's what came from the 2018 work. And Angela wasn't fearful of that because she was working with MSD and that didn't seem to build you quite as quickly as Murano could. So with all this mildew modelling, the variety um, really does matter as to how quickly this disease gets stuck in uh, and the trials that necessarily reflect that that rather important difference on outcome yeah okay so the matter never mind the prediction model so in terms of the early part of the next season um will 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 jazz or will other growers that you you visit will the, will you be encouraging them to use some form of prediction model and will you be encouraging them to reduce the, the the use of conventional fungicides in the early part of the season when the risk is low yeah i, I think these biopesticides definitely definitely have a place when you're at a low risk part of the year so the more you can get a hunch that it's a low risk um the more you're likely to use biopesticides and okay. they are protective, not curative so you know, yeah that's so that's the... and they're so, reasonable so... Price. that's the other thing it's quite comparable with the other products yeah, so I think the message the message is um, the model does work. People should use it if they can. Um, I, I, as I said at the start of this, the, the, the model is commercially available. I think it's Agritech services that supply it. Uh, but at the wet centre um, at NIA BMR, they are using the prediction model. And this year they have been using it along with weather forecast data, because I think that's the other crucial thing. It's all right to have the risk for today, um, whether there's a risk today. But if you're a grower and you're told 
there's a high risk today, you probably can't suddenly stop all your spray programs and, and reroute. You have to, you really ideally want a risk prediction for the next five to seven days. Is that fair to say, Robert? Yes, that's the whole idea of using BBC. It's yeah. uh, a good average uh, stab, in, you know, stab at what's yeah. coming at you. Also, uh, Angela's got a very detailed 29 page report, which will be yeah. out soon. And, and, and I will make. So if you're interested, get a hold of that. Yeah. Yeah, I will make certain that that is distributed to the to the industry. Um, Robert, it's been really fascinating. Uh, thank you for helping to organise the whole trial. Thank you again to Jazz. Thank you to Bear for the Sonata. Thank you to Fargo for the AQ10. Uh, I think we've got some really good results from that, uh, and we hope that growers will benefit and and use the results. Um, we must move on. I'm afraid. Thank you, Robert for your time, yeah, really appreciate it. So we are running a little bit late, um, but uh, I felt that was worthy of a little bit of extra time. Um, we move on now to Phytophthora. Um, Phytophthora raspberry root knot, uh, Phytophthora rubai. Aurelia Basinger uh, at the James Hutton Institute has been working on this for some years now as a, a part of a PhD study. Uh, and Aurelia is now going to talk us through what she's been doing and what she's finding. Aurelia. Great, thank you, Scott. Just going to put that in the slide. Show is is it okay? That's perfect. Right. Um, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm Aurelia. I'm a last year PhD student at the James Hutton, and I am working on raspberry root rot. Um, so a little reminder for um, people who don't know what raspberry root rot is. It's um, Raspberry root disease caused by a pathogen, an oomycete, called Phytophthora rubi. So you can see the disease is actually affecting the roots first, um, but it will eventually spread to the whole plant um, cane, and then the whole plant will wilt, die, eventually forming these disease pockets in the field. Um, at the moment in Scotland, for example, we have about 80% of growers that will find raspberry root rot. So it's a very important and prevalent disease. Um, because it's a phytophthora and an oomycete, it can stay in the soil for many, many years in the form of oospores. Um, and that's the problem because even if you don't have raspberries, these can stay in the soil. And as soon as you plant raspberries again, the disease will start again. Um, so the project was looking at how diverse is phytophthora rubi um, because genetic diversity will increase the potential for um, evolution and adaptation. So we wanted to study phenotypic diversity and that was in terms of responses to control chemical um, and also genetic diversity. Is there a genetic source for resistance and also the general diversity of Phytophthora rubi? So for this we um, had a lot of different isolates of both Phytophthora rubi and Phytophthora fragaria. So Phytophthora fragaria is a very closely related species. For many years, these two were thought to be the same species. The Phytophthora fragaria infect strawberries and rubai infect raspberries. And that's why we wanted to look at the differences in terms of um, within the species, but also between these two very closely related species, um, which have different hosts. Um, so first of all, we looked at the phenotypic diversity, we looked at chemicals, uh, some of you may recognize these chemicals, they are used in different uh, products to control these disease. And right now, these highlighted in greens are the ones that are still allowed on raspberries at the moment. And I'm going to talk about these two. So the way we looked at um, the chemical is we looked at mycelial growth. So we carried this um, analysis in vitro. We had different isolates grown on petri dishes and we measured the mycelial development with different doses of the chemicals. And as you can see, dimethylmorph, which is used in the um, fungicide parat, worked really well. So this is the mycelial development in percentage of the control at three different doses, 0 0.1, 1 and 10 ppm, which stands for parts per million. And most of the isolates here were um, really well controlled. The lowest dose was leading to less than 50% of the control growth. Um, and I think the field equivalent application dose was around 1 ppm. And you can see at that dose, there's no growth for most of these isolates. 
Now moving on to metalaxyl, uh, there was a mixed level of control. Now that isn't surprising because there has been previous reports of phytophthora showing resistance to metalaxyl. So we wanted to know if that is the case for Fregaria and Rubai. And you can see these in um, blue are Phytophthora fregaria and all the other ones are Rubai. And you see there is a clear distinction as two of them still grow at high doses, 10 and 100 ppm of metalaxyl, while the others um, don't. So that would highlight some resistance isolates in the population. So we move on to genetic diversity. And why are we interested in genetic diversity? Well, the first step is um, you could be wondering, I've seen the phenotypic diversity, I've seen resistance. Is there a change in the genetic that could explain that resistance? And um, the second reason is because if you want to build up durable resistance, you need to have a look at both the plant side and the pathogen side, because it's a constant fight and both adapt and evolve around each other so you need to know about more of the, the pathogen genes. Um, and for that, we used a novel method called pathogen enrichment sequencing. So this is a method that targets specific genes and only sequence those ones. And we looked at genes that are called housekeeping genes, because they are essential to function, and also infection proteins such as effectors called RXLR, crinkler, or apoplastic. The reason why we did this is because the infection prote proteins, the effectors, represent less than 1% of the whole Rubai genome. So there was no point for us of sequencing the whole genome where really we were interested in only less than a person. So effectors are um, developed to manipulate the host environment. Um, every species has a, a unique cocktail of effectors, and most interestingly, every isolate has a unique cocktail of effectors. So we wanted to identify what's called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, which are changes in the nucleotide sequence of these effectors, and that can lead to a change in the protein, and therefore that can lead to a change in how the protein will work. So we've had a, an overall look um, at the most conserved genes between the two species, and we found about 600 genes that were completely identical between all our 12 isolates, 8 rubai and for Fregaria. Similarly, we wanted to have a look at genes that were unique to Rubai and absent to Fregaria and vice versa. Um, so we found 142 genes that were shared in Fregaria. That means they were completely identical between isolates, but they weren't present in Rubai. And similarly, we found 69 genes unique and shared in Rubai. So you can think, for example, some of these genes may be involved in host recognition, since these two pathogens have two different hosts. Rubai infect raspberry and not strawberries, and Fraga is the other way around. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about general diversity over all the genes that we screened, which is about 15,000 genes in total. Um, a little bit more about diversity in housekeeping genes and about uh, diversity in RXLR effectors. I'm starting with the overall diversity. Um, we did a SNP analysis, so we looked for these changes in nucleotide in the sequences. And overall, this tells you that SCRP245, which is Fregaria, had the highest level of SNPs and therefore polymorphism. Now, that isn't surprising because out of the four isolates, um, SCRP245 is the only Fregaria that came from England. So that tells you there are differences between the three Canadian ones and the English ones. Interestingly, the genes that had the maximum of SNPs found was the same out of all the species. So this gene is very interesting because for some reason, there is a lot of variations within the same species out of different isolates. Um, and we did the same analysis on Rubai, found that STRP249, um, which was our only Germany, uh, isolates from Germany, was the most diverse. And overall, this gene seemed to be the most interesting as well, because it was most of, most of the time the most diverse gene. Now, if we look at housekeeping genes, um, these graphs are not really easy to, um, to see. But basically, what they represent is they represent the whole gene for different isolates. These are different isolates of Rubai. Um, and they represent the gene when it's mapped to a reference genome of the species. Um, or recently is the length of the gene. So when you see little dips, 
in that genes for this isolate, it means that nothing was mapping to the reference, which means they couldn't find a nucleotide that would match the reference. And therefore, this is how we identify that here, for example, there was a SNP. The nucleotide was different than the reference, and this is why it didn't map. So these analyses allow us to identify housekeeping genes that were likely to show differences in the nucleotide sequences. Now, what we were interested in was the difference. Does the difference in the nucleotide sequence lead to differences in the amino acid and therefore in the protein? So we looked at this within Rubai, Fregaria, and between the species. And we actually found that quite a few housekeeping genes show differences in the nucleotide sequence, but also in the proteins. And that is very interesting because these housekeeping genes are essential to function, and most of the time they're expected to be very uh, closely, especially between closely related species, they're expected to be very close with very few changes. So just to give you an example, I'm picking this one, which is a glucanase inhibitor, um, and it's actually um, very important for Fregaria because it will inhibit um, endoglucanase that are secreted by plants to start plant defenses. Um, and then we moved on with this analysis in mind. We wanted to know a bit more about um, our XLR. So we've seen differences in housekeeping and we thought there's quite a lot of differences in the housekeeping genes. Are there differences in their XLR? So again, that table is a bit tricky to read. I'm going to explain it to you. So these are eight effector, our XLR of interest. Um, and they're of interest because they are usually highly expressed during infection, at least for Phytophthora fregaria. And this is us trying to find those um, effectors in Rubai and in Fregaria. And we looked at different mismatch mapping rates. So that means this is when we try to map all our genes to the reference with no error, zero percent error. So if one nucleotide is different, the gene won't be picked up. And this is three percent difference, which means out of a hundred base pair, if three are different, the gene will still be picked up, which is why the numbers increase. These numbers represent the coverage of the genes. So you can see this one, for example, is shared between all the Phytophthora isolates, but it's not really found in any of the rubai. It's only found in two rubai, um, and it seems to be quite different. Whereas these three, if you allow a little bit of mistake and some polymorphism uh, with a three-person mismatch mapping rate, you can see that you can actually find them in Rubai. So these effectors are shared, um, we believe, between Rubai and Fregaria. Uh, and this is an example. This uh, are sequences of Rubai and Fregaria. And you can see in blue and black, it highlights the nucleotide differences. But otherwise, the gene is pretty similar. Um, interestingly, we have found that this gene, G32018, uh, was quite different for the English Fregaria, again, with only 50% being um, actually identical to the other three isolate. That means that for 50% of that genes, there are differences in the nucleotide. And also, we found that this was quite interesting. This SCRP296 is the only Rubai isolate that seems to have this one gene, as well as the Fregaria. This gives us conclusion and future work for the diversity, and that's my opportunity to thank HDB for funding an extension to this project. So we found like some genetic diversity, and we want to try and explain the differences that we saw in the chemical screening, especially in terms of responses to metalaxyl. And for this, we are going to screen what's called RNA polymerase genes because they are believed to be the uh, targets for metalaxyl. Um, and we also have a second uh, pen seg run, which is the target enrichment sequencing. It's in batch of 12 isolate. We've done 12, and we have a second run, making a total of 24 isolates, four Fregaria, 20 Rubai. And this will allow us to confirm previous observed differences between Rubai and Fregaria, but also it will increase the power and the strength of the diversity analysis. And this also allows us to identify more interesting RXLR. And the point is, now that we've identified this interesting RXLR, we want to try and know what are they doing during an infection. And that leads me to the life cycle of Rubai. So we wanted to try and replicate that life cycle in the lab. That isn't really easy, especially because we decided to go with hydroponic raspberries. 
which aren't easy to grow, but we finally managed using a method called nutrient film technique. We grew different cultivars of raspberries that have different resistance to root rot. Um, and the idea was to get a very clear and clean root, as you can see the microscopic image of the root. Phytophthora starts by infecting the very end, the very tip of the root. So we didn't want them to be damaged. And that's why we didn't want our raspberries to grow in the soil. So we looked at the cycle. This is the overall cycle of Rubai or Frigaria. And we started the infection with a fluorescent strain of Rubai. So we genetically modified her disease to express uh, red, here pink, um, fluorescent protein. We waited for it to make sporangia, which are the infection structures, which will really sue spores, which will swim to the roots, attach and start the infection. And that's how we started. And we wanted to observe every step of the cycle to see how our method was um, working to observe phytophthora infecting the roots. So after about three days after infection, we started to see encystment, germination and penetration of the roots on susceptible cultivars. And then we saw more hyphal progression inside the roots. And it's quite obvious that the mycelia accumulate in the central cylinder of the roots. And you can see at seven days after infection. And then later on in infection, seven days and 11 days, the hyphae was definitely progressing inside roots of both susceptible cultivar, Glendie and Glenmoy. We also observed reinfection. That is when the phytophthora will produce more sporangia and release next generation zoospores from the roots to infect more roots. It's just exponential. And we observe both sporangia and zoospores. And finally, we detected the oospores, which are those survival structure I mentioned earlier. Um, and that was from seven days after infection to nine days. And we detected them at much later infection stages as well, such as 14 and 22 days after infection. So we got some insight. We know how our method where we can produce hydroponic raspberries. We managed to successfully transform our phytophthora to be fluorescent. We infected the plants. Now we have key time points where we have observed um, key phases of the infection, such as attachments, hyphal progression, spore relation. And we want to check for what's called life markers. Um, and they are just making sure that we have those structures and the genes are expressed. So we will check for historia or spore relation. This represents biotrophy and necrotrophy phases when the phytophthora feeds um, on living tissue and then moves on to feeding on dead tissues. These are key time points that we will then use to check interesting RxLR, and that's what we are doing in the lab at the moment. We are doing loads of RNA extraction, PCR, and we want to check which RxLR are expressed and when. So I would like to thank all my supervisor, the Jeff Sutton, HDB, loads of people involved in this project, um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Aurelia. Uh, very comprehensive. Um, we, we are slightly short of time, but I've just got one question. I, for some years now, we've I, we've been aware of genes which confer resistance to raspberry root rot, and that has now been employed within the breeding programme at the James Hutton Institute within the UK Raspberry Breeding Programme. Um, uh, what stage will the practicalities of your findings be um, adopted within the breeding work, or, or are they already being used by your colleagues at the James Hutton Institute? Um, yes, so this is all to um, to identify maybe more genes. So if you identify resistant genes in the raspberries, um, you can also know which one are likely to be overcome or not. So if you identify the equivalent phytophthora that usually targets those genes, and you identify a lot of diversity that could be overcome or not, and this is why we want to select good resistant genes with the raspberry to not be overcome so quickly by the phytophthora. And we have a project right now at the Gem Sutton that works on this side of Phytophthora and Raspberry. And we work in partnership. So that person is more working on the Raspberry. I'm working on the Phytophthora and we're working together to provide more resistant genes. OK, so thank you. I think you've reassured us that all of this will be channeled into the breeding uh, work that uh, Nikki Jennings and our team are doing. Um, Aurelia, thank you so much uh, for sharing all your uh, results with us this morning. Um, and uh, that leads us nicely into our next speaker. Uh, st sticking again with Phytophthora, uh, we have Zhang Ming Zhu, who's uh, the head of 
uh, pathogen and entomological work at NIAB EMR. Um, first of all, before Shang Ming gets stuck into to his uh, uh, presentation, I should just say that uh, Shang Ming asked me just to clarify a, a point of information regarding powdery mildew work that Robert Irving was talking about earlier. And he, Robert was referring to the BBC model. Um, Zhang Ming rightly pointed out that it is the, a model that was developed by Zhang Ming at NIAB EMR, um, which was using BBC weather data. It's not a BBC model. It is the NIAB EMR model, which was using BBC weather data. Um, Zhang Ming, you can say a bit more about that if you wish. Um, but before Zhang Ming starts, just to say our, our final two presentations of this morning are dealing with Sceptre Plus projects. Um, Sceptre Plus is a project uh, that AHDB has been funding for several years now um, and effectively Sceptre Plus is, uh, gives us the opportunity to do screening trials to look at um, novel or new um, chemistry which might uh, lead to new products for controlling um, menacing pests and diseases that we face in the industry. And Zhang Ming has been employed to do a Sceptre Plus trial looking specifically at Phytophthora, uh, looking at dipping and drenching and fertigation work. So Zhang Ming, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Scott. Good morning and soon good afternoon to everyone. And first of all, I thank HDB for inviting to give a talk and of course for funding the project. Although the top, although in the program notes that I Sceptre Plus, but in order to give a complete view of why we're doing the work, I thought also it's far better to include the last two years' work on SF157, including the, all the work we've done on Fatafra, give you a complete view of the work on Fatafra, how we did uh, testing work, why we arrived at that situation, how we designed the testing work. Okay. So the Fatafra, really, we talk about is. As previous speakers said, we want to devise a system to test the uh, front of product as close to the to the real situation as possible, rather than doing the in vitro test or other things. So we want one of the key things really um, look at the background infection in the plant planting material. Then how can we reduce the damage due to the latent infection in planting materials, either as pre-planting dipping or post-planting drenching or more, more commonly used use fertigation in the early stage of planting. So in order to, um, to understand the why we're doing this work, it's far better to start with SF157, where we were tasked to say, what is the level of latent infection of planting material? So we did a an anonymous survey of all the planting material on the day they are going to plant in the field in spring, take 100 samples per batches. We did um, in 2016, 2017, two years. Then we did the symptom assessment of the plant and also look at the DNA from the crown tissue. And you can see from 2016 of five batches and um, six or five, we the the range of the level of plants with part of a DNA inside the crown tissue from 5% to 20 to 38%. Average is around about five to between five and ten. Then with the same thing again in 2017, same thing happened again. And for a range of the batch of the plants, range from nothing, it's very clean material, no fat of the detected in the crown tissue, to about 25% of plants in the crown tissue had for tougher. So you can see clearly the background is in the planting material, it's not safe to assume there's no photographer present. In general, we assume the as ranges between zero to 30 percent on average, you think about between five to ten percent plant will have photographer in the crown tissue. So the question now is given this is the background, how can we actually uh, deal with it? Before I move any further, the everyone knows it's very hard to assessing to assess phytophthora to confirm whether the plant deaths or wilting is caused by phytophthora. So the two ways you can do it, either you do a very simple way of doing look at the wilting and crown tissue browning, and finally um, the uh, DNA screening. What we found out is wilting is always not very great indication of the photographer because wilting can be caused by all sorts of things, particularly 
with the irrigation issue, fertilization, if there's a problem with irrigation line or 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 any or any drip thing, in particular line you have a problem with the, with the wilting. So without wilting is not good indication. But if you actually uh, cut plants through to the to reveal the crown tissue, you will see most likely the uh, if you see the the crown tissue browning, then you will more or less be certain. Should say most of the large proportion of the the crown tissue browning probably contain and um, photographic DNA in any healthy tissue. For this graph, you can clearly say in any healthy crown tissue uh, tissue, the passive DNA detected probability is far lower if the crown browning is showing. So essentially, we say one of if you don't have money time to do any molecular screening. Uh, a better way to confirm where's photographer is cut the plants through to see reveal whether you have a tissue browning. If you have tissue browning, then the probability of photographer is much higher than healthy, much much higher than healthy tissue. Okay, so that's essentially what we decide to do in the future work: use a crown tissue browning as a more reliable uh, physical symptom than uh, the wilting. Then. Furthermore, in the, then we'll carry on the lab work to confirm with molecular uh, screening. So the, the, the difficulty is, is trying to mimic the uh, latent infection in strawberry tray plants, not easy. And uh, the successful rate vary with the years. So what we general procedure would do is order lots of uh, 2,000 to 3,000 tray plants in autumn. Then we inoculate when the plant is delivered to Easter morning. Then we inoculate in in unheated uh, polytunnel, and with photophores with a mix of a number of species, a mix of strains which we use normally we use for our breeding work, and then we leave the plants there about six to eight weeks. So just before Christmas in December, they gradually move to cold store. Uh, from high, four degree, move down to two and to minus two, then coastal until next May. We decided to plant it very late instead of planting in the early May or late April. Decided planting in late May with the hope to um, in, to um, coincide planting with hot weather, so encourage plants up, uh, under stress to show if a tougher symptom. That's a that's a theory. So in the actual during planting, we either dig plants first for 15 minutes or 20 minutes under uh, a certain dose of product, then we plant, or we uh, drench them by 10 days post planting when the plants recover, start to produce new roots, so we do drench individual plants, or we fertigate in a particular day. Essentially, we um, use the same dose but apply through a fertigation uh, line for a couple of bursts. So this is the 2018 results, very interesting. It's saying really tell you, uh, if you look at the graph A is the plant, the number of plants are wilting, the number of, then the bottom one, the number of dead plants in each plot. Uh, the interesting is one of product F251, is a higher death than any treatment, even then inoculate control, that's simply because the product Although it was recommended under that, the high dose, but unfortunately, that high dose caused phytotoxicity when you use it as dipping treatment. So that's why this, this has a high level of the deaths and wilting because the dose used are too high, the, although the dose recommended by the manufacturer. So the key thing we'll look at is the treatment of, of the A, which is inoculant control. You can have a lot higher wilting and all the high number plant depth. But in general, we have the phenomenal is always provide the best control. And the the another one, F250, also shows some uh, promising results. But the general issue is very interesting, is dipping and drench didn't differ very much. And if you actually uh, dip the plants, then further drenching doesn't help and doesn't improve any control. So you say you don't have to do a treatment twice. Okay, so that's the 2018. So then we move to, to 2019, a full discussion with all the uh, F157 
um, industry committee members, they suggest uh, would rightly uh, for dipping drenching commercially, it's quite expensive business to do. So the question is, can we actually um, simulate commercial applications through fertigation? So we have tested several products in 2019 and apply the products to the fertigation or drench compared to the treatment. And, uh, but we use dipping with phenomenal as kind of a comparison as standard positive control. Again, you can see the graph with a lot of the, uh, again, it's left on the wilting, right is on the um, dead plants. The summary is the, the lot of difference between treatment and that's one or two uh, alternative products looks very promising. And most importantly, phenomena still provide the best control. If you look at the right most uh, the bars, you can phenomena whether dipping or through irrigation, they provide best control. And also you can see clearly next this graph, you say whether it's drenching or irrigation, there's no difference. That's really, that's really encouraging. That is, it's, it's easier for growers to provide the treatments through irrigation. The, uh, the diluted, uh, the uh, dose over time did not reduce the control efficacy compared with the drenching. So that's a really positive result. Based on that, so you can see the phenomenon had the effect, the pre-stop pre also had a decent effect as well. So based on this result, because F157 finished this uh, March 2020, and uh, we the AHDB panel think the work should carry forward, test more product, particularly through the irrigation line, through the fertigation. So that's why the insect of sector plus work. The the problem with sector plus, I don't want to talk to further two reasons, because we are still carry on molecular screening now, COVID permits, and we'll finish the molecular screening by before Christmas. So the full results will be available by January. So everything I'm talking now is really based on the symptom, which not necessarily means they are caused by the first thing. Second thing, the most product we tested are non-approved for strawberry use. So I have to use code. So I cannot talk too much about it until we have full results, full report by January, uh, by late January or early February. Then we can share with uh, with the Sector Plus committee. Then they will decide how to disseminate to industry because the commercial sensitivity the, the, or everything else. Okay? So everything um, we, we did is for the same procedure as 2018, 2019, uh, in uh, 2019 on fertigation. The only difference we include many, many more products. The phenomenal is used as the um, phenomenal as is used as a standard control as for comparison. So in total, we have 14 products that has the phenomenal as control. We have two uh, part control product. We have 11 other products which is not approved uh, for use in in strawberry, and some of those are plant based. The, the plant-based products, some are actually conventional fungicide. We also have inoculate, um, uninoculate con control, but you can see from the work I'll show you later, the inoculation seems did not increase the infection very much, appear did not increase. And so what I would do is to just see the screen clearly. So what I would do is to um, assess the yield, kicking other, the, we did not follow the 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 the, the plants that were sowing uh, was planted in um, coil bag, but they not they did not lay on the uh, instead of tabletop. Instead, they lay on the on the on the grape box. So we do not want to do the photo trial in our commercial near our commercial tabletop planting because of the problem with the cross cross contamination. So although our the uh, Cultivated is not standard commercial, but we still think it's worthwhile assessing the yield across all the peaks. Then we're looking at the plant, plant, I'm not sure if you're plant wilting, not planting wilting, the plant wilting during the fruiting period where their plants 
is under most stress. And also post-planting, we, we reduce the water supply, now subject plants to water stress, then we assess the wilting several times. Then we, in August, or uh, late August, early September, we cut every plant through, but 3,000 plants, a lot of work, 2,000 plants, cutting every plant through the crown tissue, look at where they assess crown browning. Then we a set, uh, sample a subset of the plants, about 400, 500 plants for molecular screening, testing for photophora DNA. This is a piece of work still ongoing. So what I'll show you now is really about the wilting and the plants with crown browning. And the only I say there's no difference between, between yield, okay? So that's why I'm not going to present anything with, with yield. Okay. When I, we assess a plant wilting during the July, or during the fruiting period, nothing at all. All, all plants looking you know, disgustingly healthy. When we look at the uh, post harvest, post harvest stress, two weeks after we impose water stress, the plants start to wilt. Again, you can see the inoculate control has the least, lowest possible wilting. So it's and the inoculum one had a 12, about 12%. 12 so, and when we analyzed everything data together, the no difference we have between the treatment as far as the wilting concern. Then we look at the um, the plant, plants not plants again, plants with tissue browning. Actually here, that's very interesting, is phenomenal, has the lowest level, it just reached the, the significance level compared with two control. And so phenomenal had the lowest possible level of the browning. As you may remember, the browning is most likely caused by photophora. Now, two other products, P5, P11, I cannot reveal the identity of them, also appear to be able to reduce the, uh, the crown browning um, based on the visual assessment. However, as I say, I cannot say anything else until we finish our molecular screening, about 500 plants uh, in, before Christmas, really to confirm uh, whether uh, the, uh, to, really to confirm how, uh, whether product had effect against the reduce the latent infection of Fatofor and uh, which products. And this will be contained in a report be available to AHDB by February. So to conclude, the second which I say is inoculation failed to increase latent infection. And that is common. We it's always hit and hit, hit and miss trying to mimic um, the level of the of the fatophora uh, latent infection. But luckily this year in our in, the, in this plant we used, we have about 10% of the DEPRA infection appears to be. And phenomena is the best one, and that's a reassuring. That really means our experimental procedure is still correct. And over the last three years, consistently, phenomenal is the best one. So that really does give us confidence our experimental procedure is, is reliable. The two other products, P5, P11, I think both are chemical products, appear to be um, uh, promising. Then we need to further confirmation for molecular testing. And thank you for HDB, all the technology team, Telecom, C, Jen, and Josh to do the work. So, any questions? Okay, thank you so much, Shang Ming, uh, for giving us the background behind the, the uh, work that we've previously done and for obviously commenting on this year's uh, SEPTA Plus trial. Can I just clarify, because somebody did ask the question, Phenomenal is no longer uh, approved for use in strawberry and you're only using Phenomenal as a, as a comparison, is that correct? It's okay. We only really use Phenomenal as we know it will work, so we only really use for experimental purpose to as a positive control to reassure us what we do is correct. Yeah. Yeah, so I can confirm to everybody who's asking the question, it is not approved for use on strawberry. We know that it's just there as as a, a, by means of a comparison with the other products. Another question, Shang Ming, that's come in has been um, why we didn't include Parat as a, as another um, comparison. Is there a reason behind ah, that? 
Perhaps inside, I didn't review any name because I don't know how sensitive they are. So I need to talk to HDB panel to decide which name to reveal, which not to reveal. I don't want to cause any trouble now. So power is is included. Okay. It, sorry, it is included. It is included. So one of these, okay. one of the truly product. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um, how were the inoculations carried out? Were the roots dipped in zoospores? What do we happen? What do we do is we use these uh, zoospore suspension and trenches through the 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 the, the, the trenches through the trenches the plants, and then we change twice. So first time, then the one, then to increase in fact, we did it one week later as well. So to trench a certain volume of the inoculant over the uh, through the plant to to, to the root while, while they're still on the trays. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody else just commenting, just a reminder that Parat is uh, is going to be lost. Uh, that will be discontinued in the next uh, twelve months or so. We we are aware of that. Um, in that other... in that case, I hope Parat's not P five or P eleven. Then yes, indeed. Can I, can I just explain to everybody if they're not sure why? But um, we we are under strict instructions, um, not from the from the owners and the agrochemical manufacturers of all these products that we cannot disclose uh, the identity of these products um, and we're, we're beholden to them for that. They're kind enough to provide us with these products uh, on the on, on the basis that we're not permitted to disclose their identity until such time as uh, that agrochemical company decides to seek approval uh, or, or we seek an, an, an EMU or emergency authorization. So there is a good reason why we're not allowed to disclose that. Um, another quick question, I think, that before we move on, what medium was used for the plants, uh, Zhang Ming? It's, it's, it's what do you mean? It's a straight, it's, it's coir, straight coir. So it's straight coir. Okay. Yes. I think it's botanic coir. Right. Okay. Thank you. I just just want to close this before we move on to our next speaker. Um, just to close by saying, um, the AHDB, um, well, my. Rachel McGauley, Katia Maurer and I um, in the fruit department at AHDB, we do liaise a lot with the consultants in the fruit industry and uh, all the agronomists. And, and working with our crop protection colleague, Adam Doxford, um, we recently had a consultation meeting uh, with representatives of all the major um, agronomy companies and those attached to marketing organizations. We speak to them regularly, but we have an annual meeting with them to discuss their concerns about pending losses of products. Um, so we are continually keeping ourselves up to date with what's been lost and what we need to find alternatives for. And we are unfortunately wholly fully aware that uh, Phenomenal has gone, Parat is going. We would love to get things like Aliette and Prevacure Energy um, uh, approved. Um, but this was the reason for uh, employing Zhang Ming and his colleagues to do this Septa Plus work to try and identify some alternatives because it's not always so simple just to get a, a product back. There are so many regulatory hurdles and so many good reasons why we can't always get products like uh, Phenomenal or Aliette uh, back into the into usage. Uh, Zhang Ming, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it today and thanks for your concise uh, presentation. So we're going to finish off this morning um, sticking with Scepter Plus uh, and uh, midges, cane raspberry cane midge, blackberry leaf midge are problems for cane fruit growers and have been for a good many, many years. Uh, and um, we decided to fund a Scepter Plus trial, screening trial to, to find out a little bit more uh, about how we might control raspberry cane midge and blackberry leaf midge in future. Leading that is Bethan Shaw. Uh, Bethan is probably known to many of you. She works with uh, Michelle Fountain and the entomology team at NIA BMR. She's done a huge amount of work on SWD in recent times and did her PhD uh, on circadian rhythms of spotted winged Drosophila. But on this occasion, she won't be talking about SWD. Um, she's going to tell us all that she's found on raspberry cane midge and blackberry leaf midge. Uh, Bethan, over to you. Cheers, Scott. Can I just check you can see my screen? OK. You can indeed. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, yeah, it makes a nice change for me to speak about um, something other than spotted wing Drosophila. So I'm quite looking forward to this talk. Um, I've been asked to present the results from the Scepter Plus 38 project, um, which follows on from a desk based review that Charles Whitfield presented at the Soft Root Day last year, looking for alternative control options for midges in raspberry. So the two midge species we were hoping to control 
uh, were raspberry cane midge and blackberry leaf curling midge. Raspberry cane midge females lay their eggs in splits in the canes and the damage they cause can uh, result in pathogen outbreaks and can weaken the canes leading to splitting, snapping, sorry. Uh, blackberry leaf midge, the females lay their eggs in the tips of the growing shoots and the larvae burrow down into the curled shoot and they cause this distorted twisting um, of the growing shoots and this can damage the plant health and subsequent flower development. For both of these species, um, the first generations emerge in the spring and again for both the species, timing of sprays is crucial to control these pests. So on the 5th of March this year, we set up a field trial with the help of Sally at WV Chambers, who hosted the trial for us. It was a soaking wet day, um, so I do have to apologise Sally, to Sally for uh, getting him drenched while he helped us set up this trial. Um, there were no covers on the tunnels the day we set up the trial, and we deployed three species-specific pheromone traps for raspberry cane midge and three for blackberry leaf curly midge throughout the um, area that we were deploying our trial. This is just an overview to show you the distributions of the plots. The coloured boxes indicate the different spray treatments um, and we took over three tunnels uh, at this site and within each of the tunnels there were three rows of raspberries. On the figure on the left hand side this is just an overview although we sprayed the whole um, area within the plot we only sampled from the middle central row and from the central uh, six meters it was a uh, quelly floricane uh, crop in coir pots so the pheromone monitoring traps were deployed on the 5th of march and were checked three times a week throughout the whole trial um, from previous uh, trials we've had on raspberry cane and blackberry leaf midge, we know that we need to check the traps quite frequently to make sure we don't miss the first emergence of the um, first generation in the spring. On the figure in front of you, you'll see a black dash line, which is the trap threshold for these midges, which is three mid uh, three sorry <laughs> ten midges per trap per week. And once growers start catching that in the traps, it's then time to apply uh, protection products within 24 or 48 hours of reaching the threshold. So for raspberry cane midge, which is uh, denoted by the red bar, these are the um, average trap cap catches from the three monitoring traps. We first detected raspberry cane midge on the 6th of April. And when we went to check the traps the following visit, this had risen to 32 midges per trap per week. So we obviously had exceeded threshold by within a three day period, basically. Um, for black relief curly midge, which is the purple bar, uh, we first detected midges on the 13th of April. And when we revisited three days later, uh, when we revisited the following week, um, this had risen to 10 midges per trap to, per week, which was the trap threshold. The tunnels were covered on the 4th of April. Uh, and at this point, the nighttime temperatures rose on average by four degrees. And we think this is probably what has kind of spurred on the emergence of the first generation in this, um, in this period of time. It's also worth saying that the daytime temperatures were very warm as well, with most days reaching well above 30 degrees. So to look at the uh, monitoring traps in a bit more detail, we were using red delta, uh, monitoring traps with a sticky base insert and the traps were baited with these uh, rubber septum which are the little they look like uh, pencil toppers in the center of the figure on the left hand side on the 12th of march we've not detected any of either species in any of the monitoring traps um, for raspberry cane midge on the 20th of april we were getting on average 70 uh, midges per trap per week which is obviously quite high pest pressure the insert on the right hand side of the screen just shows what the midges look like under a microscope. For black relief uh, curling midge, we started to notice that we were catching lots of owl midges in the monitoring traps. And I bring this up because it's worth mentioning if you have inexperienced or um, if people are checking the traps that wouldn't normally do it, 
it's worth pointing out that there could be some contamination with other midge species. Um, I hope you can see there's quite a big size difference between the midge we're looking for, which is highlighted by the red circle in the bottom right hand side. Um, they're quite a lot smaller than the owl midges. So hopefully just on size alone, you should be able to get a better indication of what you've got in the traps. By the 20th of April, we were still only catching around 10 uh, blackberry leaf midges per trap per week. So the populations, the pressure wasn't that high for this particular species. For the sprays, um, we were unable to apply the treatments were in, within 24 hours of me reaching raspberry cane midge threshold. And this was because there was a delay in receiving products due to the current circumstances. We were able to apply them within 24 hours of meeting the black relief curling midge threshold. So five treatments were applied on the 20th of April, as well as a water control. Four of these five products were then reapplied a week later on the 28th of April. The sprays were made by uh, air assisted knapsack sprayer. Um, and there's some details on the screen there uh, for volumes and uh, temperatures and things like that. For blackberry leaf curly midge to assess the efficacy of the products we applied, we picked 50 shoots per plot and assessed the number of damaged leaves, both old and young leaves. And damage can be seen on the left hand side of the screen. It's the characteristic twisting and distorting of the leaf veins. We also counted the number of larvae uh, within the leaf curls as well. We performed three assessments for blackberry leaf midge three, 10 and 20 days post the first spray. For raspberry cane midge, we made artificial splits in the raspberry canes at the bases of the canes with mounted needles just scoring under the, uh, the skin of the canes. These were made 24 hours before the sprays were applied. 10 days later, we then went back to collect the splits that we'd made and counted the numbers of eggs and larvae that were within them. So it's worth saying that these assessments were made nine days after the sprays were applied. So for the first and second blackberry leaf midge assessments, there were no significant differences between the treatments, but there were in the third assessment. So we found three products that significantly reduced the amount of damage to young leaves for blackberry leaf curling midge. One of these was delta methrin, which we used as our positive control. We then had two coded products. Scott's already uh, spoken about the issues in regard to saying what they actually are. But I can say that AHDB 9950, this was is a conventional insecticide. It was only applied once within this trial. Um, so the results that you're seeing in front of you are from the 20 days post spray assessment. So it's actually giving quite good reduction in damage um, for a long period of time. AHDB 9971 is a, a bio-biological bio bio, uh, bio, uh, product, basically. Um, and again, was able to reduce the amount of damage to young leaves. In the mean number of larvae in the leaves, <clears throat> only delta methrin and AHDB 9950 significantly reduced the numbers in comparison to the control. Uh, we do still see some reduction with 9971, uh, but again, this wasn't significant. For raspberry cane midge, it was unfortunate that we weren't able to apply the products um, when we would have liked to, when we when we reached threshold. But obviously, it was completely unavoidable this year. Um, we were just impressed we were able to get the trial executed, to be honest. Um, there were no significant differences in any of the treatments compared to the untreated control. And we think this is primarily due to we had very high pest pressure in the areas that we were working in. Uh, you probably noticed the trap catchers from the monitoring traps. It is worth saying that Flipper and uh, Flipper reduced the amount of larvae per split around 45% in comparison to the untreated. 
um, and 9835 by around 30%. So although they weren't significant reductions, they are showing some indication that they are providing some level of uh, control. So to summarise, um, 9950 reduced black relief damage and number of larvae compared to the untreated control after one application, and this was post spray by 20 days. Um, AHDB 9971 reduced black relief midge damage compared to the untreated control. And as I said, unfortunately for raspberry cane midge, there was no significant difference between the treatments and the controls. Uh, but there is some indication that Flipper and one of the coded products was having an impact. So my short is in comparison quite my talk is quite short in comparison to some people's, uh, but just to reiterate thanks to Sally and the guys at WB Chambers and the technical staff at East Morlin and the trials team for getting this work executed this year in very very difficult circumstances. Um, obviously I have to thank the companies for their in-kind contributions and a bit of a random one, but I also want to thank my partner who came to help me collect the samples in the middle of lockdown and saved me from a very long day of uh, traping through a wet raspberry field. Um, so if there are any questions, I'd like to take them now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Beth. Yes, there are a number of questions coming in. I'm conscious um, people want to get away for some lunch and have a rest, but I think it's only fair that we give you the chance to answer these. Several questions coming in. Um, first of all, um, question here about um, how old the crop was that you used to do the work on. Was it was it a fresh, uh, were the fresh canes per pot and was it on an old site or a fresh site? Had it been used for raspberries and cane fruit before? Um, it was a flora cane crop. I'd have to look in my notes uh, specifically, but I do believe it had had raspberry on the previous year, um, which yeah, probably attributed to the very high number of raspberry cane mish okay. that we, yeah. That yeah, we that, had that, in the trial. That, that, that would help to explain that. Uh, the other, another question, what rate of flipper was used and was it used with a wetter, do you remember? Yes, it was used with a wetter. Um, Again, off the top of my head, I can't tell you the rates. I've got it all in the report, which has okay. just been submitted to SEPTA. So I believe that will be coming out in the next few weeks. Um, okay. But if, if you want to message me directly, I can um, I can send you the okay. more um, That would be helpful. If you don't have Beth's uh, email address, you can contact me, scott.raffle at ahtb.org.uk, and I'll pass it on to Beth. Um, yeah, the another question here, um, will experiments be repeated with the uh, coded product HDB 9950? Um, I, I think that may be more of a question for HDB and SEPTA Plus, to be honest. We had hoped to repeat some of this work next year and try to focus on the raspberry cane midge uh, because we were frustrated that we weren't able to get a handle on that in this particular season. Um, I I don't see why we wouldn't want to do that, uh, but again, it just all depends yeah. on on how SEPTA okay. um, want to proceed with things. I know yeah. that's probably not much of a helpful answer, but it, unfortunately, it's out of my hands, really. No, no, we understand. That's that's that fully answers the question. Um, I should just say that uh, I mentioned earlier on about our um, interaction with the industry agronomists at HDB. Um, the industry agronomists did tell us that uh, on their wish list for cane midge and black relief midge, they'd love to get gazelle, which is acetamaprid, and batavia um, for, for, for use. Um, we're aware of that. Well, somebody has asked the question, was acetamaprid included in the trial? Or maybe you're not allowed to, to inform us on that. I don't know. I, um, it wasn't included in the trial. It, it wasn't. In, it wasn't included. Okay. And any natural pyrethrins? Do we know if um, any pyrethrins were included there? No, they weren't. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, what yeah. I can say is that um, you you did do some work with Dasis uh, Delta Methrin. Um, my colleague Adam Doxford at HDB is pursuing um, that as an EMU. Um, or, or as an emergency authorization, we're fully aware that that isn't compatible with IPM programs, but it may just be that we need something like that as a as a, as a backup should we have nothing else. 
So um, I think it's just to reiterate, Bethan's work um, has come up with some useful answers, uh, but the report won't be available until the, later on in the year or the winter time, but it will be made available to, uh, to everyone. And uh, we are fully aware of the need to get alternative products for these midges. Um, Beth, thank you so much. I think that's all of the questions that we've had this morning. So thank you for, for taking that. Uh, I shall just appear on screen again, um, just to, to, to finish off uh, for this morning, to say thank you so much to all the speakers uh, and to those of you in the audience who've asked so many questions. That's been really helpful. We hope you've got a lot out of it. Um, the This webinar will remain live um, over lunchtime. So, um, we we will stay live with it. We didn't want to stop and start again. Um, you're very welcome to keep the the thing running over the over the lunch period, and or if you wish to log out and re and, and uh, re uh, log in again uh, after lunch, we will be starting again at 1:30, and uh, we've got a number of talks again to run through for this afternoon session, which will conclude around about 10 to 4. Um, don't forget that we will be announcing the winning uh, poster from the or winning posters from the CTP Studentship Seek poster uh, competition. So uh, join us at half past one for that. And in the meantime, I hope you have some nice lunch. Thank, thanks, everyone. See you at half past one.
Good afternoon and welcome back to everyone. Um, I hope you've had a nice lunch. I hope you can uh, all hear me OK. For those of you that weren't with us this after, uh, this morning, my name's Scott Raffle and uh, I work for the AHDB as a Knowledge Exchange Manager. Um, I hope you've all benefited from this morning's session. We've got a full session uh, available this, this afternoon. Um, but before we get into the session this afternoon, um, I want to just talk about the CTP Studentship uh, poster session, which we would normally have been running earlier on uh, or in previous years at the back of our uh, at the back of our event hall. Well, this year, obviously, we haven't been able to do that, but we will be sending the all the submitted posters from our students, from our CTP and other uh, PhD studentships uh, schemes. Um, we will submit those and, and circulate them to all the members uh, or delegates that have attended today, and they will also be made available on our website later. Um, but I can say that we received a good many this year. Um, thank you to all the students who took the time to pr pr prepare and put these together. Um, I can also uh, tell you that we've judged all of those posters uh, with the help of my colleague Rachel McGauley and Harriet Duncalf, uh, who was a uh, software grower in East Anglia and who still works actively as an ante to many of the students on, uh, on the schemes. So um, we have three prizes this afternoon. And I'm very pleased to say that um, <clears throat> we have funding for these prizes, one from the East Malling Research Trust, uh, oh, sorry, I should say two prizes, and one from Berry Gardens. So I'm going to start off with the uh, Berry Gardens prize, uh, which was uh, a voucher, uh, which will be made available to the winner. And this is a prize that goes to the best poster submitted by a first year student at the CTP scheme. And uh, Harriet and Rachel have judged that the prize should be go to Philip Johnson. Uh, the title of his poster was Accurate Control of a Low-Cost Soft Robotic Arm for Automated Strawberry Picking. So congratulations to Philip, and I do encourage you all to, to have a look at his poster uh, afterwards. Um, we also have two prizes, a runner-up and a winner's prize, overall prize for the best posters uh, of the day. Uh, and these are both funded and sponsored by the EMR Trust. Um, congratulations to the runner-up, uh, that is Nick Dodrell, and he receives a cash prize of £50 from the EMR Trust. The title of his, present, uh, of his poster is Realising Increased Photosynthetic Eff Efficiency to Increase Strawberry Yields. Uh, and I'm glad to announce the winner uh, of this year's uh, poster competition um, with a prize of £100 in cash from the East Malling Tr Research Trust goes to Ross George uh, for his poster on new controls for potato aphid on strawberry. Um, Please do take time to have a look at these when they're circulated. I can tell you there are lots of other good topics, including repellents for spotted wing drosophila, cladosporium on raspberry, soil amendments for apple tree health, powdery mildew resistance in strawberry and, and raspberry root rot. So it's a whole range of topics to have a look at. So please do take time to have a look at those. OK. Um, just to lead into this afternoon's session, uh, I have uh, uh, we have a number of speakers uh, starting now, running through till about 10 to 4, hopefully, if we stick to time. We're going to start off with Alicia Bartel from ADAS. Now, um, many of you who grow raspberries will have had a lot of problems with two-spotted spider mite over the years, particularly in hotter weather, hotter climes, and under polythene tunnels. And we've done a huge amount of work as part of Project SF158, which has been looking at uh, novel uh, and integrated management of pests and disease within cane fruit crops. Um, and we've done a lot of work on this already in the last four to five years. But most recently, uh, Alicia Bartel and her colleagues at ADAS have been undertaking a project looking at new approaches to spider mite control with alternative predators and predators that might overwinter. So I welcome Alicia. Alicia, um, I look forward to your talk and I pass the floor to you. We can't hear you, Alicia. Perhaps you'd like to unmute. Is that better? Can you That's see? Perf we can see you and hear you perfectly. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Scott. Um, my name is Alicia and I'm a consultant at ADAS. Previous. I'm just going to give you an introduction today on the work that we've been doing in two-spotted spider mite control 
in propagated raspberries. And in this project, we're focused on growing the plant from four centimeter plugs into 1.5 meter cane. And we decided to focus on this uh, part of the crop because it's really important for growers to get clean stock. And so they want to start off with really high standards in propagation. Some of you may have heard me talk about this project last year, don't worry. I have only included a brief introduction to last year's work and there are new research results from this year. So why is two spotted spider mites such a pest in raspberry cultivation? Well, this project came about as a response to a lack of pesticide options for outdoor and Spanish tunnel grown raspberries. Oh no, I'm having a bit of trouble with this screen. And therefore, and two spotted spider mite is also, oh, hold on, prone to developing resistance to acaricides because it can have many generations in each year. And of the acaricides that are available, many are also ineffective against the eggs. So, for this reason, biocontrol of spider mite is nothing new, and Phytocelus persimilis is a predatory mite that has, is generally considered the best in many situations. And this is because it is a specialized predator of spider mite. And it is able to locate the spider mite within the crop by detecting plant volatiles that are released from feeding damage. However, when using biocontrol, it's very important to release the right product or biocontrol at the right time and the right rate. And Phyto does have its limitations. For example, it is vulnerable to some pesticides used in raspberry cultivation, such as Finisad or spotted wing Drosophila control. And Phyto has a fairly narrow active temperature range and it can also die out if spider mite is absent. So, in this project, we looked at using the generalist predatory mite, Andersaeus andersoni. And andersoni occurs naturally in raspberry crops because it is a British native and therefore it can be released outdoors. And since it is acclimatized to the British weather, it can also overwinter in the crop by going into diapores. Andersoni becomes active at a lower temperature than phyto from six degrees and can therefore be released outdoors uh, early on in the season for preventative control. There's also been research done to show that andersoni is more resistant to pesticides used in um, raspberry cultivation. However, this could just be in native populations and not necessarily commercially released one. As a generalist, andersoni does not only feed on spider mite and is not as adept at hunting it as phyto is, but it can survive when spider mite is absent, unlike phyto, by eating things such as pollen, fungal spores, honeydew, crypt larvae, and other pest mite species. So, in this project, we wanted to answer the following research questions. How well does two spotted, does Andersonia andersoni perform as a fire control? What is the effect of feeding andersoni with Nutrimite? And Nutrimite is a product by Biobest, which is bulrush pollen, and this has been successfully used in Europe to boost numbers of other predatory mite species in other crops. We, and so therefore we wanted to test whether this could be done with andersoni in raspberry. We also wanted to test what is the survival rates of andersoni after overwintering in a commercial cold store and which biological control program produces the most overwintered predatory mites. We also wanted to look at whether releasing andersoni in the autumn could boost numbers of overwintered mites. So in, answer to, in order to answer these questions, we designed a program of five different biocontrol programs and released these at rates and timings recommended by the manufacturers. We looked at the efficacy of Andersoni alone, Andersoni with Nutrimite, Andersoni with Phytocelus persimilis, Phytocelus persimilis alone, and Andersoni with an additional autumn release made in September. And this is to test whether this could boost the number of overwintered mites. So how did we apply the, the mites in propagation in the tunnel? We applied Andersoni and Phyto loose in a vermiculite carrier and continued to release Phyto loose in the field. Andersoni we released in the field with 
Gemini breeding sachets provided by BioLine, and these can release up to 2,000 mites over a six week period. And these were put out at a rate of one sachet per two meter length of row on two supporting wires. Nutrimite was applied at a rate of 500 grams per hectare, which was carefully weighed out in beakers in propagation, but applied with a Makita blower in the field. As you can see in this video, getting the timing right for calibration was very important, but for larger scale operations, there are tractor mounted applicators available. With the trial set up and running, we took samples back to the laboratory for assessment. As you can see in this picture, Anthony eggs are larger and elongated compared to spider mite eggs, which are smaller and spherical. Phyto are easy to identify by eye, but Andersoni are a look, uh, almost identical to other predatory mites, and therefore we needed to confirm identification by looking at hairs and other tiny diagnostic features under the microscope. So moving on to the results, how much spider mite did we see in the trial? You will notice from this graph that we didn't find any spider mites in the trial until the 5th of September, and then numbers increased into October. The solid bars here represent numbers of adult and nymph spider mites, whereas the striped bars represent number of eggs. I'll just draw your attention here, which showed that there were significantly fewer adult and nymph spider mites where Andersoni had been released on its own or with Nutrimite compared to releasing Andersoni with Phyto or releasing Phyto alone. As for the eggs, there were significantly fewer spider mite eggs where Andersoni was released with pollen compared to releasing Phyto alone. So it's one thing to look at numbers of mites, but how does this translate into damage to the plant? In this graph, you can see that we found significantly less leaf damage where Andersoni was released with pollen compared to releasing Phyto alone. And so looking at numbers of predatory mites in this graph against spider mite damage, which is shown by the dashed lines, numbers of Andersoni are shown by the solid bars and numbers of Phyto are shown by the striped bars. You will notice again that the Phyto, we did not find any Phyto in the trial until the 16th of October. And this was after the spider mite had been seen in the crop and therefore this suggests that any phyto we had released beforehand had died out due to a lack of spider mite. We did however make a release of phyto on the 17th of September and these were able to establish in the crop and begin breeding well into October because it was still nice and sunny and warm. The Andersoni however was, pre was present throughout the trial despite the lack of spider mite and because there's a lot going on on this graph, I'll just draw your attention to the most interesting parts. On the 26th of June, you'll notice that there were significantly more Andersoni, where Andersoni had been released with Phyto compared to the other treatments. And I haven't shown it here, but this was also the case for the number of Andersoni eggs. And this could suggest that the Andersoni was feeding on the Phyto, where they had been released together in a small space with not much else around to eat. The other interesting point to note is on the 10th of July, there were significantly more Andersoni where the and, and Andersoni had been fed with the Nutrimite compared to releasing Andersoni without Nutrimite. And this shows that it was possible to boost the population of Andersoni at this time, just after transplant to the field when there was perhaps not much else around to eat. So in, in answer to our research questions that I mentioned, how well does Andersoni perform as a two-spotted spider mite biocontrol? We found that early releases of Andersoni led to better control of a late infestation of spider mite compared to preventative releases of phyto. And this was because the phyto that was released had died out until spider mite was present. And, and then phyto, when re-released in September, was able to establish well. However, the results show that gaining early control was beneficial here. In answer to our second question, what is the effect of feeding Andersoni with Nutrimite? We found that there were significantly more Andersoni adults after transplant to the field when Nutrimite had been applied compared to where Nutrimite had not been applied. And this led to significantly fewer two-spotted spider mite eggs and damage where Andersoni had been released with pollen compared to the releasing phyto alone, but this was not significantly different to where Andersoni had been released without the pollen. 
And this brings us on to the second part of the project, looking at the overwintering survival of mites. Both Andersoni and his spotted spider mite can survive the winter by going into diapause, and this increases their cold hardiness and allows them to store fat so that they can survive without wheat eating as they hide in cracks, crevices and leaf litter. The raspberry plants went into cold store on the 18th of December, which is set to minus one degree. And we left some plants in the field in ambient conditions to compare these to the cold stored one. On the 25th of March, the canes were removed from the cold store. And on the 30th of March, we assessed the ambient stored plants on the basil buds and the leaves which had just started to open. And at the same time, took some of the cold stores stop cold stored canes back for analysis with Holgram funnels and then left some of the other cold stored plants in the field to return at the end of April after the leaves had opened. So the plants spent 15 weeks in cold store and the maximum and minimum temperature of the cold store are shown here in blue. You can see that the minimum temperature never gets below minus two degrees. The maximum does fluctuate but never reaches as high as the maximum temperature in ambient conditions which was up to 15 degrees in February and would be high enough for spider mite activity. There were a few frosts in ambient conditions with the coldest down to minus 4.5 degrees. However, this is unlikely to be cold enough to kill a sheltered diapausing spider mites. So looking at the results in ambient conditions, we found no mites or eggs in the leaf samples. However, this could be because we experienced some very strong winds just before sampling and these dried out the plants and may have caused the mites to scatter. However, we did find two spotted spider mites and eggs in the basal buds of the ambient stored plants, but we did not find any predatory mites. The results are shown here, but there were no significant differences between the treatment. So for those of you who aren't fam familiar with Tolgram funnels, these are what we use to extract the overwintering mites from the cold stored raspberry canes. The heat and light from the bowl at the top causes any living mites to crawl away and into a mites collecting tube. And this method is great, although it doesn't allow us to look at numbers of eggs. So looking at the results for cold stored conditions, Andersoni was able to successfully survive overwintering in commercial cold storage in low numbers. We found adults in the cane, the basil buds and the leaf samples and we also found eggs in the basal buds. I'll just draw your attention to the significant difference. You can see that there were significantly more Andersoni eggs where Andersoni had been released with pollen in the previous season compared to releasing Andersoni alone or alone with an additional autumn release. Unfortunately, two spotted spider mites also survived commercial cold storage condition in low numbers, similar to the numbers of Andersoni that we found. And we found that the two spotted spider mite in the cane and the basal buds. We only found one mite itself in the leaf samples. And two spotted spider mite had also begun to reproduce in the basal buds, but there were no significant differences between the treatments. So at the end of the experiment, we were able to answer our re research questions. Uh, what is the survival rate of Andersoni after overwintering in a commercial cold store? We found up to 0.8. Andersoni adult mites in the cane samples and also found them in the basal buds and the leaf samples. And this shows that it is possible to seed propagated raspberry plants with predatory mites ready to take action against spider mite when they're sold to growers. And this is important because up, we also found up to 0.5 two spotted spider mite per cane had also survived commercial cold storage. In answer to the question, which biological control program produces the most overwintered predatory mites? We found that there wasn't one program which particularly stood out from the rest, as there was no difference in the number of adult or nymphs or spider mite between the treatments. However, there were significantly more Andersoni eggs where Nutrimite had been released in the previous season, compared to releasing Andersoni without Nutrimite or with the autumn release. And in answer to our final question, does releasing Andersoni in the autumn boost numbers of overwintered mites? We found that no, making an additional autumn release of Andersoni on the 5th of September did not significantly affect the number of overwintered Andersoni or spider mites. If we had perhaps released 
at a higher rate or at a different time, this could have made a difference, but more work would be done, would need to be done to look into this. So that's all I've got time for today. I'd just like to thank the host grower for working with us, HGB Horticulture, of course, Byline and Biobest for their contributions to the project and the team at ADAS for their help. The project has finished now and the final report is available if you'd like any more information and I'll be happy to take questions now as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alicia, and kept to time as well. That's that's just what we need. Um, yeah, I, can I just ask a question? Um, so are, is it safe then to say in, in, in conclusion that uh, Amblysis andersonii is going to supplement uh, Phytocillus persimilis? It's not going to replace it, but it supplements what, what um, Phytocillus can do for us. Is that fair to say? Yes, I, th I think uh, as the phrase goes, horses for courses, there's there's mites for different times of the year, perhaps, and Amazoni is at its best early in the year at the low temperatures. And, and I should point out it's, it can also uh, survive higher temperatures and drier conditions than Phyto as well, so it can provide help with the spider mites air in the summer conditions as well. And is it best to avoid mixing them both at the same time or, or introducing them both at the same time? Uh, I don't think it necessarily needs to be avoided. The results in this um, work did show that the Andersoni could have been feeding on the phyto in propagation, so I certainly don't think there would be any need to release them both at that time when, when it's unlikely that there are spider mites around. However, we did, we did do some work looking at the, the spider mite hotspots in detail, and we did find Andersoni and phyto coinciding on leads with spider mites quite a lot of the time, showing that they can work together without competing, without our competing each other as well. Okay, thank you. A couple more questions and then we'll move on. Um, could you please let us know how good um, Amblyseus andersonii is at moving over two spotted spider mite webbing and how voracious is andersonii compared to Phytocillus persimilis? Um, I, I have studied Andersoni under the microscope for quite a long time and I, I have seen it moving over the webbing and I've also seen it devouring spider mite eggs at quite an impressive rate. However, as a generalist, it's not always as hungry uh, as it might seem. So sometimes it, it might just wander around not eating for a while and then suddenly devour 10 eggs in 10 seconds. Okay, thank you. Um, and final question, I think, is uh, what is the minimum temperature which will kill two spotted spider mite and Amblyseus andersonii? In other words, I suppose how 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 far can we reduce the temperature safely? I don't know. I have actually tried to look this up and I found it quite a difficult piece of information to find. It's something I would like to look into more, and I'd be happy to get back to the person who has answered this question. Okay. Even phyto uh, has been shown to survive temperatures of minus five for a, for a couple of days, and the other mites are a lot more hardy. Okay, well, if any of our audience out there have got thoughts or experiences, please do jot them down on um, the uh, question. Just, just, just pose that question and reply to that, and uh, I can read that out later. We must move on. Thank you so much, Alicia, for sharing all that experience. I think that's really exciting work because it just gives us more uh, option or increases our options for two-spotted spider mite control on raspberry. Thank you very much indeed for for joining us today. Um, so that moves us on to our next speaker, um, Celine Silva, uh, who works. At the, in the entomology department at NIIBMR, working with Michelle Fountain and her team. Um, Michelle and Celine have been doing some work, at, as you can see from this picture, right next to the wet center uh, at East Smalling. And they've been investigating floral margins and their potential to support natural enemies in strawberry. So we're better to do this than uh, right next to the wet center itself. Celine, uh, tell us all about it. Celine, can you hear me now? Mute. We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Scott, for that introduction. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. So yes, uh, as you said, I'll be talking about floral margins and and the benefit, uh, how they can benefit uh, 
strawberry crops and potentially also other soft fruit crops. So uh, this is part of project SF174. Uh, this is a two year objective and this is the first year of, of this objective. So uh, we first aimed to uh, record vegetation cover establishment. Uh, we have seven sites and six of those seven sites needed to, uh, to be sown. So we didn't have a, a floral margin available at those sites. Uh, we had one site that had previous, previously had been established and we aimed to look at natural enemies and also identify any soft fruit pest species that could be living in those floral margins. So our site uh, where we did the assessments this year is the wet center at Naya BMR. And it's a good start uh, for this project because it has replicated blocks. So in each block we have four different treatments, so four different uh, floral resources. Uh, we have a plot that is exclusively sunpoint, we have another plot that is exclusively chicory, and then we have a bespoke uh, flower mix, uh, which we called EM1, and you can see the wildflower species uh, in the slide. We also added some non-competitive grasses to that, so uh, to improve the coverage. Uh, for control, the control was treated exactly as the other plots, so we prepared the soil, the soil for the sowing, we did the same for the control, but then left it completely bare and left it to basically any seed that would land on it could uh, germinate. Uh, all plots are treated the same equally, so they have, uh, we have been cutting them once a year after they flower. So for the assessment, what we did this year was monthly assessments from May to August. Uh, and in each assessment, we did sweep netting sampling. And we looked at all pests and beneficials uh, caught in the sweep net. We also looked at floral units, so uh, looked at flower density in each plot at each time of assessment. And we also collected flowers to look at the presence of thrips species. We usually do that uh, by alcohol extraction. Uh, we, at one of the occasions, we also used uh, the extraction device, which is the, the device you see in the pictures, and uh, that was developed in a previous uh, HDB uh, project. Uh, we used this device successfully in strawberry plant uh, flowers, um, but we wanted to see if with the more com uh, complex uh, structure of flower, we could get also the same results we get in in uh, strawberry flowers. Um, this data is not in this presentation, but will be later in the report. So if we start by the sweep netting data, I, there's a lot going on in this graphic, but I'll help you break it down. So first, the first thing to say is that uh, most of the activity in the floral resources happens in May and June. So you can see that uh, there is much more diversity and higher numbers of that diversity. Uh, the black and green bars are herbivores and the more colorful uh, predator are predators and pollinators. So you see there's more diversity of predators and pollinators than actually herbivores that could be feeding on plants and could potentially be a uh, pest. So if we start with the predators and pollinators, um, mainly you can see you have uh, bright yellow, which is endochoroids, a good, uh, a good predator. You also have some pink there, which is a ladybirds, another good uh, predator. Uh, you, you, can, you can also see you have some predatory uh, spiders, uh, so all good predators. If we focus on the EM1, we can see that pointing with the yellow arrows and comparing to the control with green arrows, uh, you have higher numbers of predators and pollinators. So EM1 mix is the one that is doing better uh, when compared uh, with the control, which is completely unsown. 
Uh, moving on to herbivores, so uh, we the main two herbivores that we found were, were aphids and capsids. So aphids are uh, represented in green and capsids in black. Uh, aphids, uh, the aphids we found were non-strawberry pest aphids. Uh, most of them were pea aphids, and and uh, they they didn't pose uh, an immediate threat for the crop. You might wonder why why should we have aphids? So if if it's not a pest, it could still be a food source for your predators. So also good to have them around when your crop doesn't have a high pressure of pests. They could still serve as as food source for your natural enemies. So again, let's focusing on EM1 mix. Uh, it has less of the capsids and aphids. So again, uh, a habitat, it doesn't provide enough habitat for, for uh, pests when you compare with it, when you compare it with control. So for the capsids uh, that I didn't mention earlier, because the identification of capsids uh, posed a, a little more work and had, had to be done separately. So we decided that we would collect all the capsids, identify the adults, and we also had uh, quite a number of nymphs in there. So we wanted to make sure that we were identifying to the right species. So we collected the nymphs and reared them until adults so we could ID them uh, with, with some uh, precision. So what we found was that most of the capsids were common green capsids and control in some form was the ones with higher numbers of it. Uh, again, EM1 seemed to have much less capsids than, that, than the control, so a better option uh, than leaving just uh, your plots on zone. Another capsid that we found was European tarnished plant bug. It was in ver very low uh, numbers and was uh, quite similar throughout uh, the four treatments. We also found potato capsid and also uh, not very high numbers and, and a bit less in chicory, but similar in the other plots. So another assessment was the floral unit uh, count. And this gives you a bit more information about how long your uh, floral resource goes on for and, and, and the timing of it. So you can see clearly uh, that some point uh, is the red bar and that it has uh, much more, it has a higher density of floral units in May. It started quite early, it was the first plot to start flowering. It quickly decreased in June and was almost non-existent in July. You have chicory in, uh, in blue, uh, they start, it started flowering in June, so it wasn't flowering in May, and slowly decreased until August. So those two plots are plots that are uh, very homogeneous. They are uh, mainly chicory and mainly sunfoin. There's not much other plant species growing in there, so they're, they're, they're very uh, homogeneous, uh, which contrasts with the control and the M1 mix, which are a multi-species uh, plot. So do, said, that said, they do vary the same way. So, they had uh, a similar number of, of flowers in May, then they decreased a little bit in June, uh, then uh, a little bit more, they increased in July and went on to August. So that's why we have that table there to show you which were the main species of plants uh, at the time of each assessment. The species highlighted in green are the ones we saw, so we chose that in June and July we had a good coverage of our EM1 mix uh, in, in the, those plots. So further, uh, for further assessments, we are currently uh, assessing the thrips. Uh, we have gone through uh, May and June data, but still have to go through July and August. We did, uh, we did found uh, some of the species in the control to have high number of thrips, but until we have the whole data, we cannot conclude or recommend uh, anything. Uh, the other set of data that we're looking at is the vegetation cover. 
that will allow us to say if the species have established well or if some of the species have failed uh, to, to establish. Another uh, assessment done under another project, which is the Interact Bespoke project, uh, is the pollinator surveys. So we did two pollinator surveys, one in May, one in September. Uh, of course, in May, you can see there's, uh, much, more, uh, there's much more diversity. And uh, the sun fine plots in red again, you can see mainly bumblebees, solitary bees and honeybees. Uh, with the control and the EM1 mix, you can see there's a, a, a diversity of other uh, species visiting. And uh, for the EM1 mix, uh, there, are, there are higher numbers than in the control. So again, it's attracting more pollinators. In September, we noticed that control and uh, some species in the mix was still flowering. So we decided to do an assessment to see what was going on there. We had a few pollinators, not as much as in May, of course, uh, mainly because of flower availability. Uh, but we had some honeybees and overflies, uh, bumblebees visiting, so still some, some activity in September there. So to conclude, uh, uh, this data is not stati statistically analyzed, but there is strong indication that uh, May and June is when you have more activity in your flower resources. Uh, there are high predators numbers. Uh, on the EM1 mix when compared to control. You have also fewer common green capsules in those uh, mix in that, those plots uh, when compared to control. Uh, control and EMR, uh, EM1 mix, sorry, uh, are the longest flowering plots, so uh, covering uh, more, more of the season. And we are currently going through the thrift sample of July and August and expecting to have some uh, good results once we finish those assessments. For next year, so we, we expect to be uh, collecting samples from the other six sites that we established this year, having a more robust data and uh, to, take, to, do, to get some recommendations. We're doing the same assessment as this year, so pests, including the thrips, beneficials, and vegetation cover. Also, the flower counts uh, will be done, so uh, continuing the same work as this year. We also uh, want to monitor the crop as well, so we want to see if we can find a relation between what's in the floral resources and what's in the crop. To see if, if there are some influence there. Uh, thank you for listening, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them down. Thank you so much, Celine. That's really really uh, helpful. Um, I should have mentioned earlier that uh, the work, a lot of this work, has in the past has been done under Project SF156, which is Strawberry Pest uh, Integrated Pest Management in Strawberry. In 2020, a, a new project began, SF174, uh, and, and much of what you're hearing about now from Celine and what you'll hear about shortly from Adam uh, and Peter, it, it will be under the, the auspices of this new project. Um, Celine, we, yes, we do have some questions for you. Can, somebody's asked, can you just remind us what was in the control plot? Was it just grass or was it bare earth? It was bare ground, yes, bare, uh, bare earth. It's the bare so ground. We there was no, we there was no grass at the start. No, 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 we didn't put anything, we just, so when we prepared the plots, we took the first layer of soil from all the plots, so there was nothing. We took all the grasses, everything that was there, uh, and then the control was just left completely bare and left to seed anything okay. that would fall on it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Another question, uh, which beneficials were actually increased in the crop as a result? Uh, of, of this. Do you, did you measure this, that at all? Yes. Well, this year we haven't looked at the crop uh, yet. So that's something we expect to do next year next and year. have some, some better data uh, that can see a relationship between the floral uh, resource and the crop. Okay. And, and a related question was, were there any thrips or was there any thrips damage within the, the um, 
the adjoining crop. But again, that's presumably something you'll look at next year, is it? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. OK, uh, another question is um, capsids. I, I noticed that the overall numbers of capsids in July and August seem to diminish, seem to decline in number. It, it was that, do you think that was because there were less flowers for them to, to, to feed on? Or was it that they had moved into the crop uh, or were there other reasons or, or any, any thoughts on that? Uh, we, we think that it's because uh, flower availability uh because uh the crop we didn't monitor the crop but uh the wet center crop is is uh, is quite well managed and okay. and from what from what we know we didn't they didn't have any capsid problem so so we we would attribute that to the diminishing uh flower density of yep. the plots Okay, I think this is all very relevant for next year's work because a lot of growers are, are always very nervous uh, about the potential for increasing the numbers of insect pests, particularly like capsids and thrips in, in a strawberry crop. So I'm sure you're all aware of that, uh, but uh, I think yeah. we just make that point again and that's crucial that we, we investigate that further next year. Um, yes. There don't appear to be any other. Oh no, we. Uh, sorry, I have got a comment here, and actually, this is from your colleague Michelle. Michelle's just commented that we did keep an eye on the wet centre and monitored for capsids in the crop. There was no noticeable thrips or capsid damage in the wet centre in 2020. So, thank you, Michelle. Michelle has aided you there with that uh, response. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Um, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Celine, so much for sharing that information with you, and we'll look forward to finding out the results next year. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, sticking with uh, strawberry pests, uh, we move on to capsids. Um, well, I think you would probably all agree that over the years, uh, with the development of new IPM techniques and technology to control a whole range of insect pests in strawberry crops, we've, we've, we've made huge progress over the last 20 years. But the one pest that continues to cause us a major problem is capsid. Uh, we've had to continually reach for the uh, broad spectrum products, uh, con control products to control this pest. And we're continually looking for a novel way of controlling and managing capsids. Well, um, we've got some really, really exciting news and I'm really excited about this. I'm building Adam up here. Um, he's, he's got some useful and in interesting information for us. So Adam, tell us what you've been finding with uh, this novel approach to push-pull control of capsids. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, um, as Scott mentioned, um, today I'm going to be talking about a novel push-pull approach that um, we've developed um, with the help of the AHDB and the Natural Resources Institute um, to control pest capsids in soft fruit crops. So first of all, I'm going to give an overview of the push-pull approach. Um, it involves combining stimuli to push the pest out of the crop and simultaneously pull them towards a trap outside the crop where they can be concentrated and eliminated. Generally, the components of the push-pull technique are non-toxic, um, and because of that, they can be integrated with other control methods, preferably those that are biological, such as natural enemies. So the primary target for our push-pull approach is the European tarnished plant bug, Ligus regulopinis. Um, this pest um, is considered the most common cause of fruit malformation in late season strawberries. One pest per 40 plants is enough to cause economic damage. Um, and if the crop goes unsprayed, over 50% of the crop can be downgraded. So traditionally, um, push-pull um, involves the use of um, intercropping. Um, but with our technique, we've gone for a synthetic approach um, whereby we're using synthetic versions of semiochemicals that the capsids use to communicate with each other and locate a host plant. So first of all, I'm going to start by um, explaining how the synthetic capsid pull um, was developed. Um, work has focused on the Ligus regula penis sex pheromone released by the females. The components of the pheromone were identified and formulated into a pipette dispenser. Um, and then this was deployed in green cross vein funnel trap in the field. Um, results of this study caught significantly more male regula penis than unbaited traps. Um, in subsequent research, 
the plant volatile phenyl acetaldehyde has been studied. Um, phenyl acetaldehyde is believed to attract capsids to the host. Um, and when this was field tested in traps, traps with the phenyl acetaldehyde caught significantly more male and female regular penis than unbaited traps. So moving on to development of the synthetic capsid push, work here is focused on hexyl butyrate. Hexyl butyrate is released by capsids in high levels when they're agitated. And so it's been hypothesized as an alarm pheromone. To test hexyl butyrate, um, an experiment was done um, in the field using five replicate blocks. Each block was divided into four plots, shown in the diagram on the left. Plot one is a green trap with female sex pheromone in only, it's a kind of control. Plot two is green trap with female sex pheromone and an HB dispenser. Plot three is green trap with female sex pheromone, surrounded by a hexagon of six HB dispensers spaced one metre away. And plot four is the same as plot three, except HB dispensers were five metres away. To measure um, the effectiveness of HB as a potential push, male capsids were counted in the green cross vein trap during a 14 day period. And the graph in the bottom right uh, shows the results of this. On the left is the um, catch of males um, in, with, in the trap with the pheromone only. And what we found is in traps where there was HB, um, there were significantly fewer male capsids caught than the pheromone only. This was reduced by 99% um, when the trap had HB or if HB was one metre away and 44% when the HB was five metres away, indicating that the ideal spacing for this type of HB dispenser is between one and five metres. So um, moving on, in 2017, field tests were done in conventional strawberry crops using four replicate blocks. Um, in the diagram um, represents a block divided into four plots. Plot one is a control with no push-pull treatment. Plot two is a push-only treatment, um, which contains eight rows of eight HB repellent sachets stapled to strawberry grow bags at two metre intervals. Plot three is a pull-only treatment with a perimeter of 12 green bucket traps containing the ligus, sex pheromone and phenyl acetaldehyde spaced at eight metre intervals. And plot four is a combination of push-pull components. To assess the effectiveness of the different push-pull components in comparison to the control, tap samples were done in all plots counting the number of capsids. Um, trap counts of capsids in perimeter traps around the pull-only plot and push-pull-only plot um, were compared, um, and fruit damage assessments were also done in all plots. So these graphs, first of all, um, show the results of the capsid counts in the crops. Um, and what we found um, is in plots that had a push, there were fewer capsids um, than plots without a push. Um, and this was the case for both the European tarnished plant bug, Ligus pudipennis, and the common green capsid, Ligocorus pabulinus, both nymphs and adults. Um, moving on to the fruit damage results, um, this graph shows the mean percent of strawberry with no capsid damage. What we found here is where there was a treatment there were more fruit with zero capsid damage compared to the control. And this was significantly so where there was a push-pull treatment. So in 2019, uh, we continued development of this push-pull system. This time we wanted to see if we could enhance the push by doubling the level of HB. Um, to do this, a trial was done in organic strawberry using three replicate blocks. Um, each block was divided into four plots, as shown in the diagram. Plot one was a control with no push-pull. Plot two is a push-pull. I'm using the standard method in 2017. Plot three was a push-pull with um, double the number of HB repellent sachets in the push stapled to grow bags at one metre intervals. And plot four was um, a push with 
uh, push ball with double release rate HB repellent sachets stapled to grow bags at two meter intervals. Um, and the same assessments were done as in 2017. So these graphs uh, show the results. And the top ones are the captured counts in the crops. What we found here um, is where there was a push pull treatment, there were significantly fewer capsids in the crops compared to the control without any treatment. Um, and that was the case for nymphs and adults, um, which were predominantly Lygus, Regula penis. Um, then in the bottom left is the mean percent of strawberry fruit with no capsid damage. Um, and in agreement with the above findings, we found where there was a push pull, there was significantly more fruit with zero capsid damage compared to the control. So this year we've been looking at trialing, well, we've trialed the capsid push um, in cane fruits. A trial was set up in conventional raspberry using six replicate blocks. Each block was divided into the three plots shown in the diagram on the left. Plot one is a control with no push. Plot two is a push only plot um, with HB repellent sachets spaced at two meter intervals in six rows um, of eight sachets and one meter height. And plot three was the same, except that repellent sachets were at staggered heights to see if that has effect on capsid numbers in the crop and fruit damage. So here are the preliminary findings. Um, I should say no stats have been done on this yet. Um, this graph shows the mean number of capsids per 100 laterals. Um, the main capsid found was Ligochorus papulinus. The white bars are capsid nymphs and the grey bars are pabulinus adults. Um, we ran a pre-assessment this trial um, before repellents were deployed. Um, and then we did post-assessments um, when the repellent had been deployed. Um, and in pre-assessments, numbers of capsids were similar between plots. Um, and then in post-assessments, capsid nymphs were lower where there was HB um, in the crop compared to the control. Um, but there's no clear effect here on pabulinus adults. Um, although, as I said, we need to have a look at the individual assessments and do stats on it. Um, moving on to the fruit damage. Um, this uh, graph, it shows percent of fruit sampled in each damage score category marked with different shading. Um, the white parts of the bars um, are the fruit with zero capsid damage. Um, and what we found in the post assessments um, is where there was HB, there was more fruit with zero capsid damage compared to the control. So to conclude, um, so far we've demonstrated a synthetic push pull system to control pest capsids in commercial strawberry, and this can work in both conventional and organic crops. Um, it's shown to significantly re re reduce regular penis and pabulinus in the crop and respective damage to fruit. Um, benefits of this push ball system did not, um, were not significantly enhanced by doubling the level of HB in the push. Um, so we could further investigate um, reducing it or spacing HB further apart. Um, and these synthetic semi-chemicals used in this trial were effective for at least a month, um, which was the point at which we replaced them. Moving on to raspberry, um, the data is awaiting statistical analysis. Um, but what we found is fewer capsid nymphs and more undamaged fruit where HB was applied. Um, there was no clear effect on pabulinus yet, um, but we have data elsewhere um, during a trial around the wet centre this year using blue sticky pheromone traps. Um, which showed when HB um, was attached to the traps alongside the pheromone, uh, fewer pabulinus adults were caught. Thank you. Questions, please. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Uh, one or two comments coming in from people just saying that they're very impressed by these results, very exciting. Um, I, I should just say that obviously the, the, the obvious question is where do we go from here with all of this? 
Um, AHDB is working with a number of parties, including scientists at NIIBMR, to investigate ways that we might make this uh, into a commercial reality. So we can't say any more at this stage, but um, we, we are obviously uh, investigating this further because of the, the exciting nature of the results. Um, question really for you, Adam, for next year, what are, what are the plans or are, are there any plans in place as to what you might like to investigate further next year? So I think at the moment, um, we're working with the AHDB and CRD um, to develop this further along with a co commercial partner um, to optimise um, the control method to make sure that it's um, applied as effectively as possible. So we're looking to do commercial trials in 2021. Um, okay. Yeah. That's good. Another question here. Any negative impact of hexalbutyrate on predatory bugs? Is there a, have we got any knowledge um, of that? So we're also um, monitoring um, other arthropods um, in and around the crop. Um, and we found no um, significant impact um, in treatment plots compared to control in terms of um, beneficials. Um, also, um, in 2019, when we tested the different push-pull um, treatments um, in the perimeter traps, we didn't see a difference in the um, numbers of um, of arthropods caught in them, um, the non-capsid species were very low in those traps. Uh, okay, um, you may have answered this question, but I'll pose it one one other time. How specific are the pheromones if they work for these two capsids? Is there risk of bycatch of other species? So um, the Ligus sex pheromone, um, um, which was tested in the green traps when in development of the pool. Um, it does also catch other pest capsids. Um, so, for example, it does work with Ligocorus pabulinus. Um, but in terms of um, other non-target species, um, as I just mentioned, we um, got low catches of non-target species in the trap. So it's um, mostly specific for the pest capsids. OK, thank you. I've just I'll read out another comment that Michelle sent in, Michelle Fountain, who's been leading this project. Uh, Michelle says we want to make it as econo economically viable as possible. Uh, in other words, what is the maximum distance between the dis HB dispensers that we can get away with? Does it work on larger commercial scales? Maybe we would need fewer dispensers and crops with less capsid pressure. So um, there's obviously quite a lot of discussion going on between, be within and amongst the scientists as to what we need to do next. And uh, my, my colleague Katia Maurer and, uh, and Rachel McGauley are, are working with the scientists on that. So that'll be discussed and uh, agreed over the winter months for, for, for next year, I hope. Um, OK, I think the, we are pretty much at the end of that. Thank you so much, Adam. Ad, Adam, I should say we're working Adam hard today because he's coming back to talk to us about spotted wind drosophila. So uh, thank you, Adam, for your first instalment. Uh, and we'll move on now. Um, one more talk before we move on to our SWD special section. Um, and this time, um, it wouldn't be right to have one of these sessions without talking about thrips, would it? Um, light capsids continue to be a major problem for uh, strawberry growers. And uh, it, it, we, we've done a huge amount of research in recent years. Um, the work within SF156, which was our strawberry pest IPM project, uh, has, has, has provided some very good results in recent times. Uh, but we're continuing that work as part of SF174. And we've got Peter Seymour from ADAS, uh, a colleague of Alicia Bartel, who we heard from earlier. Uh, Peter's been doing a lot of work uh, for us at ADAS on this, and he's going to talk a little bit more about his findings from 2020. Peter. Thank you, Scott. OK, um, so just moving that. OK, so yeah, thank you, Scott. Uh, my name's Pete Seymour. I'm a consultant with ADAS Horticulture and the, the entire team that have been working on this project together. As Scott mentioned earlier, we're here to talk to you this afternoon about part one SF174, the IPM of soft fruit pests. Now, we're looking at control of thrip species other than Western flower thrips that are damaging to strawberry crops. Now, the project uh, this year was involving the testing of a new push-pull strategy for thrip species, which is in its first year. Now, the aim of this was to develop a non-pesticide option for the control of Western flower thrip species of, um, of thrips, 
Now, the reason why we're trying this is Western flower thrips can largely be controlled, uh, especially with applications of Nisus cucumeris and aureus. Now, non-Western flower thrip species are often migrating into the crops as adults and don't seem to be affected by Nisus cucumeris as far as we can tell. Now, depending on the year, the migrations and the resulting damage to the crop that can be seen from the temp uh, from these thrip species um, can be often seen before temperatures are suitable enough to get aureus well established. Now, the overarching idea of this is to give um, a sort of an alternative framework to allow growers to set up a method of interception to stop thrips from entering the crops and getting diverted to traps. Now, the species we're focusing on are those that don't really stay in the crops all year round, um, unlike Western flower thrips, and also don't seem to be breeding in the crops. So catching them as they're coming in could be very beneficial. Now, the idea of this system, it could be used to cover an entire grower's area, or it might even just be more localized to a specific problem area that a grower might have. If they're having a specific patch where they're having thrips problems every year, then that might be a sort of potential area that they could then use to apply this. Now, a lot of effort was made to make sure that we um, ensured that the sites had the correct species, which was critical. So we excluded sites where we were finding a lot of Western flower thrips. We were also looking for the correct species mix early in the season. Now, we sampled a lot of grower sites initially, but then we selected two based on a strong presence of rose thrips, thrips fuscopenis, as well as other non-Western flower thrip species. Now, we had our treatment tunnels, each containing four plots around five meters long, um, and these were all, each sort of replica was contained within one tunnel. Now, because we're working with semi-chemicals, repellents and lures, we wanted to make sure that we had a strong buffer area in between each of the plots. Um, and so we had a 10 meter gap in between each of the treatment plots. And we also had an entire empty tunnel um, or just a conventionally managed um, tunnel in between each of the treatment tunnels to make sure that we were getting less of the mixing or none of the mixing effect between these semi-chemicals. Now, we also made sure to select the tunnels that were close to hedgerows, such as rope with rose and brambles and things like that, which are potentially very suitable areas for the migrating thrips uh, that could be coming into the crop itself. And we also selected these with the advice from the agronomists of um, the sites uh, that we were visiting uh, to use their um, sort of crop and uh, local experience that they had. Now, we obviously had our two sites selected. Now, we had um, very high replication um, of treatments um, just to make sure that the variation that you can often see with thrips numbers um, was as standardized as we possibly could. We had three assessments at each site, one at the initial setup, then two more um, following each distance by about two weeks um, with the aim to cover the peak of rose thrips that we've seen in the previous project, SF156. Um, then we had the assessments focusing on two separate parts. Now we wanted to make sure that we were capturing the activity that was going on in the flowers, um, to, because at the end of the day, we want to try and lower the number of thrips that are entering the flowers. It doesn't matter how many we catch on the traps, as long as we're reducing the number in the flowers. Um, and then we were also wanting to refer to the traps. Um, so we were taking numbers and species of thrips, adults from the sticky traps on each plot. Um, we also very crucially wanted to make sure we were looking at the number of beneficials that we were seeing in the flowers and also on the traps to make sure that um, we weren't having a negative effect on the, um, the populations that we were seeing. We don't want to instigate a, a treatment plan that's actually having a negative impact and a number of those questions have been along those lines today already. Now this brings us to the actual mechanisms of push-pull. Now, we had four separate treatments separated into testing the push on its own, the pull on its own, and then the push and pull combined. Now, we also had the grower IPM uh, as a control itself. So the idea is that this system would be overlaid over standard grower programs rather than just replacing it outright. It's a sort of separate tool. Now, the push element to this um, trial is a product known as Magipal. Now, it's specifically an attractant in of itself, but it's marketed um, as an attractant for beneficials. But there is also data from the, the host company that there is a push element for non-beneficials and pests, which does include thrips. Um, now, it's available from Russell IPM, and we had it mounted on a cane above the crop with the idea of it pushing the thrips directly away from the, the tabletops. Now, we also then used for the pull element, we used lurum. 
Now, it's a generalized lure. Um, it's not sex pheromone based like many other thrips uh, lures. Um, and work is heavily focused on a, a lot of different thrip species that it covers. Now, it's commercially available from copper at the moment already. Um, and this was stuck on blue sticky traps underneath the tabletops with the idea of pulling the thrips away from the crop and down to be then stuck and remove them from the crop. Um, now, we um, sorry, we used individual traps so that we could then take them back to the lab because obviously we needed to constantly replace them um, every two weeks. Now, we used a lot of them to try and simulate that visual attraction. Uh, the visual attraction is actually quite critical to making the most effective pull possible. Now, although we used individual traps, we are envisioning that roller traps could be used in most grower settings. Now, as I said, we both of those products that we were using are both commercially available, and we use them at the commercially recommended rates by the and spacings from those two companies. Now, our fourth treatment was a combination of the two, so it was the push and the pull. So it had the magic pile above the crop, and it had the lure with on the sticky traps combined underneath the tabletops. Now, very frustratingly, uh, and despite the best efforts with the site selection that we did early in the season, we spent a lot of time confirming the species mix that we were seeing, but the actual numbers we saw during the actual um, seasonal peak were very low uh, um, in the grower IPM plots, as well as the treated plots on the three dates at each site. Site one having less, with an average of less than one thrips per flower, and site two having a promising nine thrips at the setup date, but then only not. 0.4 and 1.5 on the following dates. Unfortunately, it means we probably won't be able to determine a statistically significant level of difference between our treatments because of this low number in the untreated. Um, the, thrip such, the thrip species from the actual assessments are still being confirmed. We did see some bronzing on the initial stages with the, um, within the fruit, um, but then that um, decreased over time as the numbers decreased, which followed that kind of numbers pattern that we saw. Now, moving on to the traps and um, what we caught on those. Now, this is just a quick summary of what we were looking at when we were examining the traps. So we looked at the thrips numbers um, on the upper and lower side of the traps, as well as capsids, just as a sort of secondary uh, positive effect to see if they were having any effect on those. Um, and also, as previously mentioned, we were uh, very keen to be looking at beneficials to see what we were catching on those traps as well to make sure that um, we weren't catching more beneficials than we should have been. Now, the, on the left-hand side of the uh, picture is a example of a trap. All of those little circles are actually thrips caught on those traps. The larger red circles um, are where some of the beneficials were caught. Now, when we actually dive into the results of those traps, we're just looking at the pull versus the push and the pull, so treatment three and treatment four. Now, the reason for this is there wasn't any traps in the untreated control or the uh, push element, as that would have added a visual attraction element to those plots. Now, the results here are from the second site where the no those numbers were a bit higher, um, and so is a much better comparison to show you what was going on. Um, now, if we look at the actual thrips numbers, um, you can see at the first uh, assessment date on the 24th of the 6th, we're sort of averaging 47.4 and 48.2. And uh, the second, uh, the third and final assessment for that day, uh, for that site, we were then averaging uh, 72 and around 79 thrips per trap. Now, it doesn't look like there's any particular uh, difference in between the pull and the push and the pull separately. It does need analysing, but it's not looking like, especially from this data, that that's the case. Um, but what we're very happy with is that we were catching low numbers of predatory thrips um, in both the pull and the push and pull. Um, and low numbers of beneficials on both of the dates. Also very happy that we weren't catching increased numbers of beneficials in the push and the pull, especially as the Magipal aspect has um, that pull aspect for beneficials. So we haven't pulled them to our plot area to then catch them immediately onto the traps, which is very important. Um, now, obviously, this was in it, its first year. Um, so going into the new year, um, and the next year's work, we're looking at improving that visual attraction using roller traps um, to further increase that, uh, that visual attraction. Um, we're also looking at setting the trial up earlier in the season um, so we can get uh, activity covering the crop for as long as possible and having it in place from the, the, before the start of the thrips activity. 
We also have the ability to be able to tweak the plot size and the layout just to enhance that attraction and repellence. Now, if there are any growers or agronomists here that have a rose thrips problem that might make for a suitable place, uh, that might make for a suitable site going into the new year, then please do get in contact. We are always on the lookout um, to scout around in the, at the start of the year, and then that further allows us to select the best site possible. Now, I'd like to thank ASDB Horticulture for funding the work. Um, a massive thank you to our two host grow, grower sites. They were fantastic, um, and by especially by allowing us access to their sites in a very difficult year. Um, and they were very quick to respond to any questions and also were happy sending um, samples in uh, for us to test. Now, I also really want to thank the ADAS team who worked again through quite a difficult year to get all of this work done, um, even though there is still a little bit more to do. Um, and also to the advisors and growers, we did contact a huge number of people trying to scout out for possible locations. Um, so thank you for those who got involved with that. Um, and also to Copper and Russell IPM for supplying the traps, Lurum and Magipal, which has allowed this trial to take place. So I've now got some time for any questions. Um, so if you'd like to ask any, then please go ahead. I'll answer as many as I can. Um, those that I can't, or if there's something you think on later, then please do get in contact via email and we'll be more than happy to answer as much as we can. Thank you. Peter, thank you. Uh, thank you for such a succinct summary of that work. Um, and I, I concur. I just add to what Peter said. We, we have been incredibly, um, we are incredibly grateful and we've been incredibly lucky to have so many willing commercial growers who get involved with these sorts of trials. Uh, without them, we couldn't do the work. And equally, the help that we get from suppliers, agrochemical companies, biocontrol companies is just wonderful. It really is a, it's wonderful how the whole industry pulls together to try and find solutions to uh, ongoing problems. A um, couple of questions, Peter. Um, first of all, I'm a bit confused about Magipal, um, about it, it, its use as a lure, but but in this case, it uses as a repellent. Well, can, can you explain more or do you understand this better than I do? Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it comes across like that, but I wanted to draw attention to that because that is how it's marketed. Uh, it is marketed more primarily as a, a pull element, but for beneficials such as parasitoids and a number of others, and um, drawing those to an area to then, um, hopefully consume the pests that are present in the cropping. However, we've been um, closely working with uh, Russell IPM and they have got data that it also has a push element um, to non-beneficials, things like pests, uh, depending on the way that they feed. Um, there is more information in the literature review that um, Jude and myself wrote for the AHDB because um, we did go into a, a little bit on the, the topic uh, and it's one of the elements that then, then led to the creation of this project, if there are any more sort of specific questions and things like that. Okay, thank you. I, I think it's also important to point out that the Magipal is not an authorised crop protection product. So I think um, we should make that clear. I mean, we've been using that within these trials. Um, but if anybody's interested in that, it is not a crop protection product and not authorised as such. Um, some other questions. Um, do we think the thrips are breeding in the crop? Um, it's certainly a, a contentious topic, but it depends on the species. Now, work we did within SF156, we were looking at the larvae that were in the crop, um, and we were finding larvae of uh, the onion thrips, um, thrips tobacco or the rubus thrips, but only in small numbers, uh, which in my opinion wasn't really going to be sustaining the population that we were seeing. Um, and of course, we on some of the sites where Western flower thrips were present, we were also seeing Western flower thrips. Now, we never actually found um, Sleen and Adam were also doing uh, larval IDs during that project. Um, and between us, we never saw any larvae of thrips fusca penis, the rose thrips, which is implying more and more, although we've never managed to confirm that it's definitely not breeding in the crop. Um, it's looking more and more like, especially with the population numbers that we see in a, a burst, that we are seeing um, that they are migrating in. Um, we haven't seen any examples of them breeding within the crop specifically, um, which is why we need to sort of focus more on those sort of approaches that maybe block them from coming in. Okay, thank you. That, that's, that's, hopefully that's cleared that up for the questioner. Uh, we know a lot about Western flower thrips. Are, are we planning on doing any more work on the biology of some of the other thrips? Is that something that might come into 
future work we do, or is that going to be discussed over the winter months with the uh, the, the consortium? Uh, I mean, that is certainly a question for the consortium as a whole and the steering group. Um, if people, if growers and agronomists are after more information on the biology, then that is something we can definitely look at. Um, we were responding to feedback where uh, there was more of a desire for a sort of system for trying to work and deal with these thrips. Um, now that obviously growers can use sprays to get rid of a number of these species, there isn't resistance in the sort of rose thrips as far as we know at the moment. Um, but obviously it's limited on how much we can actually apply. Um, and it takes up valuable options for dealing with other pests, which is why this project was uh, sort of came about. But if biology and that sort of information is very useful for um, steering decision making within uh, for growers, then that's absolutely a direction we can take again if people would like that. OK, that's good. Well, perhaps that's something the consortium can consider uh, over the winter months in preparation for further work in uh, on SF174 next year. Um, I think that's we've exhausted the questions. Peter, thank you so much for your time in preparing today's presentation. Uh, and if I do get any more questions, I will forward them to you. Absolutely. Thank you Thanks, for Thank you, everybody. So um, that concludes all the other work um, on insect pests and diseases. Um, we are now moving on to our final little session on spotted wing grossophila, which I all often group together at the end of the day. Um, it's relevant, of course, to not only strawberry growers, but raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, and of course, for tree fruit growers, for cherries and, and plums and, and apricots and so on as well. Um, We've been doing a huge amount of work on spotted wing drosophila ever since 2012, since it first uh, arrived in the UK. Uh, and that uh, the, the current project, SF17, uh, SF stroke TF174, a5, sorry, 175A is, uh, com is coming to an end, um, but the work is continuing and we want to carry on <coughs> with this research. Um, so we're going to talk about two aspects of that work now, but before we do so, we've got to talk about some of the PhD research that's been undertaken uh, by Christina Conroy, who hopefully is on your screen by now. Good afternoon, Christina. Now, Christina has talked to us on several occasions before. She's doing some fantastic work uh, with, uh, as, as part of her PhD with Greenwich, uh, University of Greenwich and NIAB EMR. And Christina is going to update us on her latest work in terms of uh, pushing towards a new P IPM strategy and the use of repellents. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Scott. So good afternoon, everybody. As Scott said already, I'm Christina Conroy, and I've just started my fourth year of the CTP PhD. And due to the time constraints which I've got today, I'm going to be talking to you primarily about the repellent section of my PhD. So, uh, pushing towards a new IPM strategy, Drosophila Suzuki, the search for effective repellents. So as always, I'm going to start off by thanking my project funders. So to the BBSRC and the AHDB, and then of course the CTP for providing additional funding and training opportunities and as well as undertaking an internship with Berry Gardens earlier on in the year, just before the lockdown began in February, which was incredibly beneficial to myself. I'm gonna start off by talking about the, the problem of SWG just very briefly, as I'm sure many of you are already aware of the situation that's going on. I'm then gonna go on to the aims of my work talk you through the research which I've undertaken and especially the most recent results that I've got. And then I'm quickly just going to come back around again and discuss the future research which can be taken. So Drosophila Suzuki, it is the major European horticultural pest. And the reason for this is that it has this highly serrated ovipositor which can be seen circled in the female picture at the bottom right hand side of the screen. This um, allows it to cut into ripe and ripening fruit, unlike other UK Drosophila species, which can only lay their eggs in rotting fruit. And then fruit degradation is caused by a larval feeding inside the fruits, causing fruit to collapse, and secondary infections brought in by the oviposition hole. One of the things I think makes my project so interesting is the fact that there's these two morphal varieties of the same species. So there's a summer morph and there's a winter morph. Now, the summer morph transitions into the winter morph in response to reduced temperature and reduced light. 
The winter morph is significantly larger, darker, and has delayed ovary development. But interestingly, it's the winter morph which is actually coming into the crop at the beginning of the growing season. But really, my question is, is that these two morphs inhabit different ecological niches. So this winter morph is found in the woodland habitats and the summer morph primarily within the crop. So will they respond to the same chemicals in the same way or will there be actually behavioral differences? So the overall aim of my project is to develop an integrated push-pull control strategy for the year-round management of Drosophila suzuki, which is less reliant on pesticides. So the idea here is to use repellents to push the insect from the crop and attractants to pull them into a trap where they'll die. Now, there's already multiple commercially available products on the market for attractants. However, in comparison repellents, very little research has been undertaken on them with few products available on the market. This combined with the fact that very little research generally has been undertaken on the winter moor makes for some potentially very exciting work. So what I was interested really here was doing is taking the re potential repellents right the way through from the laboratory and then into sort of more the semi-field. That way at all stages we can sort of understand the pest behaviour, what they're doing and why they're doing it. So the aim here was to identify chemicals acting as repellents for D. Suzuki summer and winter morphs. So I started off by doing some electron telegram work. Now, for those of you who aren't particularly um, familiar with EAGs, basically a glass electrode is inserted into the eye of live Drosophila suzuki, and a secondary glass electrode is inserted onto the internal segment. An odor is passed over the antenna, and then the voltage change across the antenna is measured. But basically, this all comes down to, can the insect detect the chemical? Yes or no? Now, all 14 chemicals were actually detected by both the summer and the winter more. But the graph that I've actually gotten here to show you is three of the chemicals were significantly different between the summer moth and the winter moth. Now, this is just beginning to really build up that picture that potentially there are some olfactory differences, maybe physiological differences between these two moths. But of course, just because an insect is able to have an electron telegraphic response, doesn't necessarily equate to a behavioral response. So this moves on very nicely to my laboratory work. So these were two choice bioassays. These were one liter plastic cups uh, with two gated traps inside them. Now I've blown up the gated trap for you to get a better view of this. The gated trap had an attractive substance in the bottom, this being uh, raspberry juice um, and yeast. And then a piece of filter paper held in place by an insect pin. Now, a, a repellent or a control could be added to this filter paper, and each of these little bioassays were made up of one control and, as I'm sure you'd assume, one repellent. The Drosophila Suzuki were then released into these arenas and then left for 24 hours, and then I would record the location of the Drosophila Suzuki. Now, I should comment at this point that I did this for the 14 different chemicals at three chemical concentrations on both the summer and the winter moth. So seven chemicals were repellent to the summer moths and five chemicals were repellent to the winter moths. However, the table in front of you is showing that only these four chemicals were repellent to both the summer and the winter moths. So again, this is just sort of showing that there are obviously differences in the way that the um, insects either perceive the chemicals or in the way in which they behaviorally react to it. But of course, just because these were undertaken in a laboratory environment, this isn't going to be the same as being undertaken in the field. So it's really important then that we moved forward into a semi-field research. Now, these were 12 meter polytunnels and I had 12 of them and I had green shade netting on the top. And this was just to increase the movement of the Drosophila Suzuki because these were barren tunnels. But to give you a little bit more of a bird's eye view of this, um, so we had these, as I said, the 12 meter polytunnels with one red Drosophila Suzuki drossel trap, one meter from the terminal endpoint of each side of the polytunnel. Within these red Drosophila Suzuki traps, 
were uh, raspberries, and these were to provide an obvious position substrate so that they could lay their eggs, and secondly, as an attractive volatile. Around one of the Drosophila traps was repellent sachets, and around the other end was control sachets. Now, the sachets were a dental um, cotton with either the control or repellent dispensed onto them, and then heat sealed into a semi permeable polythene bag. Of course, they were heat sealed, so we weren't actually adding any other chemicals into the mix. And then the Drosophila Suzuki were released at the six meter point halfway between the two control traps, and they were released into a white delta trap. And then I came back after 48 hours and looked at the position of the worthy, sorry, the Drosophila Suzuki were. Now, using this methodology, I actually undertook two separate experiments. So the first one was comparing the high dose sachets, comparing the summer and the winter moth behavior. And then the second experiment used all of the chemicals which were effective from the first um, experiment, but instead compared high and low sachet doses. So I appreciate that there's quite a um, complex graph to very quickly get your head around, but basically the dot is the mean and then we've got error bars on there. If the dot and the error bars are on or above that dotted line, then it is not repellent. If it is below the dotted line, that chemical was significantly repellent. So quite pleasingly here, um, three of the chemicals were repellent to both the summer and the winter moth. And interestingly, two of these chemicals, so 08 and 13, were actually both um, significantly different with the winter moth. And going on to the high and low dose um, sachets. So I, we only brought forward the three chemicals, 408 and 14. Um, and basically what we found here was high dose sachets, as with the previous experiments, were effective in every scenario. Perfect. Just goes to prove even further the previous experiment. However, only 08 was effective when doing a low release sachet. Of course, the major problem with the previous experiment is the fact that the tunnels which we're using were actually barren within an actual um, horticultural industry. Of course, there's going to be some sort of crop there. So the way to move forward with this experiment was instead to add strawberry um, strawberries down the centre of the 12 metre polytunnels. Repellent sachets were then placed around one end of the polytunnel. And then the Drosophila Suzuki were released into the center. These were left for one week. And then I came back and I did sampling at the one, two, four, six, eight, 10, and 12 meter points. Placed these into emergence boxes and then left them for two weeks and counted the emergence. So first of all, we're gonna start off with the control results. These are incredibly positive. I think you'll all agree. The fact is that we put the Drosophila Suzuki in, they spread out and they laid multiple eggs and they, they emerged. No differences between any of the distances from the polytunnel end or from the control sachets. But this is where I think the research gets really exciting. Um, so here we're beginning to see that actually these repellents are, some of the repellents I should say, are behaving active. Now, 129-13, so the orange graph up on display. Now, this one basically has no effect. It's not particularly pushing the um, pests away from the crop, um, from the repellent sachets, sorry. Uh, whereas 129-04 and 129-08 are effective. And they're basically showing that they're able to repel the insects between approximately four to six meters, which I believe could be commercially practical. What I also did just at the end was to count the actual total emergence as well. And I think this was quite important to, to make this comparison. Now, the control and 08, interestingly, there wasn't particularly any significant uh, total emergence between 08 and the control, although 08 was 
close to being significant, but it wasn't. Um, but 04 and 13 both had significantly fewer numbers of D Suzuki emerging. Now, there are multiple reasons why this could have happened. Um, it could be that they were pushing the insects to a certain um, to a certain distance. Lots of egg laying then occurred, but then larval competition actually stopped the um, the number emerging. Alternatively, these chemicals could be acting as some sort of oviposition deterrent, but future research would really need to be done on this to actually be able to validate either of these um, ideas. But I really want to bring this full circle again. So these repellents would be used as a pushing element. But if they were only going to be used alone, it would just be pushing the Drosophila suzuki to another part of the crop, which is obviously no good for being used within um, the commercial industry. So these would need to be combined with a secondary feature to kill them. So this moves on quite nicely to the future work. So the idea of bringing it back and creating this push-pull strategy within the field, which I think Adam explained so beautifully before. And this is a potential setup, which unfortunately is outside of the scope of my PhD as I'm now onto the writing up phase. But I feel there's a lot of potential for the future and there's a lot of exciting results. So I think this now just brings me down to my acknowledgement. So my supervisors from NRI, Dr. Daniel Brain, Professor David Hall, from Naya BMI, Dr. Charles Whitfield and Dr. Michelle Fountain, with special thanks to Scott Raffel, Harriet Duncan and Nicole Harrison, who have continually been supportive of the work that I've been doing and always been there to offer advice. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, or alternatively, feel free to contact me on the email address below. I will point out that it is c.e.folder, not Conroy. Um, I got married during my PhD and um, the university hasn't been able to change the email address. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. And thank you for clarifying that, because I've had to um, answer that question a few times as to why people couldn't get hold of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> We yeah, so it's interesting. So you 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 finish your PhD when um, is it March? So I actually have funding until next October. Next October, okay. Um, I think you know the, the work you've done it looks really exciting, um, but obviously there's that next step to take. Um, one question we've had coming in is: Is it just a coincidence that the summer morph was a female SWD and the winter morph was a male? Oh, you mean the picture? I think um, so. Yes, it was just a coincidence that I chose. I just wanted also to show the morphology of the um, of the basically the male and female. But no, in in every other respect, it is the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, under normal circumstances, if we had an open forum with everybody to ask, I'd be asking uh, Michelle Fountain to 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 just give her views at this stage as to where we go next with this and what we might do. But um, we do have another question that's come in. Um, Christina, are the best candidate molecules of low molecular weight and are unlikely to disperse quickly, or are they heavier? Does that make Unfortunately, sense? Unfortunately, I'm not able to discuss what the chemicals are until after publication. Um, but hopefully the next time that I get to speak to you, I'll be able to answer that question much more openly. Okay. Um, we might be asking you to talk again in February. Is that still too soon? Well, I mean, I'm hopeful to be getting the publication out in the very near future. So we'll have to keep our fingers crossed. Okay, because we, we, we plan to do a similar event like this for tree fruit probably in February time. And uh, if we ask you to come back and talk to the, the tree fruit growers, um, then you may we may have more news by then. Uh, another question. Uh, no, it's another comment um, from Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, the next steps are that coded products are being checked by Adam Doxford for approval. So Adam Doxford is my colleague in AHDB. Uh, so he's uh, he's he's working on these coded products um, with potential for approval in future. And after that, we would want to start commercial testing in combination with precision trapping that is the pool away from the crop. So Michelle, thank you so much for answering so quickly. <laughs> I put out the plea and she's responded instantly. Thank you, even without the microphone this year. Um, Okay, I think I think we've covered everything. Thank you so much, Christina, and good luck with the final year of your PhD. And uh, thanks for your talk this afternoon. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so um, we are staying with SWD. Uh, as I said just now, it's our final session. Uh, we have two more to go. Um, and I mentioned earlier SFTF 145A, which is our Spotted Winged Drosophila project, which is coming to an end. Um, now, you may remember Ralph Noble um, from Microbiotech talked to us in pre previous uh, events about uh, the use of bait sprays in strawberry. And we got some really good, exciting results where we showed that the use of bait sprays could potentially reduce the um, the, the, the number of applications and the dose rate of uh, agrochemicals for controlling SWD. Well, um, Ralph Noble has been working on that with his colleague, Andrea Dobrovan Pennington uh, and other colleagues from IIBMR. And they have been looking at this potential use in raspberry now this year. So Ralph, tell us what you've been finding in 2020. Okay, yeah, thanks Scott for that um, introduction. So I'm going to be talking about um, bait sprays in raspberries. Um, just um, a quick introduction as to why we're interested in bait sprays. Um, firstly, to improve the efficacy of existing uh, insecticides that are used against SWD, um, SWD like Tracer and Exeril. Um, potentially to make other insecticides effective that on their own aren't effective, so we can broaden the range of products that are available. Um, to spray onto the foliage and attract the SWD away from fruit. Um, to reduce pesticide residues and resistance um, by uh, using bait sprays, the, the aim is to get the uh, pesticide inside the pest um, and therefore improve e efficacy rather than just relying on the uh, pesticide coming in contact with the outside of the pest. And also to minimize pesticide effects on beneficial and non-target organisms by massively reducing the amount of pesticide um, sprayed into the cropping environment. Um, oops. Um, I seem to have lost the are, power. Are you, are, you, are you locked, Ralph? Um, is, is, are you, oh, there we are. Um, you want to try again? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, can you? Are you able to move on now? There we are. You're back yeah, in business. There we are. Okay, That's thank good. you. Okay, so we started this work uh, several years ago. First of all, in the uh, laboratory. So we used several different um, laboratory methods to find out which materials were attractive to um, uh, Drosophila suzuki. Um, and this particular uh, piece of apparatus, the uh, Drosophila activity monitoring equipment, uh, basically um, there are plastic tubes containing. Um, the materials, and then this uh, equipment electronically measures um, the number of times caged flies go in and out of these tubes. So, um, uh, in, in theory, the more attractive materials get more visits than the less attractive um, materials. Uh, and you can see on this graph, the, the red bars are uh, strawberry juice and, or fermented strawberry juice. Uh, the, these are obviously attractive materials, but not really practical. Um, to use a, a bait spray in, in the crop. Um, on the left, um, there's a couple of um, yeasts, uh, suspensions of yeasts, and we can see um, one particular yeast, Hanzenia spora uvarum. Uh, this is a yeast associated with fruit and uh, Drosophila suzuki. Um, um, also in suspension, uh, a very attractive material. Um, then on the right, we see some other um, materials that are um, more attractive, certainly than a sugar solution. Uh, these are a gasa. Gasa is used as, a, as a, um, an attractant um, in traps, but it's not really suitable as a bait spray because some of it's, it's acidic, like other acid materials like uh, vinegars. They're not really suitable as bait sprays because they would um, scorch leaves. Um, so there's um, a couple of other materials, combi protect and uh, molasses. So um, we did an experiment uh, last year on strawberry, um, just to remind um, everyone uh, of the very good results we got with uh, strawberries. So this, um, this graph shows the, um, the um, uh, numbers of SWD that were in um, harvested fruit um, in emergence boxes, um, following uh, four sprays, either at full rate of Benevia, so either at the full field rate, or at much lower rates, only 4% of the pesticide, e either with uh, combi protect or um, 
the suspension of this yeast, um, Hansenia spora ovarum. Um, so we can see um, the control uh, boxes without any treatment. We got uh, um, uh, SWD emerging in those boxes, um, uh, but the um, the bait sprays were not significantly different to the full amount of um, the Benevia sprays. So by um, using these um, baits, we were able to reduce the uh, amount of pesticide by 96%, but uh, keep the same efficacy as we were with the full um, four applications of Benevia. Um, however, the um, using um, a live yeast suspension is more difficult really than using just a, an off the shelf product. So although the, um, the yeast suspension was effective, it, it, it's more difficult to use than just a material that can be mixed with the, um, the spray mixture. So uh, we moved on from using uh, the uh, yeast suspension. So um, in, this, uh, in this year's experiment, um, we compared dilute rates of two um, active ingredients, tracer and XRL with and without baits, again against the full field application rate. Um, the raspberries um, were grown under semi-field conditions in enclosed polytunnels. And the aim was to examine the effects on uh, Drosophila suzukii um, of the, on the, both the uh, efficacy and the residues in the top, middle and bottom of the raspberry plants. So um, just to go through the treatments. So we had, um, in, in, there was an untreated of control, of course. And then we had four sprays um, of alternating two of tracer, alternating with two of exeral. Uh, these were applied either as the full field application rates in 500 liters per hectare, and then we had uh, two bait spray uh, treatments, Combi Protect, um, with a low rate sprays at 40 liters per hectare, um, or molasses um, at the same application rate, or the low rates of these um, uh, pesticides without either Combi Protect or molasses. And I should just point out that the uh, Combi Protect is authorized for use as an adjuvant, whereas the molasses is an unauthorized product, uh, and just in this experiment. Uh, just to describe the enclosed polytunnel facilities that we used for this experiment. So the um, experiment was done in these um, halved polytunnels um, and the raspberries were grown in uh, pots of coir. Um, the picture at the bottom shows really the difference between the bait sprays, which are um, um, applied as distinct, very distinct droplets in a band spray, um, one meter along the middle of the plant whereas the full spray leaves a much greater uh, coverage of the leaves, um, uh, a slightly smaller droplet size, but a much fuller coverage of the leaves. Just to um, explain the differences between the bait and the full rate um, applications, uh, the baits were applied with the Lechler nozzle um, uh, of that particular type, uh, and the full rate was applied with a, an orange Albus hollow cone nozzle. Uh, the baits were applied um, as a one meter band across the middle of the canopy and uh, the full the full rate was applied to the entire canopy. Uh, the baits were applied as a low volume application equivalent to 40 litres per hectare against uh, 500 litres per hectare equivalent for the high volume rate. Um, the concentration of um, insecticides in the bait was much lower equivalent to 8 mils per hectare for tracer and 36 mil per hectare for the exeral uh, compared to much higher concentrations for the full field rates for Tracer and Exeril. Um, the droplet size for the baits was slightly larger, 340 microns compared with around 200 microns for the full uh, application method. Um, so two, two uh, methods were used for measuring the efficacy of these um, treatments. Um, this shows um, an, the numbers of adults emerging from fruit in emergence boxes. So um, the, um, the, the, this shows the results for the weeks two, three, and four. Um, I haven't shown the week one results because the numbers of SWD in the first week were very small. Um, we did introduce um, fresh cohorts of female and male um, uh, SWD in the first three weeks of this experiment. So uh, this graph shows that the, um, we had uh, quite large numbers in the control boxes with no treatment coming from those fruit. 
the low rate of insecticides, so that's um, only 4% of the full rate, uh, did show some reduction in the numbers of SWD emerging. Um, but the other treatment showed very good uh, control of SWD, either the full rate of the, of the exeril and tracer or um, the low rates in combination with combo protect or molasses. Um, the second method we used for measuring efficacy was by uh, larvae flotation from samples of fruit. So it, this graph uh, shows a similar trend um, to the um, the previous bar chart using emergence. Um, the arrows show where the um, sprays um, were applied. The two ex uh, the two tracer sprays, which is the brown arrows, and the two ex um, the true two exeral sprays, which are the black arrows. And um, the SWD were applied in weeks naught one and two. So this again shows the um, the, the the numbers in the control. Uh, tunnels with the uh, the green line, uh, slightly lower line from the low rate of um, insecticides, but almost no um, larvae in the uh, full rate or the bait treatments up to week five. So um, very good control even two weeks after the um, last spray application. Um, beyond week five, the um, the bait sprays lose their effect, and the lines go up in at, at similar rate to the other treatments. And there is some residual effect of the full rate um, uh, beyond week five, but it, it, it's not um, entirely clear whether a residual effect of the pesticide is a good thing or not. Um, if we go on to looking at the residues of um, um, spinosad and um, citronilaprol in the fruit. First of all, uh, spinosad residues, and these are fruit that were um, harvested immediately after spraying. So not not like a normal uh, harvest interval. These were these fruit were actually taken straight after spraying. Um, so we can see in all positions on the crop, top, middle, and bottom, the residues in the full field rate plots are much higher than in the bait spray treatments, e e even though the full field rate is below the um, MRL, um, we've achieved much lower residues using bait sprays than with the full field rate. Um, same thing with cyanotronilipril residues um, taken after the exeral sprays. Again, the um, residues in the um, bait sprays are less than um, in an eleventh of the level in the full field rate. Uh, the, the levels in the top there are slightly higher than the MRL, but as I said, these fruit samples were taken immediately, not after the um, normal harvest interval. So uh, just to conclude what this um, work on using bait sprays and raspberries has achieved. Um, so dilute applications of tracer and XRL with baits were as effective as the full field rates. Um, and this was an in, with an insecticide application reduction of 96%. So we've only used 4% of the um, amount of insecticide and achieved um, the, the same efficacy for, for up to two weeks after the last sprays. Um, the full field rates did show some um, longer residual effect after this period. But as I said, it's not, it's not clear whether a, a long residual effect is actually better than um, an on-off um, effect. The fruit pesticide residues uh, were at least 11 times higher in the full field rates than in the bait sprays. And um, this, of course, um, would result in reduced uh, cost of pesticide and reduced environment and environmental impact. Um, it's normally very difficult to get good coverage of sprays in a raspberry crop. Um, and certainly the band spraying, uh, we're only targeting part of the plant um, with baits, is an advantage over full, full rates where we're, we're um, trying to achieve very good uh, coverage. Um, and finally, I should just emphasize this experiment was in uh, full enclosure. Um, so the effects on uh, beneficial and non-target experiments, uh, they were both excluded and not investigated as part of this um, experiment. Um, so that, uh, that just is a summary of our work on Raspberry uh, this year. and. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them.
Ralph, thank you so much. Um, I think the, um, the fact that uh, we, we've got a, a whole host of questions flooding in would suggest to me that you've uh, presented extremely well. So they understand what you're talking about and the, it, you've elicited a whole range of questions. Some of them are very lengthy, but I'll, we do have time because we've made up a little bit of time. So I will try and read them out um, carefully so that you can understand them. The first one. The insecticides used in this test are all classified as harmful to bees. Isn't it a big risk to use molasses with a sugar content of 60% and thus possibly attract bees? Um, crystal sugar is used for overwintering the bee colonies and sugar is very attractive for bees. Combi Protect does not contain molasses and has been tested in several field studies in order to obtain extensive official approval in Germany. Are there any comparable studies in England for, or the UK for molasses? Um, well, that, that, that's an important question, and I, I, I think the effect on bees of any treatment, um, you know, is part of future work, certainly. Um, um, there are products, of course, that have no effect on bees, um, um, and that could also be used in combination with um, bait treatments, but um, uh, certainly the effect on bees needs to be uh, considered, I, I, I agree. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, next question, Ralph, as exciting as it sounds to reduce pesticide use down to 4%, can you please let us know your views on the risk of building up resistance to plant protection products due to diluting the rates per hectare? Surely it is impossible to fully assess the efficacy of control on a farm and how these applications impact the background population that exists in the area, potentially nearby woodlands, other crops, etc. Well, as I say, the aim of bait is to get the um, pesticide inside the insect so you can achieve much better efficacy, um, you know, getting the pesticide inside the insect where, is, where you want it, rather than just putting, um, just hoping that the insecticide, you know, comes in contact with the insect. So um, you can achieve much better use of the pesticide by getting it where you want it. Um, so there's no, there's no, there's not a necessary increase in um, uh, risk of resistance. You're just getting the pesticide where it's um, most needed inside the insect rather than outside the insect. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the next question is something similar. Do you think that lower rates of pesticide or reduced residues will have a significant impact on the likely development of resistance from SWD to these products? Um, I think you partially answered that. Yeah, yeah. Again, you know, we get we get the we get the products where they're needed inside the insect, not 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 outside. Okay. Uh, another comment here: Our options for SWD control are very limited. We are relying entirely on spinosad and cyan, spinosad and cyan tranilipril. Are you confident that we can achieve full control of SWD from making applications only at these reduced rates? In my experience, in cherry orchards, even after full SWD. Um, programs, some low numbers of SWD can still be identified uh, due to application conditions, imperfect spray coverage, influx from adjacent crops, woodlands, etc. Any thought on that, Ralph? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's an important point, just to rely on two um, pesticides and um, hopefully in future work we can look at the um, efficacy of other products and how they combine with bait treatments. Can, can we make other products that perhaps aren't quite as effective more effective by using them in combination with bait, bait sprays. Okay. Uh, another question here. Can Ralph elaborate on the potential negatives of a longer persistence of the full rate Benevia? Well, uh, I, I just alluded to that. It, it, it probably needs further investigation. Um, the question is whether whether it's it's good to have a, a you know low rate of um, declining pesticide in the environment for a long period or, or, or a, you know, very small amount of pesticide that perhaps disappears more quickly. That, that's something for future work. Um, how, how does putting pesticides into the environment um, and leaving them to degrade over a long period of time, how, do, how does that compare with um, the amounts that go on with a bait spray? So um, that, that, that's again, I think needs to be looked at. Okay, sorry, there's more coming in. <laughs> Um, a comment here from uh, a French trials, interesting trials in France where they gave up massive trapping and molasses bait solutions and concentrate now on others. May I suggest for the next trial, like in France, that we might use Combi Protect with different insecticide programs and with different insecticide doses, 5 to 10 percent, 50 percent and 100 percent, so you can validate a safe user friendly SWD program. So 
I, I'm not suggesting you comment on that specifically. That's just perhaps something that you can uh, bear bear in mind. Sorry, sure. you've, you've, really, sure. you've really elicited a huge amount of uh, response here, uh, Ralph. Could you comment on whether flies that are not killed outright by the lower doses may develop resistance to the molecules tested? Um, well, uh, very few of those. Most of the the combi protect and and uh, molasses treatments are extremely uh, effective. Very, hardly any um, emergence in those boxes. Um, so um, we need to see how these treatments perform, you know, on a larger field scale. But it seems to be um, it seems to be very effective. Um, and I, 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 as I say, I would hope with a better um, rotation of insecticides, the the risk of um, of uh, resistance is reduced, you know, rather than just relying on one or two products, perhaps using more products with, with bait sprays. So the, okay. the risk of re resistance is, is, is reduced. Um, another point, somebody's made a very good, a good reminder here. It, it is wor worth reminding everyone that if using a nagevent when the fruit is present, you can only use half the rate of the product anyway. So that's, thank you for that comment. Um, that, that, that's, <laughs> It's a good comment. It, it's not relevant though, because we, we're way below half. You know, as I say, we're about four percent of the full field rate. So, um, the ad, yes, the adjuvant re reduce it to fifty percent, but um, we're, we're nowhere near fifty percent. We're about four percent. So, um, the adjuvant restriction isn't isn't a problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, just wondered another what comment here. Thank you for the presentation. Molasses are known to be an excellent substrate for microorganisms such as fungi. Is it a risk for fungal growth such as sooty molds? I suppose things like Cladosporium on raspberry, which potentially could 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 be uh, um, exacerbated and uh, with the use of molasses. Um, well, all, all I can say is we didn't see any um, problem in this year's experiment. I mean, it wasn't a primary aim of um, the experiment, but I can say the the, the fruit samples that were harvested didn't no, they weren't noticeably more sooty molds or molds on those raspberries than the other the control or full field rate um, treatments. So I'm I didn't see any evidence that the the bait sprays increase molding and in, in fact probably reduce it because um, SWD encourage moldy fruit. Um, yeah. So um, I think if you get control of SWD, you probably reduce molds rather than um, increase them. But I, I, yeah. it wasn't a main aim of this year's experiment. Yeah. I didn't see yeah. any evidence of moldy fruit in, in any of the plots. OK, uh, we've obviously got a cherry grower in the house. Uh, would bait sprays work on cherries, in your opinion? Um, we, haven't, we haven't tested that yet, but certainly we've had good results from strawberry and raspberry, haven't we, so far? Uh, I, I think there's good evidence. Yeah, Combi Protect works well on cherries, so um, I, I think I think bait sprays are um, very good opportunity for um, but, uh, cherries, definitely. Yeah. Okay, and, and and an associated question: If so, what is the best application method for these bait sprays? Um, that, that 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 is a good question. I mean, we found the Lechler nozzle to be very suitable, um, um, and that's probably an area for further development. I mean, uh, nozzles haven't been specifically developed for bait sprays, but I, th I think that's probably an area of improvement, how we can make the best um, bait sprays um, using new types of nozzle. Uh, nozzles are designed for normal sprays, not, not bait sprays. So uh, that, that's also a good opportunity. Um, just another point somebody's raised about relative costs. We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, you, do you want to comment on the relative costs? Have you got any data on that um, for comparing full rate versus reduced rate with with a um, a bait? Uh, yeah, I can say um, the the cost of say uh, combi protect with a, a much lower rate of insecticide would be lower than using the full amount of um, pesticide. There would be a cost saving certainly. Um, um, there's certainly be a cost saving in using baits against using the full field rate. I, I can say Combi Protect, um, I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but it's probably 20, 25% cost saving, just just um, um, normal costs. Um, de depends on the prices, exact prices for yeah. the materials. But there there yeah. will be a cost saving, you know, with Combi Protect, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, just finish off here. Um, Michelle has very kindly commented. Michelle is leading this project. She just wanted to summarise a few points just to clarify some things here in light of these discussions we've been having. Um, 
Michelle says, we have only tested this in enclosed tunnels. It would need commercial testing. It would be part of an IPM program, would it, but would improve biocontrols of other pests. We also need to check that beneficial insects are not attracted to the narrow band that we are applying. Um, we are applying a narrow band not covering the whole crop. This should help reduce the effects on beneficials and molds, um, but that needs looking at. And we are proposing to test on cherry in uh, any future projects that that we deliver. Um, so yeah, I, th I think we, you've we've elicited a huge amount of comment and question there, Ralph. I think the point we've, we, we've got to make to everybody here is we've, we we take on board everybody's comments. Um, the consortium uh, for project SFTF 145A uh, will be meeting again over the winter time, and all of these comments and the feedback is really helpful to us. Uh, and we are aware of the some of the issues with these things, and we will be taking them up and discussing them uh, further, obviously, before anything develops into a commercial reality. So, um, But I think we better draw a line under it there, Ralph. I think we've had lots of good, uh, interesting comment discussion. We've worked okay. you really hard. Um, I think you can put your feet up and have a, a wee dram. <laughs> um, thank you yep. so much, Ralph, for, for sharing the results with us. And Pleasure. Yep. Many thank, questions. You. thank you very thank much you. indeed. Okay. Thank you. So, so um, that takes us on to the final uh, talk of the day, stick, sticking with SWD again. And um, we're going to invite Adam Walker back uh, to the podium. Uh, Adam, who works for NIA BMR within Michelle Fountain's team in the entomology department at NIA BMR, um, talked to us earlier about the fantastic work that's been going on on capsid control. Um, and something we've been considering within our project SFTF 145A for some time is whether we might find ways of reducing overwintering populations of spotted wing drosophila in the in the hope that if we can do that we reduce the population density for the following spring making it easier to, to gain control so uh, adam and his colleagues have been doing some very interesting work on this and uh adam tell us what you found in the last uh, six to, to 12 months hey thanks scott um, so, yeah, um, current control of SWD um, occurs during the growing season, um, but there's potential to control the pest outside the growing season when populations are more vulnerable. So the purpose of this trial is to find out if um, applying precision monitoring in woodlands where SWD are known to overwinter can reduce populations down and um, prevent or reduce migrations into the neighbouring crop the following growing season. So data from our national monitoring survey has given us um, an interesting picture of SWD phenology in and around soft root crops in the UK. Uh, by deploying traps in the crop and surrounding woodlands, what we found um, is in late summer, um, SWD catches increase um, as there's less fruit competition um, and then from mid-September they decrease in the crop but increase in the neighbouring woodlands as SWD congregate in search of hosts and a place to overwinter um, and then by mid-November the numbers decrease again as they bed down for winter. Then the following spring um, SWD appear SWD catches increase in, in the woodlands um, as SWD emerge from their winter refuges um, looking for food and a host to lay eggs. So using this information, uh, if we apply precision monitoring in woodlands from autumn, we can catch the SWD before they overwinter and reduce down population numbers. Um, and then if precision monitoring remains there um, in the springtime, it can catch the emerging SWD as they seek food and a host to lay eggs. And hopefully Adam, this will... Adam, can I interrupt you? I believe we, we're yeah. stuck on the opening slide still. Is, is, have you moved on? Yes, I have. Yeah, we seem to be stuck on the opening slide, okay. which obviously isn't helpful. Uh, I don't know whether my technical colleagues can, or perhaps you might just, do you want to just close the presentation and open it up again? That sometimes works. Okay. Um, not sure why this has happened because your last presentation worked very smoothly mm. but i wouldn't wish the audience to be looking at your opening slide for the next 10 minutes okay let's see how this goes so i'm on the title slide right now yeah 
we can see the title slide. Okay, if I move on, have you got that? No, we haven't. Uh, it's not moving on. Um, it, we do have a backup. Um, perhaps if our technicians have got, uh, we do have a copy of your presentation. So if our technicians have got access to that, we can hopefully get hold of that and we can move the slides on for you. Um, it's strange, this, this has happened uh, on occasion before with these webinars. Um, and for that reason, we often have uh, backup presentations just uh, in this event. So we'll see whether we can get anything for you, um, Adam. I hope we can, because it'll make it a lot more, um, a lot more difficult for you to present with only <laughs> with one title slide. Um, so I've been invited to show my screen. Shall I try it out and see yeah. if it? Yeah. Oh, okay, we're looking at a different slide now. Do you want to move back, okay. on, back, back and forward? Yeah, and forward again. Yeah, we're in business. Okay. Okay, so this is where I was. Right. Okay, go on. And are you happy for me to continue from here? Do you want to just go back a slide? Just go back a slide because a lot of people may have missed that. Perhaps sorry, sorry, we've lost a few minutes, folks, but I think probably people would benefit from going back to that slide. So if you could pick it up from there, Adam, thank you. Okay, sure. Um, so yeah, this was um talking about um monitoring the SWD phenology um throughout the um, season throughout the year in the UK in and around um, soft root crops um, and this data is informing us on how we could apply precision monitoring um, so what the graph shows um, is the yellow line is the crop um, and what we find is SWD trap catches um, increase um, late summer um, as the um, fruiting period ends and SWD um, are looking for food still um, and then from late summer, it decreases in the crop, but increases in the neighbouring woodland, which is the green line, um, as SWD congregate there looking for food, but also a place to seek shelter over winter. Um, and then mid-November, it decreases as temperatures decrease and SWD uh, bedding down over winter. Then the following spring, um, the track catches are higher in the neighbouring woodlands um, as the SWD emerge from their shelters um, and they're looking for food and a host to lay eggs. So using this information, if we apply precision monitoring um, in neighbouring woodlands from autumn, um, we can catch the SWD before they bed down over winter, reducing the population. And then if precision monitoring remains in place um, in the following spring, those SWD that emerge um, and looking for food and a place to lay eggs are also caught by the traps, further reducing the population. So by the growing season, there should be fewer SWD migrating into the crop. So to test this out, um, we set up a trial on six soft fruit farms. I'm using six replicate blocks, and each block's been divided into two plots as shown in the diagram. Um, on the left-hand side is a treated plot, um, which has a small isolated pocket of woodland represented as a pink square. Um, and then on the right hand side is a control plot, which has another separate small isolated pocket of woodland represented by a yellow square. And next to each woodland is a separate soft fruit crop. And um, this shows the trial set up in more detail. So on the left hand side um, is the treated plot. Um, the treated woodland um, has a grid of 64 precision monitoring traps spaced at eight meter intervals. Um, and we've been running assessments um, to um, compare SWD activity between treated and the control plots. And um, this has included um, putting four Riga traps in, uh, one in each woodland and respective neighbouring crop, um, and counting numbers of SWD in those traps. Um, also counting male SWD in a transect of eight traps in the treated woodland to compare court activity. Um, um, another one is um, deploying sentinel fruit traps, um, which are represented by the red triangles. Um, that started in spring, um, and that's to um, monitor SWD egg laying activity. And finally, um, a habitat assessment. And the purpose of this is um, what we found is some traps consistently catch more SWD than others. Um, 
And so this could be related to environment factors around the traps. And we want to identify what those are um, because those could be hotspots where we can advise to focus precision monitoring to get the best SWD control. So first of all, these are the results from the Riga trap catches in woodlands. Um, this graph shows mean SWD per Riga trap. And you've got two lines on the graph. Um, the full black line is the catches of SWD in Riga traps in the control woodland, and the hash line is catches of SWD and Riga traps in the treated woodland. Um, I've also put arrows there. Um, so arrow one marks the pre-assessment before precision monitoring started. Um, and then arrow two is two weeks after precision monitoring traps were deployed. Arrow three is a month after precision monitoring traps were deployed and the point at which um, catches of SWD diverged between treated and controlled woodlands. Thereafter, numbers of SWD um, in Riga traps were lower in treated woodlands compared to control up to early June. Um, I should also mention this light blue band is the six week period that the Sentinel fruit were deployed in spring 2020. Um, and at this point, all of the precision monitoring traps from all of the treated woodlands were removed. Um, this graph here shows the catches of SWD and Riga traps in the crops. Um, so arrow three um, is the point in the other graph um, where numbers of SWD diverge um, between treatment and control traps. Um, and the same can be seen um, in treated and control traps in the crops, whereby SWD catches were lower in the treated crop compared to the control crop up to early July. So this is showing transect trap catches of males during the trial period so far. Um, the top graph um, is mean SWD per eight transect traps. Um, and the bottom graph is the mean SWD per Riga trap in the treated woodland, in the, sorry, in the woodlands. And the hash line is the treated woodlands. Um, and what you can see is catches of male SWD in the transect, in the transect traps um, follows the same pattern as the Riga traps below. These are the results um, of the Sentinel fruit um, emergence test. So on the left hand side is a picture of a Sentinel fruit trap and what the graph shows is mean SWD emerged per 100 grams of Sentinel fruit deployed. Um, so looking at this data, um, stats haven't been done on this yet, but we don't expect to find a significant difference because numbers of SWD emerging um, during that spring sentinel fruit deployment were low. Um, and this is um, likely because of competition from other Drosophila species, which emerged in much higher numbers in the trap. And we know that they compete with SWD larvae. Um, but since then, we have deployed further um, sentinel fruit um, and we're awaiting the results from that. Um, this is a result from the preliminary habitat assessment. Um, so in terms of vegetation in the one metre radius around the transect traps um, and correlating that with male SWD catches, and we didn't find a correlation um, in this first preliminary assessment. Um, what we did find um, is traps at the woodland edge catch more SWD than those in the interior. Um, but this is a preliminary assessment. Um, so we want to look at this in more detail. Um, and what we've done since then um, in summer and autumn is we've assessed a four metre radius around all 64 precision monitoring traps in all of the treated woodlands. Um, and so we should get better resolution from that data. We're not just looking at um, vegetation um, around the traps, but we're also looking at abiotic factors too, such as temperature, humidity, um, trap position, light levels. Um, so here's some preliminary statistics um, from the summer and autumn habitat assessments. Um, 
grey boxes with a thick black border um, show significant correlations and you've got different species um, and this is in t terms of species around the trap um, and male SWD catches um, and what you can see um, in both summer and autumn is bramble and nettle have a significant positive correlation. The positive correlation is marked by a blue spot. If there was a negative correlation, it would be a red spot in the boxes. Um, there are other species too, um, like oak in the summer assessment that also seem to have a positive correlation. This might not necessarily be to do with oak, it could be with other species that shared that four metre radius of the trap. So the overall habitat score might be a better indicator. Um, but we need to do um, more detailed stats on this data, which is to come. So to conclude, um, Brieger catches show fewer SWD in woodlands and neighbouring crops with precision monitoring than without. And that was from November 2019 to June 2020. And um, the spring uh, sentinel fruit assessment was inconclusive um, due to few SWD and probably due to competition from other Drosophila. Um, since then, as I said, we've deployed more sentinel fruit and that's being counted. Um, and hopefully data from that will give us um, a clearer picture of if this control strategy has been effective so far. Um, the analysis of the latest habitat assessments and the abiotic factors which I mentioned should give um, clear information on the best um, places to position precision monitoring traps. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Adam. That's really helpful. Um, I, obviously, some very positive results coming from that piece of work, but we'll, we will await with interest the final report once you've managed to assess uh, all the data there. Um, thank you. Uh, one or two questions coming in. Um, first of all, I'll put a question to you is, do, how much impact do these traps have on bycatches? So are we catching other beneficial insects uh, in these precision monitoring traps? Um, so we're mainly catching SWD. And we're not specifically monitoring bycatch in there, but we are making um, a note of it, um, a mental note of it. Um, but the traps have been designed to catch SWD. So that's what we um, expect to mainly catch. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand this question, but our, a question about different woodlands. Are, are different woodlands showing similar results? Um, as I said, the data hasn't been analysed yet, so we um, haven't um, compared um, different woodlands um, in that much detail yet. Um, so that information is to come. Um, but that also, um, that information might um, shed light on where best to, um, to put your traps, um, going back to what I was talking about, the habitat assessments. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, um, if a grower already has um, precision monitoring traps spaced two metres around the perimeters of crops which coincide with neighbouring woodland, do they still need to add extra monitoring traps in the body of the woodland? Um, I think we that? need to, um, as I said, so these traps that we've deployed, they're spaced at eight metres. Um, so. It might, we're talking about a specific type of trap here. So it might be that you can deploy this specific trap at eight meters rather than two meter intervals, but I can't advise on that yet until we've got um, got the stats sorted and so more conclusive information. Okay, thank you. But, I, I, um, sorry, sorry, it's on. obviously still important to um, monitor um, for pest infestations in and around the crop. Yes, indeed. OK, um, I think that's all the, the questions that have been uh, issued. So I think we'll call halt to that now. Adam, thank you very much. I think the one thing we can say about all of this SWD research is it's it's been running now for eight, seven, seven years or so. Um, we have made huge, huge progress in learning a lot more about the pest and its management. And some of this most recent work has been really interesting and is throwing up some major uh, results which which have allowed us as an organization to work with commercial organizations CRD and others to seriously seek um, ways of commercializing some of this and, and seeking um, approval 
uh, for its use. So I, I think it's the fact that we're actually doing that activity at the moment show, speaks volumes for the research that we've, we've done. So thank you, Adam. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Christina, for all that information on SWD. The, the work we hope will continue next year within the realms of a new project. So that's uh, that will be set up hopefully over the winter months. But uh, for now, thank you so much, Adam. OK. Thanks, Bill. Um, I will really just bring this uh, this day's proceedings to a conclusion now. Um, first of all, thank you to all of our presenters. We've had a, a huge number of you today. You've very well stuck to time. Um, you've stuck to the subjects uh, and you've uh, helped us to make a lot of the information very clear and very visible. So first of all, thank you to you all uh, for doing that. Um, I did talk at the top of the programme about basis and Arozo points. Um, if you haven't yet done so, please do um, submit, submit your basis and Neuroso names, res registration numbers uh, and information to us for us to complete the form for you. We can do that. Send it to me uh, or send it to Amna Yousaf uh, at AHDB and, and we'll get that done for you. Um, if, we if you feel we haven't answered your questions um, adequately or you want to submit further questions or we've missed your uh, somehow overlooked one of your questions, again, feel free to submit those to me at my email address, scott.raffle at ahdb.org.uk, and I will pass them on to the presenters. They've all said they're very happy to answer any uh, questions retrospectively, so uh, please please do that. Um, as I said also at the start, um, all of today's proceedings have been recorded. Uh, they um, sh will definitely be available next week. We hope they will be available within 24 hours. Um, so that will be available. Do tell your friends and colleagues, anybody that hasn't managed to join us today but wants to, to look at any of these talks, you, you can uh, forward them to that information. If, if um, you can't remember that web address, if you just search um, AHDB Horticulture Events Archive, you will find all of our webinars on there and uh, you'll, you'll find all that information presented. Just a reminder again that we will be circulating the posters that the CTP students produced for us, uh, for which we judge these and, and announce the winners at lunchtime. So do have a look at those again. Thank you to our sponsors, EMR Trust and Berry Gardens uh, for, for those. Um, you will be receiving a feedback survey. Uh, in the past, we've produced a paper copy and sent that round. Uh, but please, uh, if you receive an invitation to feedback, please do so, because this is the first time that we've run a, an event uh, of this size uh, on a webinar. Uh, and we will obviously welcome any constructive feedback that you can give so that we can improve it, because I suspect with the way the pandemic's going, we may well be having to, to do it uh, again. So um, finally, I'd just like to thank uh, everybody for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much uh, to, to you all. I really hope you've uh, got plenty out of today uh, and you, 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 you're taking some uh, positive results back into your businesses. Um, and thank you again to all the speakers and everybody that's submitted questions. Um, I normally say at this point, I wish you a safe journey home. Uh, let's say I should wish you a safe journey to the kitchen for your cup of tea. Thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to inviting you to further webinars uh, at HDB in future. Thanks for now.